again set back gains to gender equity. But Merkel's greatest legacy is probably that she has shown that a woman can do it, can lead the country through many crises. Today, no one laughs at a girl when she says that she wants to become a minister or even chancellor. I've been told that there have even been questions on whether men can also do these jobs. I didn't make that up. She was perfect for being the first female chancellor. She couldn't fight all the battles for us. Now the next generation is coming and will hopefully take over the fight for women's rights. She just made sure that things are running in the world. Germany still has a long way to go to achieve total gender equity. One female chancellor isn't enough for that, so there is still a lot to do. Stay informed. Live and on demand. Podcasts and language courses. Video and audio. Anytime, anywhere. The DW Media Center. When I arrived here, I slept with six people in a room. It was hard. I even got white hair. <laughs> Learning the German language helped me a lot. This gives me a great opportunity to interact with society. You want to know their story? Info Migrants, verified and reliable information for migrants. When I first menstruated, I had no clue whatsoever. A film about a taboo. Menstruation has always been a shameful, dirty secret. About women and girls across the world. Most of the girls end up being at home. They miss their schools. Against silence and for equal opportunity. <laughs> Taboo menstruation. It's as if Pandora's box is opening. Pandora's box starts October 11th on DW. Imagine being born invisible. You are alive, but can't prove you exist. You want to learn, but no school will take you. You want to be useful, but aren't allowed to work. When you're sick, the doctor ignores you. When you fall in love, they won't marry you. You don't have children. For fear, they'll be invisible too. You are sure you're human, but have no human rights. And when you die, there is no proof you ever existed. Every 10 minutes, a person like this is born. 10 million people in the world are stateless. They have no nationality and are told they don't belong anywhere. But everyone has the right to nationality. Everyone has the right to say, I belong.
Welcome to our special coverage of the German election here on DW News. I'm Sumi Somaskanda. Germans are voting for a new parliament. Pl polls close in just about an hour from now in a momentous election. Angela Merkel is stepping down after 16 years in power. The country is at a crossroads. So who will replace Chancellor Merkel? It could be Olaf Scholz on the right side of the screen and the Social Democrats. They were leading the polls, but the numbers tightened in the final days. Now it's a dead heat with Amin Laschet on the left-hand side of the screen and his Christian Democrats. The Greens and Annalena Baerbock look likely to come in third. The clock is ticking down. Welcome to all of our viewers around the world. You're watching our special German election coverage here on DW. We will be bringing you the latest updates and analysis. So I'm happy to have our correspondents here in the studio. First of all, Richard Walker here at the table. Looking forward to tonight. Yeah, Sumi, I mean, it's extraordinary. After 16 years in power, Angela Merkel is no longer going to be chancellor. We're going to find out tonight, not for sure, but we're going to have a sense of who the new leadership is going to be. And so for you know, voters under 30, this is the first time uh, that they have had a chance to choose a, a, a different chancellor. A big election indeed. Yeah. I'd also like to introduce here in our studio, William Glucroft. He'll bring you all of the background information and all of the latest numbers. That's right, Sumi. We've got lots of party names and colors and combinations to talk about tonight. Who's up, who's down and why, what the issues are, what this election is all about. But don't worry, we're gonna try to keep the jargon to a minimum and make sure you're well prepared to win your next German politics pub quiz. Right, Sumi? Thanks, William. Well, let's take a quick look at what we have planned for you tonight, the schedule. So at 6 p.m. Berlin time, that's at about an hour from now, the polls will close. We'll have the uh, exit poll results at the very top of the hour. That will give us a sense of whether there is a clear winner and who might be in a position to lead the next government. About 15 minutes later, we'll have the first results forecast, and that will give a clearer idea where all the parties stand. Regular updates will follow as we get them. Then at 8 p.m. Berlin time, we'll bring you the election night debate live. That's when the party leaders come face to face to give their reactions to the election result. You don't want to miss that. And the final result should be known by midnight, though it could take longer this time. Keep in mind, because of the high number of mail-in ballots and also depending on just how close the outcome is. So we could know by then who is best placed to succeed Angela Merkel as German chancellor long before that. But even then, it's not done. The new chancellor will only emerge once the coalition negotiations are completed, and that is a process that could take weeks or even months. Well, polls opened this morning at 8 a.m. right here in Germany. More than 60 million Germans are eligible to vote. They've been casting their ballots across the nation today to decide who succeeds Angela Merkel. It is one of the most unpredictable German elections in living memory. As we mentioned, the polls point to a very close race between the Conservatives and the center-left Social Democrats, with the Green Party coming in third. DW's Jared Reed takes a look now at how the election has shaped up so far today. Change is in the autumn air this Sunday as the early birds line up in central Berlin. What's been called the most important election in decades is happening. Voters are choosing a new parliament that will decide who will lead Germany after Angela Merkel's 16 years in office. What's been interesting with this election is just how unpredictable it's been. Many people have been saying they just don't know who they're going to vote for. So this election could come down to them, the millions of people who've only decided very recently, or even today, which boxes they're going to tick. I decided yesterday evening. This morning. <laughs> it wasn't so easy for me. It was quite difficult, but at some point I decided. To me, this is really important. But there's one issue that's got people out of bed. We need to solve the climate crisis. Every voter should have their say. The climate crisis is the overarching issue, so other goals as important as they are, like good pay, good working conditions, these classic election issues can only happen if the rest is taken care of. We need changes with regards to the climate, because a lot simply must happen now that has not happened in recent decades. And that's a very important point for me in this year's election. 
For German President Frank-Walter Steinmeier, who cast his ballot early on Sunday, the polling booth is the best place for voters to have their say. Voters are the lifeblood of democracy, and those who volunteer at the polls perform a service to the community. My thanks to everyone working at polling places across Germany. What's decided here will determine Germany's future. But whichever parties form the next government, they will know the hard work is just beginning. Richard, we saw some uh, voices from voters there. It really is a big moment from Germany, for Germany, rather. 16 years of Angela Merkel, now the country is moving on. What's your sense of what the atmosphere is here today? Yeah, I think, I think Jared captured the atmosphere in Berlin there pretty well. It's this kind of combination of anticipation and uncertainty about what's going to happen. Anticipation because you know, Germany is sort of finally tiptoeing into this era uh, the post-Merkel era, um, an era that's only beginning because Merkel herself decided that she wouldn't run again. You know, if she'd run again, we may have uh, have seen a fifth Merkel term beginning here. And this is in unprecedented in post-war Germany uh, that a sitting chancellor has not run for, for re-election. So it really is a very unusual situation. And I think in Berlin, uh, I was out there this afternoon going to the polling station where I vote myself. There were long lines there. It was sunny. There's a bit of a festive atmosphere in Berlin, partly because the marathon is on today, which has also been causing some problems, some logistical problems. I'm sure we'll get to those. But yeah, pervading the atmosphere is sort of anticipation mm -hmm. for some happy, for some full of trepidation. I Certainly think. is a lot at stake here. Well, let's take a look. First of all, I just want to remind viewers that at the bottom uh, right-hand side of the screen, you're going to have a clock ticking down. Or, sorry, that's closer to the left-hand side of your screen. A clock ticking down to those first exit poll numbers. But it has really been a tight race. So let's go over to William now to tell us where things stand and where they're going. Oh, goodness, is it a tight race. And we have some stuff to show you. Let's get some graphics up on the scene on the screen to have a look at. Now, in the Bundestag, the German parliament right now, there are seven parties. It's the most fragmented the Bundestag has ever been. Now, the conservatives, the CDU, CSU, they work together at the Bundestag. So they can be considered almost like one party. And their chancellor candidate is Armin Laschet. Now, you move over, you might have heard of our center-left candidate from the SPD, Olaf Scholz. He is in the current government with the conservatives, but is now hoping to unseat them and lead the government himself. Coming up in third in the polling is the Greens' Annalena Baerbock. Now, they are doing more not so well as they had hoped in this uh, race, but they may actually double their result from 2017. The rest of the party uh, parties, they will play a supporting role most likely in, uh, in the weeks to come as these parties, depending how the results shake out in just about an hour from now, depending on how these parties do, we'll be seeing various coalition combinations. And that is something that we're gonna be getting into a lot more later, all of these com coalitions. But how do things look right now? You see these seven parties on the screen. What are they looking like since the last election on 2017? Well, you can see, of course, the Conservatives in black here having the largest share of seats in the German parliament, the Bundestag, followed by the Social Democrats. That is what helped lead reluctantly to what's called a grand coalition, these two big parties working together, uh, albeit not always on the friendliest of circumstances. And then you have the parties in opposition, the far-right uh, uh, AFD, the yellow liberal party, the FDP, the pink there, the socialist left, and the greens, and of course, logically speaking, the greens. This is the current makeup of the German Bundestag. We might see more than 709 seats because it keeps expanding every election, which we're also gonna be getting more into later why that is. This may be totally new in about an hour from now when we start seeing how the parties have done and how have these parties been doing. We can show you just over the course of the year how these polls have been all over the place. I want you to take a look specifically at the black and the red lines. That again, black being for conservative, Angela Merkel's party, and red being for the Social Democrats. Traditionally, the two largest parties in Germany Look at how their popularity has sunk in just the past year with the red line, the SPD, only surging in the last six, eight, 10 weeks to possibly eke out an electoral win today, but it's just too close to call. The Greens, they had 
some hopeful times earlier this year, but they have not been able to recover and look like they might have a third place pick. But the point here is the most fragmented German political field ever in modern German history. And that is what is causing so much uncertainty in this election. Sumi, Richard. Thanks, William. You know, Richard, as William just showed us, especially in that last poll, there really has been a topsy-turvy election season. What do you make of that? Yeah, well, yeah, there's been a lot of fluctuation, and we've seen all three of those leading parties having the lead at some point. Um, essentially, what we're seeing there is the dynamics of an election that has turned out to be highly candidate-driven. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not an election that's been so much focused on individual issues, it's been focused on the candidates themselves. And that's not really surprising when you think about it that, you know, Germany is looking at who wants to fill the shoes of Angela Merkel. She's been there for such a steady presence for 16 years. So they've been kind of kicking the tires on these three candidates. Uh, and two of the candidates have had some big problems along the way. And that's really what's contributed to these fluctuations. We're going to be looking at that in a moment. But as you said, the candidates, a big part of those ups and downs. Let's go back to William now to tell us more about who the candidates are and how popular they've been. Right. We just saw before all of those faces of the seven parties here in Germany. But we want to focus on the top three, the three that are most likely or have a, a chance to be actually chancellor, to take over for Angela Merkel. Let's look at these top three. We just saw them before, now a little bit closer. Olaf Scholz of the Social Democrats. He's currently the finance minister and the deputy chancellor in German government. Armin Laschet, the leader of the CDU conservative party, Angela Merkel's party, and Annalena Baerbock, the first time that the Greens have put forward a chancellor candidate. Normally, you have two chancellor candidates. This year, we have three. Now, remember, it's very important to note that German voters don't actually vote for these people, but what if they could? Let's have a quick look. Well, it's really no contest. For a very long time now, since at least July, German voters have been saying, Olaf Scholz is their man. Re regardless of what their party preference might be, Voters are saying they trust Olaf Scholz to be chancellor in government. Whether that will actually impact how people vote for parties, that is something that we are very going to be going to be looking very closely at tonight as those election results come in in less than an hour from now. And we're going to have so much more of that. But first, let's hand it back over to Sumi and Richard. Thanks, William. Well, as William was just saying, there's a lot to talk about, about the candidates' popularity. And there have been, Richard mentioned, some mistakes, ups and downs this year as the campaign season has heated up. So let's take a closer look now at those key moments that really have defined this race. Boisterous crowds. Fuel for the fight. Grand plans. Growth and prosperity, stability, a balanced budget. Promises. I want a higher minimum wage. And hard truths. The climate crisis is happening now, and we have to act now in 2021. Twists and turns. It was the most dramatic campaign in years. Armin Laschet. Merkel's chosen successor began the race after a bruising battle, just to secure the backing of his own conservative bloc. We have not made it easy for ourselves because there is something at stake. His rival Social Democrat crowned Olaf Scholz almost unanimously. He entered the race with low expectations after the party's years of fading popularity. Another CDU-CSU-led government it will cost Germany prosperity, jobs and a future. We can't let this happen. The Greens chose Annalena Baerbock to make the case that their time had come. Baerbock positioned herself as the change candidate and led the polls back in the spring. Olaf Scholz and On climate Scholz protection, there isn't one millimetre between Olaf Scholz and Armin Laschet. That was the worst of the sparring. Keep your guard up, Laschet is instructed. Advice he could have done with weeks earlier, when floods devastated his home state. For Laschet, an opportunity to demonstrate leadership. Then this happened. As the German president consoled victims, Laschet was caught laughing in the background. The moment seemed to cement public feeling 
that he wasn't ready for the top job. Someone next to me made a stupid remark and I laughed about it. That annoys me, that was stupid, but I can't undo it. Baerbock too ran into trouble, hit with allegations she had exaggerated her CV and plagiarised sections of her book. A pitfall of German political life, support for her dwindled. Steady Schultz reaped the benefits, though he faced an uncomfortable grilling over a money laundering scandal that took place under his watch as finance minister. His no thrills approach, a selling point. I'm applying to be chancellor, not a circus ringmaster. Sometimes it felt like that, yet his message resonated with polls giving him a comfortable lead. As election day neared, faltering Laschet needed a boost. Bratwurst is the right thing for the final sprint. More than meat, he needed Merkel to revive his fortunes, calling his predecessor to a wet and windy rally. As German Chancellor, Armin Laschet would continue the course of attracting new jobs here and making employment possible. A late bid by a hugely popular Chancellor to turn the tide of public opinion one last time. Quite the election season indeed, Richard. Let's talk about these candidates and who they are. A lot of people want to know who could these people be who are possibly going to replace Angela Merkel as chancellor. So let's start with Amin Laschet from her party, from the Conservatives. That's right. So the, the Conservative candidate, it was really seen as his election to lose this year. The Conservatives, after all, have won 16 of the 19 uh, federal elections since, since the war here in Germany. So Armin Laschet, he's 60 years old, so that makes him quite a bit older than Merkel herself was when she first became chancellor. Uh, he started off uh, studying law and then he worked as a journalist uh, before he went into politics. And he's been in a member of the CDU party, this Conservative Party, since he was 18 years old. And you often get that with German politicians that they join the youth wings of their parties as teenagers. So he was first elected to the German parliament in 1994 and then he switched to the European parliament. So he had a few years in the European parliament before he uh, returned back to Germany. And he's been the state premier of his state, so, so essentially like the governor of a US state of North Rhine-Westphalia, and that's the state with the biggest population in Germany uh, since 2017. So that was made him seem as uh, someone with a, a lot of executive experience. And then he was elected leader of the CDU party uh, in the beginning of this year. And he's a practicing Catholic, like many members of the Christian Democrats are. One tidbit, he met his wife in a local church choir when he was a kid. Some important background information there about Amin Laschet. Let's talk a little bit more about him. You know, we have our team of our correspondents around the city tonight with all of the parties. And I'd like to go directly to DW's Michelle Kufner. She is at the CDU's election party. Hi, Michelle. Welcome. Uh, tell us more about what Amin Laschet stands for in this election, what he has campaigned on. Well, he's, he's campaigned on continuity, Merkel style, and uh, in those final days of the election campaign, when things really started to look a bit desperate for his conservative CDU, CSU, they openly started threatening voters that it's either stability, conservative CDU, CSU style, or a shift to the left. Um, and that is something that needed to be prevented. He actually leads a, a state parliament in North Rhine-Westphalia by the slimmest of majorities, just a one vote majority. He's known as a bridge builder, as someone who brings people together, who finds common ground, consensus, a team builder. Sounds very Merkel-esque. And he does also uh, lack the sense of charm and doesn't really have it that easy to enthuse uh, people necessarily. Uh, we saw a lot of his election campaigning uh, looking a bit dull um, until there was this grand finale in Bavaria on Friday. So uh, he is once again living proof that that uh, German politics doesn't thrive on charisma. Having said that, it's not like Olaf Scholz is such a sparky kind of guy either, the Social Democrat candidate. Thanks, Michaela. We'll be coming back to you, of course, in a little bit. And I should add, uh, while I have the chance here on air, a happy birthday to you. I can't imagine a better present for a chief political editor than to be covering <laughs> such a momentous election. So thanks, Michaela. We'll come back to you in just a little bit. 
Michael mentioned there Olaf Scholz, the man leading the poll. So let's talk about him. Tell him, uh, tell us who, who he is. Yeah, so he's been the guy who's given Amin Laschet a, a run for his money. And this has been one of the big surprises of this campaign because he's been around for a long time. Uh, but few people saw this coming. Now, he's age 63. He's the oldest uh, of the three candidates. And the polling indicates at the moment that in terms of personal popularity, he's quite significantly the most popular of the three candidates who are, who are running uh, for chancellor. And they, the Social Democrats, picked him uh, for their candidate, despite the fact that he had previously lost the race to become party leader. And that is sometimes the case in Germany, that the party leader and the candidate to run to, for chancellor not always the same person. He lost the first race, but won this race. Now, he also uh, joined uh, the Social Democrats as a teenager, and he was a bit of a left-wing firebrand in his younger years. But he moved into a legal career, and he, he ran a legal practice specializing in labor law before going into the uh, federal parliament, the Bundestag, in 1998. But he's also been heavily involved in, in city politics in Hamburg. And Hamburg is a kind of a city-state in Germany. It's a very wealthy place, and it's seen as an you know, important part and symbolic part of, of the German economy. So he had seven years as mayor of Hamburg, which makes him uh, pretty experienced. But then after that, he then became finance minister uh, in the coalition under Angela Merkel. So a social democrat working underneath the Conservative uh, Chancellor and Finance Minister. I mean, that's really one of the most powerful jobs in German politics, as in many other countries. So a very experienced guy. But he was always seen as a kind of dull guy. You know, he even had this nickname. He was given the nickname the Schultz of Mart because he sounded like a sort of automated delivery mechanism when speaking sometimes. But he's actually managed to play on that uh, to his advantage. Is certainly someone who brings a lot of experience to this campaign. Let's uh, head over to our correspondent who's following the Social Democrats and has been all season for us. Uh, Nina Haza is with the Social Democrats. Hi, Nina. So tell us more about what Olaf Scholz has been campaigning on this season. Exactly. He has also not campaigned on his charisma, as Michaela from the Conservatives said about uh, their candidate, Amin Laschet. So this is not a battle of the most charismatic politicians. Olaf Scholz was, of course, the first chancellor candidate to be nominated. He was nominated as early as a year ago. So he's been campaigning ever since. And his message throughout the entire campaign has been the same. You know me. I can do crises. I'm an experienced and efficient crisis manager. And of course, it served him really well and his purpose is that he could throw out um, a big bag of money during the corona crisis to help the people who were affected when businesses um, had to shut down during the, um, the, the peak of the pandemic. This message stayed the same. You know me, I can do this. I have the longest experience in uh, governing positions because he was not only the mayor and he's not only the current finance minister, he was also already um, years ago, he was the labor minister already already under Angela Merkel, so he goes back a long time. And what was striking was that the SPD is usually a party where rumours are being spread to the public and there's a lot of infighting. And this time around, they really did manage to unite behind this candidate. Thanks, Nina. And we'll be coming back to you just before uh, the top of the hour. Again, for our viewers, that clock is counting down until uh, when those first exit poll results come in. We'll be watching that very closely, uh, Richard. But we have to talk about the third uh, chancellor candidate here in this group of three. That is Annalena Baerbock of the Greens. Yeah, well, if you think about it just for a moment, the two men who we've just been speaking about, they both essentially represent the current government in one way or another in Germany. Uh, Laschet from the Conservatives, Angela Merkel's party, Schultz is the current finance minister. So it, it, it's, it's not a huge amount of change that either of them represents, really. Um, Annalena Baerbock, she is the, the main candidate who's saying, uh, Germany, we need to change in a big way. Um, in both policy terms, making climate change the absolute forefront issue, and in also generational terms, she's significantly older. So she is 40 years old. Uh, she's so making her easily the youngest and also the most politically inexperienced of these uh, three main candidates, and that, is, that has been a bit of an issue for her this year. Uh, she was actually born in the same year that the Green Party was founded in 1980. <laughs> And she's only the second woman who's been put forward as, as a chancellor candidate after Angela Merkel herself. And she joined the Greens in 2005 um, when she was studying 
uh, for a postgraduate degree uh, in London. And her subject there is international law, so she's got quite an international perspective. And she was elected to Parliament, the Federal Parliament, in 2013. So she's been in Parliament for eight years. And she became the co-leader of the Greens in 2018. Now, the Greens tend to have two leaders. And together with her co-leader, Robert Habeck, she's credited with having really uh, brought the Greens together. The, the Green Party had often had difficulties uniting the kind of more idealist and the more pragmatic wings of the party. Uh, that kind of tension has been uh, uh, quite successfully resolved under those two. And the, uh, the little tidbit that everyone wants to know is that she was a competitive trampolinist when <laughs> she was a teenager. So while the other two were joining their political parties, she was trampolining. Yeah, interesting indeed. And we, of course, have our correspondent with the Green uh, Party tonight as well. Julia Saudelli is standing by for us there at the Greens election party. Julia, we know that climate change has obviously been the big talking point for the Greens, but tell us more about how they have run uh, their election. Well, they definitely went with uh, the fight against climate change as their uh, selling point, together with their promise of change having not been in government for a long time. Annalena Baerbock has said that uh, this is a climate election and that uh, the next government is going to likely be the last government ca can, that can bring meaningful change and meaningful action in the fight against climate change. And she says that's uh, because we want the Greens to be in government. Without the Greens in government in this next election, uh, change is not going to happen and that is her, her, her main uh, point that she's making with, with voters. She herself um, was a climate uh, speaker, speaker on climate topics for her party's parliamentary group. So it is a topic she knows well. She is known to be someone who has uh, attention for detail, who really goes deep into the topic. So it was uh, natural for her to push on the climate topic also because it is one of the main topics that are important for Germans in this election. It is actually the number one topic in a lot of polls, and we will see whether um, this shows in the votes, whether the Greens' push for climate action will show in the results coming up soon. Thanks to you, Julia. Over at the Greens election party there, we'll also be coming back to you just before uh, 6 p.m. And as you see, the, the clock is counting down there. Just around uh, 33 minutes left until we get those first exit poll results, get a clearer idea of who might succeed Angela Merkel. Now, the German electoral system is pretty complicated, but there are some good reasons for that. Whether it's the location where Germans cast their vote, their love for paper trails, or how they prevent election fraud, we're going to explain the ins and outs of the German election to you. It's the end of an era. After 16 years, Angela Merkel won't be Chancellor anymore. So who's taking over? To determine that, Germany is holding federal elections. And that's a complicated process, but for good reasons. First thing you need to know, Germans don't vote directly for their Chancellor. They vote to elect members of parliament, the Bundestag. They do that every four years. Unlike in many other countries, all German citizens are automatically registered to vote once they turn 18. No matter their gender, religion or political conviction. 60.4 million people will be eligible in the 2021 election. Every vote counts the same. Germans can either cast their vote by mail or in person on election day. Polling places are in schools, museums, you name it. Poll workers ensure an accurate, efficient and secure process. We are extremely diligent when it comes to the election process. For instance, we check the election register every time someone comes in, making sure they're actually eligible to vote. Once that's checked, the voter is good to go. But there are rules. Voting happens alone. No one else sees what happens inside the voting booth or which boxes on the ballot are checked. And no one is permitted to influence the voter's choice. Curtains closed, no selfies allowed. On the ballot, there is not just one box to check, but two. With the first box, Germans vote for a candidate from their constituency. The one with the majority of votes automatically joins Parliament.
With the second box, voters choose a political party. This second vote determines the overall percentage each party gets in the Bundestag, Germany's federal parliament. And in order for any party to enter the Bundestag, it has to win at least 5% of the second vote. That's to prevent smaller splinter parties and legislative gridlock. There are a few more details. For example, the overhang mandates. Sometimes a party will receive more direct parliament seats through the first vote. But this is really complicated, so we'll explain that another time. Speaking of complicated, no German election happens without a paper trail. Not much is digitized, for security reasons. We have an old school process here in Germany. We still use ballot papers, not digital votes. That makes it very transparent for our citizens. We've had very good experience with that in these 70 years. But, surprise, some digitalization has been happening in the meantime. For the final reporting of votes, poll workers can use, for example, email or the good old telephone. At 6 p.m. on election day, the first exit polls will be announced. Once the final results are counted, we move on to the next step. Remember, the election results determine the relative strengths of the parties in the Bundestag. Once the members are set, they team up in coalitions to form a majority. Then they elect the Chancellor. Each step of the process is necessary to ensure a transparent and accurate voting system. We've heard so much about the parties and the politicians and the people up top, but what about the people who vote for them? Let's have a quick look now at who German voters actually are. There's 60 million, more than 60 million eligible voters here in Germany, and you can see quite clearly they skew old, the largest group being 70 plus, and together you're looking at almost 60% of people over the age of 50. That doesn't spell too well for the younger voters who might have other ideas in mind like digitalization and education and climate. And the older voters, you might imagine, pensions are quite important to them. So this kind of breakdown in the age of voters has a huge impact on what politicians talk about and the kinds of issues they get focused on. Now, who is actually voting of these people? As we know, older voters tend to be more reliable voters, tend to be the ones that turn out more. But look at this, Germany, enjoys pretty high voter turnout. U.S. elections can only dream of numbers like this, for example. Even when it's dipped down in the 2009 election, for example, you're still looking at turnout of more than 70%, and it's been on the uptick in the last couple election cycles. Now, Sumi, Richard, what this means for this election, who's gonna turn out? Is it gonna be so high, given all the uncertainty, given all of the dissatisfaction, all the fragmentation? That is what we were waiting for. One of my favorite things I'm looking forward to. Absolutely. Those turnout numbers are going to be really interesting to see. And Richard, a lot of people ahead of this election were talking about the fact that there was a, a high number of people who were still undecided. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the numbers that we've received are not completely in agreement on this. Uh, uh, sometimes the question is asked in different ways. You know, are you undecided or are you absolutely sure about your decision? But, but still, the numbers do seem to suggest that an unusually high number of people are not completely sure about which way they want to go. That is perhaps to be expected. Um, you know, the, the last four elections, well, especially the last three once uh, Angela Merkel was established in office, really, the, you know, the prime question, first of all, is do you like Angela Merkel? Do you want her to stay, yes or no? And then if you say no, then you have a bit of choice. Voters now, of course, they have to consider the whole kind of panoply of, of, of parties and candidates. Um, so I think that's contributing to the uncertainty. But this, the indication so far from the early turnout statistics that have been coming out is that turnout may even be slightly higher than last time. And last time was a pickup from the previous time. So that is obviously an encouraging sign about democratic participation if it really bears out. Yeah, we certainly saw those long lines, as you mentioned, uh, yeah. here in Berlin. Yeah. And it's a beautiful day as well. Yeah. We actually have our correspondent, Jafar Abdul Karim, who has been uh, gathering voices, uh, talking to voters here in Berlin. Uh, let's see if we can bring Jafar now. He's been uh, talking to people, getting an idea of how things are. Jafar, we see you here in Berlin. Uh, give us an idea of what the mood is here in Berlin today. 
Yes, you, you mentioned it, Sumi. Today the sun is shining, so it was a very good mood and a very good uh, weather for election days. And I've been walking through the city, long lines waiting, uh, people in front of the uh, poll stations. And uh, I talk to different people. And my feeling is and why my impression is that a lot of people are really interested in the voting and, and being an active part today of the society. I also met Lisa and Catherine today here in Berlin, and they are joining us now. Lisa, you voted. And I'm really interested to know, according to which criteria did you decide to vote? So for me, the most important part was the climate part, because that was the one that was like most ignored in the last years. And it's, for me, the urge, most urgent topic, because time is running out to do things and change things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was my main criteria. And did you change your vote compared to the last uh, time four years ago? If I remember it right, I didn't. I think I voted the same uh, four years ago, too. What about you, Catherine? Yes, for me it was pretty much the same. Climate is a big topic for me as well. Um, I think we have to do more about our environment and like the other topics are digitalization, innovation. You know, I'm working in a startup and this for me it's very important to change something there. Yeah. And, um, what would be something surprising for you what could happen? Like almost maybe in a half an hour the polls will, will close. What is something that could surprise you today as a voter? Okay, um, well... That's actually a very difficult question. I'm not pretty sure. I, don't, I think it's pretty clear, actually. I think a lot of uh, people are going um, to vote, a lot of young people. So I think, like, green is a good, good for topic you. for me, yes. Right. But and, like, on the other hand, I know a lot of old people are voting, okay. too. So. Just for our international viewers, did you vote? Did you go live today or you voted uh, uh, via mail? No, via mail. Miami. Yes, because same with me, like in advance. Right. Yeah. And that's also what I heard today from, thank you so much, Lisa and Catherine. And that's also what I heard today from different voters. Some of them voted via post and others were really lining to be live there to experience and being part of the votes today. But actually what really helped today is the nice weather and a lot of people are sitting around enjoying this election day. Jaffar, do you get the feeling that people want to see change now heading towards this new government in Germany? What's the sense you're getting? There's, I, I cannot say there's one decision and one uh, opinion. You have different opinions. Some of them said, like what Angela Merkel did uh, with her government was already good and it could be a good continuation concerning stability. But when you talk to younger voters, they say, we want change. We want to have different topics. Digitalization is very important. Climate change is very important. And that's what you also hear. There's, so there's no clear one opinion when I talk to really different people also in different parts of the city here in Berlin. DW's Jafar Abdul Karim reporting for us there. We'll talk to you a little bit later in the evening. Thank you. Sure. And of course, Berlin is just one small part of a very big country and doesn't often represent what the rest of the country is looking like. So we have some information for you about what German voters are telling pollsters are important to them. Let's have a look here. Now, some of this data is a, a few months old, maybe it's changed, but we get a good sense of what German voters are telling pollsters are important to them. Climate protection, refugee policy, migration, integration, pensions, education, coronavirus pandemic, of course, is always there lingering in the background, and housing, huge housing crisis going on all around Germany. In fact, there's a referendum today in Berlin to take back to, to uh, expropriate large property companies. That's how bad things have gotten here in Berlin. Now, these are some of the big issues, but one of the biggest always consistently is the economy. Let's see if we can bring that up. There it is, the economy. What do people think about that? 60% are telling us that they're actually pretty okay with the things that are going on with economic and job security. 38%, not a small number, but still in the minority of people saying things are not doing so great. Of course, we've just come out of Germany, like in many other countries, of a huge economic crisis because of the pandemic. And in fact, we've seen just unprecedented action being taken on the, at the federal government level, like borrowing more money, a big controversial issue here in Germany. So the economy is likely to loom large as it has in past elections. Now, we just heard from Jafar speaking to two young women there. What do people by age tell us in terms of the issues that are important to them? Well, the youngest, now, of course, people under 18 don't vote. Uh, voting age here is 18, of course. So 16 and 17-year-olds, unfortunately, don't get to have their vote, voice heard. But for them, they're saying 
digitalization is the most important issue for them. Followed by the next group, the millennials, of course, are saying education, followed by climate protection, and then pensions. Makes sense that, of course, older people are concerned about their pensions and how that reflects in the election today. Well, we're going to be hearing a lot more about that. Thanks, William. Yeah, important definitely to look at the issues that are important to voters as well. I want to remind you, though, we're just about at that 20-minute mark until those exit poll numbers come in. So let's take a quick look again at what we have planned for you tonight so you can get an idea of what's coming up. At 6 p.m. Berlin time, so 20 minutes from now, the polls will close. There we'll have the exit poll results for you. So that's just at the top of the hour. We're going to flash those up for you. Then that will give you a sense of whether there is a clear winner at all and who might be in a position to lead the next government. About 15 minutes later, we're going to have the first results forecast. Then we'll have an even clearer idea where all these parties stand at the moment. Regular updates will follow as we get them. At 8 p.m. Berlin time, we're going to bring you that election night debate live. Again, that's when the party leaders come face to face to give their reactions to the election results. And the final result should be known by midnight. It could take longer this time. As we've heard, there's a high number of mail-in ballots. And also, we are expecting this to be a very close outcome. So we, we could know by then who's best placed to succeed Angela Merkel as German chancellor. But even then, it is, of course, not done. The new chancellor will only emerge once those coalition negotiations are completed. That is a process that could take, uh, as we said, weeks or, or really even months. Richard, we just saw some numbers about which issues are the most important to German voters. What does that tell you about uh, which way this election might go? Yeah, well, it, it's quite interesting because we have to kind of put it in the context that, as we mentioned earlier, the, the issues are important in this election, but it does seem that the candidates have really kind of trumped the issues in terms of, uh, of really driving uh, voters' preferences, at least in the opinion polling leading up to today. Uh, to take an example, well, we saw Jafar just talking to these young voters uh, in Berlin today, both of them saying that climate change is their top priority. We re this really comes through in a lot of the polling and overall, climate change has attributed a very high priority, but particularly young, along, uh, among younger voting groups. But the demographics of Germany are against that. The demographics we saw from William's charts there, just how old Germany's population is. And as we know from almost every democracy, older voters are the voters who more reliably go out and actually cast their votes. Um, so you kind of combine these two things together, um, and that can kind of eat away a little bit at, at what this importance of climate as an issue actually means ultimately in terms of election results. Um, so the Greens haven't been able to capitalize on the importance of climate change to the extent that you might think. Now that is partly, I think, these demographic factors, but it's also partly because of the candidate factor that Annalena Baerbock, as we heard earlier, that been, you know, she's, she's hit some trouble. Many voters seem to have drawn the conclusion she's not quite ready yet. It would be better if she had like a, a term in, as a minister or something like that before she was ready to run for chancellor. So that's an example of kind of, of issues being secondary effectively in this election to the candidates. We do have a lot of viewers watching from around the world and looking at Germany. What about Germany's place in the world, its foreign policy? Did that play a role in this election? Yeah, that's also really interesting. I mean, just as the campaign was really beginning to pick up, uh, we saw the chaos in Afghanistan, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, the images that went around the world um, of people trying to, to, to cling to planes, uh, uh, leaving the country, fearing the Taliban takeover. A real humiliation for the West and Germany uh, as, as part of the contingent there. That certainly affected the, that relatively early stage of the campaign. Um, but there was egg on the face of both of the main parties, the Christian Democrats and the, and the Social Democrats. Both parties uh, were facing a lot of criticism for how Germany has, has dealt with things there. And that really did end up just ebbing away and getting kind of engulfed in the rest of the election campaign. After that, foreign policy barely figured at all hmm. in the public debate. And there have been a series of, of uh, televised debates between the three main candidates. And apart from the first one, where they did talk about Afghanistan, in the second and the third of those, there wasn't a single question about foreign policy. There's been a lot of debate <laughs> after these debates about what's going on in the German media, why are they not talking about foreign policy? And then there was a final round uh, just uh, on Thursday, I think this week, where foreign policy was brought in into a wider debate with all of the main candidates. But 
yeah, it's been really trumped by domestic issues and, of course, the personalities involved, you know, as we've been talking about. So, um, so yeah, but that's not so unusual. There are not that right. many countries where foreign policy is really a driving issue in election campaigns. You have to add that. Well, certainly it's going to depend a lot on who is in the next government and who is leading the next government. As you'll see, it's just around uh, 15 and a half minutes left until we uh, will get those first exit poll numbers. Let's go back to William to take us again through the numbers and what they show us. Thanks, Sumi. Yeah, to understand just how momentous this election is, we have to look at what the governments of Germany have looked like recently. Now, you might see a pattern here, something similar. Um, black, red. Black, red, black, red. Three of Merkel's four governments, that's 12 of her 16 years, have been in power with the center-left SPD. It's known as a grand coalition, these two big parties working together. Even in 2017, the last elections, when both sides said, we don't want it anymore, they still ended up in power again. Because in Germany, stability, political stability, economic stability is extraordinarily important. And in this election, we just don't know what kind of makeup there's going to be. Because we can look at the polling data. Again, we looked at this at the top of the hour. Let's show you again just how fragmented the politics in this country have become. The two biggest parties that used to walk away with maybe like 70% of the vote. Tonight, in just a few minutes, they may walk away with perhaps 50%, perhaps even less of the vote. That shows how fragmented the picture is here. Look at that black line. Look at that red line. Those used to be and are the biggest parties in Germany, and even they're not doing very well. Everyone is kind of down below in that 20% range. It can be really anybody's games. There is a number, a number of possible coalitions that we could see among these parties. And I think we can look at what some of those possible coalitions are going to be. Remember, Germany is a coalition country. No one party rules. You have to get over that 50% hurdle. No one party is going to have that 50% majority. You need to find other parties to work with. And it's starting to look like a modern art painting, given all of the colors on the screen. And you can see, based on our polling data, what combinations could be possible coming out of today. Will it be? more business friendly if the liberal FDP party is part of a coalition? Will it be more climate friendly if the Greens are part of a coalition? Will Angela Merkel's conservative bloc for the first time in 16 years be kicked out and be sent to the opposition? These are all things we just don't know. The SPD has a chance to lead government for the first time since 2005. They haven't led that much in the history of the modern German Republic. But anything is possible in this election, including a three-way coalition. Now, what are voters saying about how much they want change? They're saying, yes, bring it on. We want change. We want something new after 16 years of Angela Merkel. But what exactly does change mean? We're not exactly sure to what extent uh, German voters would like change. But a lot of them are saying that they want it. And we can see by age. Also, very interesting, when we ask and break it down by the age groups, what do people want in, in terms of the next government? If we can bring it on up, let's see if we can make this work. Nope, not going to work. <laughs> if we're, well, I'll tell you, regardless what's up here or not, by age, people across the spectrum in Germany say they want change. So that is what's on the agenda today. That's what we're going to find out in just a few minutes' time. Sumi and Richard, I'm very excited. I hope you are too. We're all very excited. Just those coalition possibilities are hard to wrap your mind around, aren't they? I mean, it's a lot to think about there. Uh, well, we are just about at that, almost around the, at that 10-minute mark, or about two minutes to go until we get those exit polls. And we certainly wanted to go back to our uh, correspondents who are with the top three parties there. You see uh, Michelle Kufna, Nina Haza, Julia Saudeli with the respective parties. And uh, Michelle, let's start with you to just tell us uh, what's going on there really with just around 10 minutes left. Well, Angela Merkel's in the House. I mean, Laschet is in the House, the Chancellor candidate. Uh, very few politicians really swanning around. One gets the sense that they're kind of hiding in those uh, back rooms here because there is a, a mixture between excitement and dread. And the CDU, the Conservative camp, knows that that winning, that coming uh, ahead, becoming the top party, would take something like an Apollo 13 operation at the ballot box here in Germany. Uh, that's 
that's how tight the polling suggested it could be. They clearly have ground that they need to gain. And the big question is whether they've managed to really activate all the potential that that gold dust of, of um, traditional voters, enough of them. So um, very tense moments here indeed. Yeah, tense moments, as you said, it really is a dead heat between the top two parties, the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats at the moment, the Conservative bloc. Nina, coming to you, how tense are things there with the Social Democrats? Well, first of all, you do have to say, uh, no matter what happens, the SPD, the Social Democrats in Germany will get a better result, if you believe the latest polls, than they did last year. And they're very proud of that achievement. So there is a sense of almost a relaxed um, anxiety or uh, something where they're looking forward to uh, the exit polls when we'll have them in a couple of minutes' time. But of course, they're nervous as well because they know that uh, they will have to form coalitions and here they will also um, have to hope that their voters gave them enough support, them and the Greens, so that their preferred coalition works out in a way. Because one thing is clear, the SPD is uh, not in a position where they have an appetite for another grand coalition. All right, Julia, that brings us to you there at the Greens. As we heard, it looks very likely that the Greens will be part of the next government. How are things looking there? Well, here we're in the inside part of the uh, election event, but most people are outside. It's a beautiful day in Berlin, so they're all hanging out in the courtyard here. Quite relaxed atmosphere, although I've seen a couple of um, politicians, high-ranking politicians, looking a little tense because a lot's at stake for the Greens, even though it looks like um, the results that we saw at the beginning of the campaign, then coming in first and winning the chancellery, very unlikely, uh, according to the latest polls, they're still vying for a third place. And um, this could mean the best result in the Greens' history in terms of federal elections. So it could go either way. It could be seen as a big disappointment or it could be seen as quite a success. And what they definitely want is to get into government and to have a relevant role in the next government. Yeah, indeed. All right. Well, we'll let our correspondents, uh, Julia, Nina and Michele there, get back to the elections party for these uh, nail-biting final minutes. We'll come back to you just after the top of the hour. So thanks for those insights where you are. And uh, Richard, you know, we heard our correspondents there. Well, Nina said it's kind of a relaxed anxiety with the Social Democrats. I think that well describes how yeah, things are. Uh, didn't Michele also talk about a mixture of excitement and dread? I think <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's I mean, how accurate do you think these polls are at this point? Well, of course... Obviously, we don't know. We've only got a few minutes to wait. But but what is absolutely for certain is that this is the most unpredictable election that there's been for a long time and that we've seen this narrowing of the polls in the last few days. So it it's really, I think, the first time in many, many years where it's it's been impossible to say which party, CDU or SPD, will be top. Absolutely. Well, we mentioned that we have our correspondents at all of the parties. So I want to check in now with our correspondents who are at, at the three smaller parties uh, who are covering their election parties for us tonight. We have there, you see on our screen, Benjamin Gruber Alvarez with the AFD. Uh, we have Simon Young with the FDP. They're the Free Democrats. That's the business friendly party. And we have uh, Hans Brandt with the Linke. That's the far left party. So, Benjamin, let's, let's start with you. The AFD clearly not going to be in the next government. That is clear. All other parties have said that there's no no way they would create a coalition or build a coalition with AFD, but uh, how are things looking uh, for the far right there tonight? That's right. All other parties in parliament have said that they will not have any sort of cooperation or coalition with the far right AFD party. And so the mission for this party is another one to remain, to retain the status quo. Let's remember the political earthquake after the 2017 federal election. The AFD came in third with more than 12 percent of the votes. So what uh, leading politicians inside of the party are trying to do is try to retain that and stay the biggest party in the parliament as the situation is right now. But still, uh, polls are looking with 10, 11 percent, so not reaching uh, that goal. And the, also what is important here is that the topics have changed. We just heard our colleague Julia Sordelli talking about climate change. It's very important. And that's a topic that it's not important for the AFD at all. And the other important topics is it is the COVID-19 pandemic or the economic recovery are not that important for the AFD. The core topic that the FD has been pushing and tried to push over the past week is migration. And that is definitely a side topic for these elections. 
Let's go to Simon Young, who is with, as I said, the Free Democrats. Simon, the Free Democrats, the FDP, really could be the kingmaker. So tell us how tense things are there with just around uh, six minutes left till exit polls come in. Well, Sumi, there's not uh, a lot of tension to be felt right now. I think it's a pretty buoyant mood here at FTP headquarters. The Free Democrats say that they uh, stand for change. There's never been more to do is one of their big campaign slogans. They think it's time to roll back bureaucracy in Germany and unleash the country's uh, um, investment and innovation potential. Uh, but in order to do that, get that change, they need to be uh, in government, have a share in power. And they sense a real chance to do that this time. The polls suggest their support's around 11 or 12 percent, pretty stable over the last few months. There's no secret that few free Democrats would like to join, would prefer to join with the Christian Democrats in a government. Uh, and they also say they can do a deal with the Greens. But uh, FDP leader Christian Lindner hasn't ruled out uh, joining an SPD-led coalition either. He also says his main aim is to get as close to the Greens tonight as uh, uh, they can that will give them some kind of basis for negotiations because as you say very likely the FDP could be involved in uh, tortuous coalition negotiations over the next few months. Yeah we're going to find out just how close they get in a few minutes at least get a better picture of that and Hans let's come to you with uh, the link of the left party now because there is a possible left-wing coalition that could be built uh, after we get these election results uh, so tell us uh, how things have been there with the link of today. Yes, indeed. Uh, the left, the socialist left, have uh, probably got the coolest venue tonight uh, to <laughs> look at these election results and see what happens. Uh, it's right in the middle of Berlin's party scene. Some of Berlin's most notorious, world-famous clubs, one has to say, are just around the corner. And quite a few of the young people that the party is trying to address uh, are also milling around here. But there's no sign of there being a, a party at the moment. The socialist left have a problem in that they need to get at least 5% of the vote to retain their seats in Parliament, and that is by no means certain at the moment. They have not been doing well in, this, in the polls. They have been showing somewhere around 6%. If they drop out of Parliament, that would leave them in political obscurity for at least the next four years until the new Parliament is being elected. If they do stay in Parliament, and that's obviously what everyone here is hoping for, then they will have an option for power, something quite unusual for the left, which has never happened at national level in this country, they would be able to form possibly a coalition with the Social Democrats and the Greens, a left-wing coalition. If the left, in other words, if the socialists tonight achieve that 5% goal, stay in Parliament, then they will have reason really to have a party. All right. Our correspondents, Benjamin Simon and Hans there with the three smaller parties. Thank you all. We'll be coming back to you a little bit later in the course of the evening. Richard, we just got an update there from all of our correspondents who have been following the parties and also crisscrossing the country to get an idea of what's been going on. I mean, we just have now, uh, yeah, just under three minutes until we get those exit poll results. Yeah. What will you be looking for? Okay, I've just kind of listed, I think, the four most important things. So let's go, obviously, with number one, who's top? Of course, yeah. that's the first question that, we, that we'll be looking for. Um, do the Conservatives manage to stay top? Um, or do the Social Democrats manage to overtake them in a surprise victory? Second question, what's the gap between them? If there's a bigger gap between them, then that will have a big impact on the coalition talks moving ahead. We've heard about some of the potential combinations. It's fiendishly complicated. The bigger the gap between the top two parties, the more authority that top party has to kind of set the agenda with, with forming a coalition. Third question, What's the gap between the Greens and the Free Democrats? So the Greens, of course, we've seen that they've put it forward a, a, uh, a chancellor candidate. They're one of the kind of three top runners. But the Free Democrats also, uh, we just heard from Simon there, quite a powerful party, influential party, could be kingmakers. What's the gap between them? What's their relative power? That will be really important also for the horse trading of the coalitions going forward. Final question, do the left party get into parliament at all? As we just heard uh, from Hans there, there's this 5% hurdle that they have to get over. And they've been doing pretty badly. They've been close to that 5%. If they don't get in, that scrambles the arithmetic all over again. Yeah, well, we have just around a minute 30 left. We're literally counting down the clock at this moment. So just remind our viewers, Richard, why this is really such a momentous election for Germany, why there's so much at stake here. Well, Angela Merkel is leaving office and... 
I mean, we just saw in the, in our talk show with Max just earlier, anybody who was watching that, this is a, an election that's not just being watched in Germany, it's being watched around the world because Angela Merkel, I mean, she's been, been like 16 years in, in, in Germany. She's far and away the most experienced and powerful politician in Europe. Suddenly she's leaving the stage. Also, she has a global stature. And just think of for 16 years in power, that's double the longest presidency that's permitted on the American system. So this kind of, you know, 16 years in a democratic country is almost unprecedented. Leaving the stage, what happens next? It's a huge moment of uncertainty and a huge moment really setting the course for the, for the next few years, not just in Germany, but in Europe. How do you think Angela Merkel is looking at these elections tonight? Well, didn't she say recently she's looking forward to, <laughs> to having a nap? Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, but she's thrown in her lot behind Armin Laschet, as we were just seeing in our reporting earlier. So she, she has kind of weighed in on the election in the last few weeks. Well, we are counting down, as you said, these, those are the important things to look at. We're going to get these exit poll results in just about 10 seconds now, uh, and they'll give us a, a clearer picture, let's hope, because the last polls were very close. So let's take a look at what flashes up now. Well, we said it was a nail biter, and it is a nail biter. Let's see if we can get those numbers up on the screen to show you who might have a good shot of taking over from Angela Merkel, 16 years in powers. It is a dead heat. The top two parties, CDU, CSU, and the SPD, center right, center left, at 25% right now. now. I should caution you, this is an exit poll. This is a representation of what the results might be. This is by no means the final result, but right now we're looking at a tie between the top two parties. The Greens down to 15%, more than they did in 2017, but less than they are hoping for. And look down here, the left party just squeaks by, it looks like, into to have any seats at all in the German parliament. This is, <laughs> this is, this is where we are right now. We're going to have a lot more updates. I think we should turn it right over. Sumi, what do you think? People are in the field, and we should uh, hear what people are celebrating or not. Yeah, we're going to do that in just a second. I just quickly want to get your take on this, Richard, because this is exactly what you said, one of your points to look out for. How much of a difference is there so far, looking at the exit polls? Zero. Zero. <laughs> Zero. If this is the result that we end up with at the end of this evening, th this is going to be a very, very difficult situation to form a coalition. Um, it, it, they are, yeah, it, it really scrambles things. Um, if if both parties are on an equal footing, a huge number of questions raised, really, like, who has the advantage in trying to put together a government? Um, so, yeah, this is a fascinating result, real basically political deadlock. And it does, as you said, really reflect the polls that we saw leading up to today. Yeah, it does. I mean, we've had a narrowing of the polls uh, in recent days. There was this period a couple of weeks ago where Olaf Scholz and the Social Democrats overtook the Conservatives, and this was a big surprise. But things have tightened in, in recent days. So, so if this is borne out, then the polling, you know, there are a lot of elections recently in many parts of the world where polling ha has, has been wide off the mark. If this is borne out, then the polling seems to have been pretty close on the it Money. really is yeah. remarkable, we should say. The two top parties, the centre-left, centre-right, really in a dead heat. Uh, we're going to go right to uh, Michaela Kufner, who, as we said, is with the Conservatives. And Michaela, you were watching that big reveal on the screen uh, at the election party of the Conservatives. Tell us what the reaction was there. It was absolutely static. It was a moment of disbelief. Um, what they saw up on the screen there here at the CDU party headquarters is the scenario, if one had had to draw up a scenario that is the most inconclusive, it would have been exactly that, with the Social Democrats and the Conservative CDU, CSU, both having 25 percentage points and question marks of whether the left party will actually make it into the German Bundestag, which could, which could prove to be a huge factor in coalition building. So, very early days here. Um, it clearly is is a defeat um, for the Conservative CDU-CSU party. It's lost uh, several percentage points. It's the worst result uh, in its post-war history. Um, so yes, it's a defeat and it could still be turned into a governing coalition option depending on all of those postal ballots being counted because let's not forget, these are only exit polls. This is voters being asked to vote again um, anonymously once they've left the polling booth. Yeah, that's right. We are still waiting for those first results that we're going to get, Michaela. But just quickly, I mean, so our viewers understand this. These results, if they stand, uh, would essentially mean that we could still see Amin Laschet, of course, uh, become the <laughs> chancellor. 
Yes, they could. And um, particularly because of Germany's voting system that would currently, despite equal percentage points, give the Conservative uh, CDU-CSU three more seats in the Bundestag. But at mm. this point, it's way too imprecise to enter this into the formula and believe that this is actually a conclusive result. So a slight advantage still for the Conservative CDU-CSU, Angela Merkel's party, but a huge success for those Social Democrats who could still pull ahead. It's completely inconclusive at this moment in time. And that indeed is remarkable. Okay, you mentioned the Social Democrats. Thank you, Michaela. We're going to go right over to uh, uh, Nina Haza now, who uh, is with the Social Democrats. We hear cheering there behind you, Nina. There was a big round of applause and a lot of cheering here at 6 o'clock when the results popped up on the screen because you have to know that here we watched the other broadcaster, the other public broadcaster, and they saw the Social Democrats ahead of the Conservatives. They said that uh, the SPD had 26% and the CDU 24 So here the SPD celebrated that poll. And of course, as Michaela said, it's all still very, very much in fluctuation and we're going to have to wait for the postal ballots, etc. But then the cheering continued here behind me in the Willy Brandt House um, when the other results came up, because of course you have to remember that there are two more uh, regional elections here today in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern and here in Berlin for the regional parliament. And uh, the numbers that we saw here on the screen saw the SPD um, winning uh, Mecklenburg-Vorpommern by a very large margin. And in Berlin, they were also looking very good, those numbers. So tonight is going to be a round of cheering, another round of cheering perhaps in the next couple of hours. But we don't know because it is still a nail-biting event here. It really is, Nina. And just again, if you could put this into context uh, for our viewers, how big a deal this is. Yes, these are exit poll results. We're waiting for more official results and the picture could still change. But that at this point, we see uh, the Social Democrats really neck and neck with uh, Angela Merkel's party. It is a tremendous success for this party that was uh, for years known for its infighting, for all the, the battles between the various wings, the left wingers um, to, uh, and, the, and the moderates, and they didn't have the party under control. And so Olaf Scholz's um, nomination as chancellor candidate uh, seems to have united the party behind this one idea. We really want to lead the country again. We don't want to be another a junior partner in a, another coalition with the Conservatives, those days are over. It's time that the social democratic ideas get put, put forward again. And this result tonight, no matter how much the, the percentage points may change in the course of the night, is a much better result than they had in 2017 in the last federal election. We'll see just how much better. Of course, thank you, Nina. We'll be coming back to you uh, in just a little bit. Let's go over to uh, the Greens now, Julia Saudelli. Uh, Julia, tell us how the Greens have received uh, the initial exit poll results there. When we saw the first results coming out and the CDU and the SPD, there was quite a, a silence here. Everyone was still waiting to see what would happen next. And the first cheer that we saw from uh, the, the green audience here was for the FDP at 11 percent. So the cheering started then and continued until the green result came. And it was quite the cheer. People were jumping around, quite excited. And even though if we look at the, the, the current exit polls, the greens are at 15 percent. That's on the lower edge of what polling was telling us before before the vote um, but they still seem to be satisfied with that number if it were to stay as it is even though it is quite uh, lower compared to how they were polling at the beginning of the campaign but that is still quite a big increase compared to the last election in 2017 it is um, it went from uh, 8.9 percent uh, last time they were the smallest um, party in Parliament to being number three so it is quite an achievement for the Green Party. All right, thanks, Julia. We'll, of course, be watching as the official results come in. We're expecting them in a, around a little less than uh, 10 minutes from now and come back to speak to you then. Um, but 
You know, Richard, I want to ask you now about what we've been hearing from yeah. our correspondents and the picture that we're looking at. I mean, again, what do these numbers tell you, if anything? Yeah, it is fascinating, isn't it? And it is certainly worth mentioning that that there's this other exit poll out there, which is which is by the uh, other part of the public broadcasting group here from ZDF, um, suggesting 26 to 24 rather than this dead heat of 25-25. So we'll see as these numbers get refined through the course of the evening, there will be some movement, is very likely but certainly looking, of course, extremely close. Um, I would add to my list of, of, of things to look out for. One thing is what happens in the Conservative camp? To How is this result interpreted? As we heard from Nina, there was a cheer at the Social Democrats. Um, that reflects the fact that even though it's very, very close and even you know, perhaps a dead heat, They've gained a lot from the last election. The Conservatives have absolutely lost a significant a lot. So, so in terms of the expectations going into this election, uh, the Conservatives have lost the expectations game. The Social Democrats have won the expectations game. How does that affect the psychology within the party? How does that affect uh, the, the, the power balance within the Conservative Party? If you think about Armin Laschet, the man who we've seen in, in the profiles earlier, who became candidate for Chancellor for the Conservatives, he got through to the chancellor candidate position by the skin of his teeth after two separate power struggles uh, for, for, first of all, leadership of the party and then candidacy for the chancellor. The man who he beat in that uh, power struggle for the candidacy, Markus Söder, he is the uh, state premier in the state of Bavaria. He's done a lot of sniping from the sidelines in recent months. He's calmed down in recent weeks and tried to show unity. But we should watch. What does he say about this result? Does he indicate this to be a, a form of defeat? Um, what does Laschet himself say when he comes out uh, uh, and talks about this result? What do other members of the party, other senior members of the party, start? saying if they start crowding in and piling in on him and saying that this was actually a miserable terrible result then that could change the dynamics uh, of this whole situation and kind of grow a, a greater perception of the SPD having won but a lot counts on of course you know where these numbers go but this psychology yeah. within the party will be interesting in certainly the, the post-mortem on this election is going to be really yeah. interesting and, and Richard just one more question about the coalition possibilities I mean this is probably going to take quite some time for Germany to, if these numbers stand, to yeah. create the next government. Yeah. So it's it's most likely that a three-way coalition would be needed between three parties. And that, of course, is inherently more complicated. You have to get three parties to agree on an agenda. If you add to that the potential for actually both of the biggest parties potentially trying to create a coalition, doing exploratory talks with, with, with the other parties, this could become an incredibly complicated situation. Um, so, I mean, at the last election, it took almost six months to form a government. Um, and that was a less complex outcome of the election than this time. Um, if things do kind of coalesce, though, around acknowledging the Social Democrats is ahead, if they do, start, if these numbers saved from the other broadcaster tend to be a bit more the direction that things settle in, uh, then you could see a consolidation around that, especially if Armin Laschet then decided to resign um, and there was a power struggle within the Conservative ranks. But this is all getting ahead of ourselves yeah. now. Um, but a fascinating result. And this is uh, this is going to be a nail bite of the rest of the night, but also for the for the days and weeks ahead. It certainly is going to be. Let's check in with uh, some of the smaller parties now that could, of course, as we've heard, uh, play a big role in forming the next government. We do have Simon Young uh, with the FDP at the moment. Um, Simon, how has the FDP reacted to these first exit poll results? Well, positively, overall, there was uh, cries of uh, joy, I should say, when the um, results for the two regional elections, uh, Berlin and mecklenburg vorpommern were announced. Uh, the FDP have boosted their share of the vote in uh, both of those places. Uh, at national level, they've nudged up just just very slightly, uh, and uh, so they're positive about that. Uh, but of course, everyone is staring at these results, these numbers right now, uh, not results, these projections rather, to see uh, you know which way it goes. Because the uh, the the question about which of the two main parties comes out on top eventually. Uh, is really key for what kind of coalition can be, can be formed, as we've been saying. Uh, and it could very well be the FDP 
uh, are involved whichever way it goes, but in terms of the arguments that they'll bring forward, how much pressure they'll uh, be able to bring to bear, what sort of demands they'll be able to make, and indeed what sort of internal ructions uh, any such coalition manoeuvres might cause within uh, this party, which is a sort of business-friendly party. We often describe it. They want, they want to uh, open up things for business and uh, keep taxes low, a couple of their key sort of policy platforms. That is, you know, it's going to be um, very different uh, if the CDU are ahead, the FDP can work with them. If the SPD and the Greens are trying to form a coalition with the Free Democrats, well, there'll be a lot more sort of acrobatics uh, necessary for the FDP leadership uh, over the next few months. Yes, yeah, Simon, just a quick follow-up on that. On the national level, again, these are exit poll results. We're going to get more concrete results in a few minutes, uh, hopefully, if all goes as expected. Um, would this really be seen as a successful election for the uh, FDP coming in at around, uh, from what we can see from those results, around 11%? Well, I think they uh, will feel that it's it's pretty good. It's where their polls have been for the last few months. I should say, going back to the beginning of the year, it looked very different. They uh, were languishing, but they seem to have sort of put together a pretty uh, effective campaign and persuaded people. This really, this message, almost a sort of post-Merkel message of, you know, things have got to change, something's got to happen in this country. Yeah. We've had too much stagnation for too long. They, it has to be said, were partly the cause of stagnation. They put pulled out of coalition talks uh, with uh, the Greens and the Christian Democrats after the last election, and that's what led to another grand coalition, which essentially was a recipe for stagnation. So I think they have had a good election, but um, it doesn't make it any easier going forward. It certainly does not. Thanks, Simon. We're going to come back and talk to you a little bit uh, later. Richard, I mean, what do you make of how the uh, FDP appears to have done from what we know? Well, well, yeah, I mean, the FDP will often, often their spin has been leading up to this result. Anything that is in double digits is great, they hmm. say, because they haven't had double digit results twice in a row ever. So they got 10.7 last time, so if they get 11. But there were some projections that they could end up with 13 or, or, or potentially even more. So I think there will be a bit of a disappointment that they didn't get that far. But of course, early days that things could change. I just want to quickly bring in, like, there have been two reactions already uh, from senior party people and both Conservatives and the Social Democrats to this. So I think this is interesting yeah. com from what we were just talking about earlier. Um, so the Social Democrats um, have said, so, so one of their leading uh, um, figures, uh, the General Secretary of the party, has come out and said, the SPD is back. Um, and that we have a, a clear mandate, uh, we want Olaf Scholz to become Chancellor. And so essentially claiming uh, a kind of victory there and just saying, all right, it's, it's, it's up to us now to start moving forward and trying to create a coalition. Uh, his counterpart in the, seat in the Christian Democrats, five minutes later across the wires here, uh, also Secretary General of his party, Paul Tsimiak, saying that there is a possibility for what he calls a future coalition uh, of uh, the uh, the Conservatives, uh, the Greens, and the Free Democrats, uh, where we were just talking to Simon there. Um, so claiming that there is a possibility also for them to, to form a coalition. So both big parties at this stage, mm. you know, just a few minutes after the, the first exit polls, saying that they're up for forming a coalition. But very early, we'll see where the numbers go, but I wanted to bring that in. Yeah, those are very interesting statements indeed to see just a few minutes after we've gotten those results. And tell us something about how uh, tricky this next part of the process is going to be. Let's see if we can bring in, uh, yeah, we have uh, Benjamin Alvarez Gruber with us, who is with the far right, the AFD. And, you know, Benjamin, in the last election, we saw the AFD sweep into Parliament for the first time, uh, become the largest opposition party. A lot of people were looking at what would happen. I can't hear you anymore. So, Benjamin, I, th I don't know if you can hear us, but maybe you can give us an idea of how the AFD uh, feels this result uh, has come across. Okay, we are having some trouble. We are having some trouble with Benjamin's line there. He can't hear us at the moment. But we're going to try to come back to him again. Uh, the far right AFD. No, no, uh, now, he, you, now you can hear us. Great. Uh, Benjamin, bring yeah, us up to... Great. Bring us up to date on uh, how people there in the AFD have looked at this result that they've gotten, at least according to the exit polls. 
Well, there was a lot of laughter and clapping when the results of the Conservative bloc came in. And Tino Kropala, one of the lead candidates of the party, also addressed the people that came here to this event venue, saying that the voters punished the Conservative party after 16 years of Angela Merkel. There was a side of relief when they saw that the AFD still could maintain a double-digit result. They could not reach the 12.6% that they got four years ago. But what's also interesting is not just the projection on a national level, but also what happened on a regional level. As we saw with projections, AFD coming second in one of the states that also had elections here. So there was a lot of clapping here. And what lead candidate Tino Kopala said is that the AFD came to stay. As I mentioned earlier, none of the parties in the parliament want to have any sort of cooperation with the AFD. So they will see how they can still try to push. And he said also with other leaders who address the people here is that they will try to continue pushing for their work in the parliament. According to the polls, it could get as many as 87 seats in the parliament. Indeed. All right. Thank you, Ben Hamid. We'll come back to you, of course, as well a little bit later. I want to bring in our correspondent, Hans Brandt, who's standing by there for us uh, with the left party. Uh, Hans, how does the left party, how have they reacted to the results that have come in so far? Well, I think you have to say with shocked silence, there was absolutely no reaction when the um, numbers came up on the screen behind me. Um, the party had thought that uh, reaching the 5% uh, hurdle that they needed, in other words, reaching 5% of the vote so that they could get back into parliament, they knew that that was going to be difficult, that uh, it's possible that they might not reach that goal. Now they are on exactly 5%. It's going to be a long evening here because uh, obviously if they stay in parliament, there's actually an option for the left to be involved in the negotiations that might go on on a coalition. They might possibly still have a chance of uh, offering some sort of coalition building with the Social Democrats and the Greens. But as we just saw in some of the projections that uh, uh, the public broadcasters has uh, generated, there is a chance that the, the, the left party could get into parliament and there would still not be enough seats to make a majority for a coalition government with the Social Democrats and the Greens. So uh, they could win and lose at the same time tonight. Uh, so the atmosphere here is very tense, uh, very somber, and there's a lot of waiting to be done tonight to see how these figures develop. Yeah, indeed. I think with a lot of parties, the atmosphere remains tense as we're waiting for more results. Thank you, Hans. We'll talk to you a little bit uh, later. And you know, as we said, we were going to bring in another results forecast. We'll do that in just a moment. We've been waiting for some of those numbers to come in. But Richard, listening to that, it seems like it is just going to be a, a very tight situation. And it's going to be very difficult at this point for either the Christian Democrats or the Social Democrats, the Conservatives or the, the, the central left to go about building a government. Yeah, I mean, it, it really does depend, like, how, whether more of a gap opens up during the course of, of the evening. And remember what we were talking about earlier, the fact that there's been a significant amount of postal voting uh, this year, um, even potentially 40 or 50% of the ballots, uh, which has never happened before in Germany. Uh, the last election, there was a, a record was achieved of, of between 25 and 30%. There's a big, been a big jump on uh, since then, people getting used to postal voting and, and the pandemic uh, is assumed to be playing a role there. So there's a lot of uncertainty about whether those votes are going to break in a similar way to today's votes. So really a lot of question marks. Um, but I think this psychology fact is going to be so interesting. Also, what we were talking about, the, 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 these party leaders beginning to come out uh, and speak publicly. Um, the Social Democrats, General Secretary, uh, saying, as we just said earlier, that uh, claiming the mandate uh, to, to form a government. He described himself as elated, as <laughs> überglücklich, more than happy. Um, and at the same time, his opposite number in the Conservative Party was having to talk about uh, bitter losses. So th th the psychology of the result will be developing as we through see through the course of the evening, in addition to the numbers coming in. Um, and that can affect what happens in the next few days. This can affect the willingness of the smaller parties then to talk to which party. The Free Democrats and the Greens have to think about, well, which party would we rather be in with? So they each have a preference, but the result, the, the actual which of the bigger parties is stronger, 
will really have an impact on the potential legitimacy of any government coming out. So an awful lot of, yeah, this combination of the actual numbers and the psychology uh, really going to be fascinating in the hours ahead. Certainly, no matter which coalition comes out of this, it's going to be a change for Germany. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's quite interesting. We've been talking about how much change do Germans <laughs> want. Of course, they kind of get change for free in this election because Angela Merkel uh, is uh, not standing again. So there will be some change. But if we look at the, you know, these two most plausible coalition outcomes uh, as things stand at the moment, is a three-way coalition which would be led either by the Conservatives or by the Social Democrats. And then with these two smaller parties, the Greens and the Free Democrats, the pro-business party, in that together. Uh, there has never been a government like that before. After the last election, there was an attempt by Angela Merkel to put together a version of that government. It didn't work out. This time, the pressure will really be on for, for one or other of these coalition varieties, or there are some other potential ones, but these seem to be the, most, the ones most people are focused on to come together. And these bring together very different parties. You know, They will straddle the centre-left and the centre-right, and they will straddle different sets of priorities, whether it's climate change or uh, approaches to the economy, which will be very different and divergent. So getting a, a coalition agreement to work between these divergent company, uh, uh, parties will be difficult. And also, how stable will a government like that be when it has such divergent attitudes within it? So it will be interesting. The German people, they didn't vote for the big change by really putting like the Greens or the Free Democrats up top. But they're getting quite a bit of change out of this, whether they want it or not. Well, we were hoping to bring up another results forecast. We're still waiting for those numbers to trickle yeah. in. I, I mean, mean it, quite it's, telling that it's taking a long time. Of as course, well. yeah. you mentioned, I mean, there yeah. are more people voting by mail this time around, and yeah. it is such a, a tight uh, outcome as we've seen. So yeah. let's go back to Michaela, who's with the Conservatives. Michaela, take us back, you know, a few days. You've really been uh, following the campaign of, of the Conservatives really throughout the summer and, and crisscrossing the country uh, with, I mean, Laschet and with the campaign as well. Um, and and in the last few days in particular, we saw Angela Merkel really actively jump into this campaign. I mean, what does that tell uh, you about how important and how perhaps even desperate in these last moments the Conservatives were feeling about this possible result? Well, Angela Merkel had vowed to pretty much stay out of her own succession. She had agreed to uh, two um, appearances uh, for sure during that campaign. And then just over two weeks ago on that final stretch, it could uh, fairly be seen as a sign of desperation that she was drawn in to do several more occasions than she'd initially planned, that she started to stress how much she was behind Armin Laschet. And I just want to remind ourselves how she sold having lost, uh, having um, achieved less than the 41% she uh, achieved uh, two times ago in the last elections, her declaration of victory was, nobody can form a government against us. That is how she defined victory. Now, if we look at um, what we've seen so far, those exit polls, very early days, um, they're on a par with the Social Democrats. This is a defeat for the Conservative CDU, Angela Merkel's party, even if they manage to, uh, to form a government in the end in a coalition. And uh, these are also very tense moments to learn how much leverage those potential coalition partners will have. I just want to single out the Free Democrats, because if the left party doesn't um, manage to pass the 5% threshold. That means that threat of there could be a significant shift to the left won't be there. And that would make it very hard for the Social Democrats uh, to actually attract uh, the attention of the Free Democrats. Um, so a lot of chain reactions uh, depending on one or two percentage points either way here. Mm. And the other big takeaway is that the far-right AFD party clearly has maxed out in terms of uh, voter following, uh, losing more than one percentage point here at 11 percent in these early exit polls. Michelle, I'm going to come back to what you said about Angela Merkel and how she defined what victory would be. I mean, was this inevitable that um, the Conservatives would see a kind of slump because there would be this type of vacuum after 16 years of the world's most powerful woman uh, leading the country? Uh, not at this scale. Uh, eight, nine percentage points, that's a, that's a huge uh, backslide if you're coming from uh, the Merkel-esque poll position. Um, there is continuing debate within Angela Merkel's own CDU party whether they did in fact choose the right candidate. That was shut up um, over those recent weeks. But 
if the CDU is not ahead in that final uh, result that we will hopefully get um, throughout the course of tomorrow or that initial official result, um, then the knives will be out for Armin Laschet, who was perceived by many to be the weaker candidate uh, and not the right candidate to go into this election. All depends on a couple of percentage points here. Indeed. And we are waiting uh, to see what those next results bring us, Michaela, as you are. So we'll come back to you when we know a little bit more. I want to bring uh, Nina Haza, who's with the Social Democrats, back in now. Nina, I mean, give us an idea of, you know, you also were following the Social Democrats campaign until now. Give us an idea of how they were able to get to this point. Was it really, you know, the popularity or lack of popularity of other candidates or the popularity of Olaf Scholz? Well, a combination of all of those, obviously. They had uh, by far the most competent candidate in the eyes of German voters. That's uh, been a consistent result of the polls that we saw in recent months. Well, most Germans, no matter which party they were from, said that Olaf Scholz was the most competent. Now, whether they liked him or not was a different matter, of course. But then the others... Um, his rivals made major mistakes, um, mistakes that you don't make in such an important election campaign. And add to that the fact that both of them, or all three of them, uh, were not that well known nationwide. I mean, Angela Merkel is such a such an impressive figure, and everybody knows her. But um, when you ask Germans about who else do you know? Olaf Scholz is her deputy and still not everybody was aware of uh, who he actually was until this election campaign. And so then the Social Democrats decided that they would throw all their weight behind Olaf Scholz, their most solid candidate, the uh, deputy in the current government, the finance minister, somebody with a long experience in politics and in governing positions. They nominated him last year when uh, the other parties were still struggling with, um, um, with with their races, essentially with their campaigns, trying to find out, um, are we going to go for a woman in the case of the Greens, or are we going to go for Armin Laschet or Markus Söder in Bavaria? So that gave the SPD definitely a head start of half a year. And they had time to bridge the gaps between the various wings. Uh, it was quite striking. The SPD has a strong left wing, um, and the party leadership is left wing. And Olaf Scholz actually lost the race to become party leader to the current leadership duo and still those two leaders have really taken a back seat in this campaign that has been extremely interesting to watch because the social democrats knew that their one big asset was their candidate and their experience and it seems as though that message has paid off that the german voters actually gave the spd uh, that credit of having somebody who uh, germans can trust the country with yeah, Nina, coming back to, you know, Olaf Scholz as a candidate, some of our viewers, you know, not here in Germany and, you know, haven't seen the posters up uh, on the streets around the country. Uh, Olaf Scholz really fashioning himself as the natural successor to Angela Merkel, didn't he? He even, in a, a newspaper interview where they only ask for gestures instead of spoken answers, he even made Merkel's symbol. Um, and that just uh, is the clearest sign that he, he um, has known Angela Merkel very well for a long time. He was her labor minister, then he became mayor of Hamburg and worked together with her uh, on various in various groups um, across uh, the federal system. And then he became her finance minister. And of course, he's understood how she works. He also has learned um, what to do in, in, in terms of crises. And he has... Uh, worked very closely with her. I mean, by the Social Democrat standards, Olaf Scholz is a more um, moderate to right-wingish, by Social Democrat standards, kind of a person. So, in a way, Olaf Scholz is now trying to portray himself as the natural Merkel successor with the extra oomph in that he really does want the Greens to be added to that coalition government. All right, thanks. Nina with uh, the center-left Social Democrats. They will talk to you in just a little bit. And uh, now we're going to uh, head back to William. We were hoping to get uh, some first results of uh, forecast numbers at this point. We still don't have them. So William's going to take us back through those exit poll numbers that we have. We do yeah, have at the let's moment. Let's have a look at those again. We, they are just exit polls. Uh, clearly, we are still waiting for more solid numbers. But let's show you here up on the wall 
where the numbers stand as far as we know them right now. These are just exit polls, but it's looking like the center right and the center left. The, the current grand coalition government are tied neck and neck, 25%. Still a lot of counting left to do, still a lot of postal votes left to count. There's been problems in Berlin have been reported about people still voting even after the polls have closed. So these numbers are by no means final, but you've been hearing it from our correspondents. You've been hearing it from Sumi and Richard here at the table. This is very, very close. We are in for a very long night and probably very long weeks, maybe even months of awkward coalition negotiations, both the center-right and the center-left, if these numbers are anywhere accurate, may have a claim to trying to form a coalition government, meaning Germany's next government could lean center-right, it could lean center-left, it could be more climate-friendly, it could be more business-friendly. We just don't know. One of the big questions was, will it go considerably further to the left with a red, green, pink, or red, red, or red, red, green, as they like to say here in Germany, but we like to distinguish the colors a little bit for your sake and for my sake as well. Um, that looks like it might be hard to do if the left party barely squeaks by with its 5%. Remember, you need to get over 5% of the vote to have seats in the Bundestag or at least three direct uh, candidates from your party be elected. The left might not have the numbers to make a red, red, green, or red, pink, green, <laughs> uh, to have that more leftish government that we've been hearing so much about. Remember, it would be the first time that the left were to be in government. It would be quite uh, a, a change of things here in Germany. We just don't know. Right now, we're looking at the most possible coalitions would be still some kind of combination of black and red, of center right and center left together. That would be Maybe more of the same, but who knows what kind of, you know, who would be on top, who would be on the bottom. We just don't know right now. It's so, so exciting. The Greens, of course, are a big question. Is that 15% going to stay where it is? No matter what, it is a good shot that they will be in some kind of government. But the question is, how much influence will the Greens have in a government? So let's have a check now of where the wins and losses are. As we were hearing... This is a big loss for the CDU-CSU. They were expecting it, the polls were showing it. They're down almost 8% according to the current numbers. While the SPD is up a little bit, that balances them out, puts them at that equal number that we were just seeing earlier. The Greens have done quite well as well in comparison to their 2017 result. Maybe not as much as many Green voters were hoping for, but still a very strong third place showing as things currently look. But this is what we're looking at right now. It's a very fractured, fragmented picture. And we're looking at German voters who just aren't quite sure where they want to put their vote after 16 years of Angela Merkel in power. I think we have maybe a seat distribution chart. We could see what is going to be coming up. If these numbers hold, this is what things look like. Look how close that is. Right now, 200 seats for the CDU-CSU, the center-right, 197 seats for the center left SPD. That is so, so close. Remember, these numbers are still going to be changing. One thing to note, remember, the current Bundestag has 709 seats. Now we're looking at 730 seats. That number is likely to balloon even more given the complicated way that seats get distributed in the Bundestag because we do have in Germany this two-vote system of direct candidates and party lists, and those have to be balanced out, which means the Bundestag is ever-growing, one of the largest, if not the largest, democratically elected parliament in the world. This is how the seat chart would look right now, this potpourri of colors, this rainbow of colors. So many parties uh, to be battling it out over policies, various policies in the Bundestag. But we first need to know which of these parties is going to be in the government because the government is the ones that set the agenda that then send things to the parliament to be voted on. Let's look at those possible coalitions, right? Again, it is all over the place. This is what could be possible to get parties over the 50% line to form a government. You're looking at either a center-right-led government with the Greens and with the liberal, uh, the liberal FDP, the free, mar free market, pro-business kind of party, or it could be the same thing, but instead of the center-right, it could be the center-left. 
that would take a different tone of the kind of government if it's center right or center left, more on one being more possibly more business friendly, a little more conservative, one being possibly more socially oriented in terms of taxes, in terms of pensions, uh, in terms of unemployment, these kinds of things. Then you have the dreaded grand coalition. And I say dreaded because neither of those parties have said they want to do that at all again. They've done it three out of Angela Merkel's last four governments. They said enough is enough. They said that in 2017, Sue, me and Richard. We both remember that. Yeah. How they said no more GroCo, no more Grand Coalition, but they had it anyway. Will there be one now again this time? That is what we're waiting for the numbers to show us. Yeah, in the end, in such a fractured party landscape, you're going to see several parties that have to work together regardless of what they say. Richard, I just want to confirm something that you said a little bit earlier, a, a statement from um, the Social Democrats uh, Secretary yeah. General saying, indeed, uh, he has said, as you said, he tweeted out that you know the Social Democrats very clearly here have the mandate. And I wanted to add that uh, the CDU Secretary General says uh, here, I'm quoting, uh, the election losses are bitter, but the results are very close. It will be a long night. Something certainly yeah. uh, we, we can say that's for sure. It's going to be a long night. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's definitely like the, if the, the, the tone of the two men is very different. You know, the 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 social democrats are trying to project we've won this, even though of course they don't know whether that's the case yet. Um, the Conservatives trying to hedge their bets, trying to stay in the game. Uh, their Secretary General saying that we'll have to wait and see. Um, we have to do what's right for the country. Um, and we'll, we'll consider that option, this option of trying to put together a coalition uh, with the Green Party and with the, uh, with the Free Democrats. Um, just one interesting um, quote coming through uh, from a senior member of the Free Democrats. Mm -hmm. So this liberal pro-business party uh, where we saw Simon just earlier, um, which would be a very major player in almost any conceivable coalition. Wolfgang uh, Kubicki, uh, who is a very senior uh, leader in that party, yeah. uh, has said, we want to govern. We are ready for talks. Um, and saying that he would rather go into a coalition that's led by the Conservative Party, but saying that they're open also to other combinations. So they're definitely keeping their options wide open and saying that they want to govern a really strong signal that they want to kind of get, get into the negotiating room now and start talking about what kind of government uh, they could be a part of. And that's going to be very interesting to watch. It's very likely that they will end up with uh, control of the finance ministry in Germany. And the Indeed. finance ministry, whoever controls the purse strings, is the same in any other country. But uh, here, that's a very powerful position. Yes, indeed. And that's something the head of the uh, Free Democrats has his eye on, that post, the finance minister post. We're, we're looking at, we've heard, gotten a note from uh, Michelle Kufner that Amin Laschet, the, the head of the Conservatives, might speak yeah. soon. So we're going to keep an eye on that, of course, watching our screens. But for now, I want to go back to Julie. Uh, who's with the Greens there, uh, watching uh, the election results there with the Green Party. Uh, Julia, give us an idea of how things look for the Greens now. I mean, given these first exit poll results, again, we are still waiting for that first results forecast. Uh, with these results that we have at this point from the exit polls, what the picture is there for the Greens, what the possibilities are? Well, it looks like the Greens will have to enter a three-party coalition to be able to be part of a, a government. It won't be enough for them to govern alone with the SPD or with the CDU if the numbers stay as they are. And that's going to make things a little bit complicated. The Greens have said they would prefer to govern with the SPD, and the SPD says the same about the Greens. But who is going to be this third player in the coalition uh, with uh, the uh, left party, the Linke? It's looking maybe unlikely and it wasn't necessarily also the preferred option for the other two parties. And then the FDP comes into play. And um, it's going to be tricky negotiations going ahead with the FDP, with the um, uh, Free Democrats, uh, because on certain policy issues, they are not aligned either with the SPD or the Greens, for example, in terms of borrowing money to finance investment or recovery efforts. Also, in terms of some of the coronavirus policies, they are not aligned in terms of raising taxes for the richer part of the population. So if they do end up going into talks with uh, the Social Democrats and the Free Democrats, it is likely going to be a complicated situation. At the beginning of the campaign, uh, there was a lot of talk of the Greens entering into coalition with the uh, Conservatives, with the CDU. And the one uh, state government in Germany that is led by the Greens, it's in Baden-Württemberg, is a Green and uh, 
CDU government, and it has been working quite well for both the parties for a few years now. So that would still also be an option for the Greens to enter in a, in a coalition that has the Conservatives present. Yeah, Julia, if we, we can zoom out a little bit and looking at the Greens, you know, we saw on Friday here uh, across Germany uh, hundreds of thousands, uh, well, several thousands at least, uh, protesters from the Fridays for Future movement out on the streets, bringing again awareness to uh, the need, uh, as they see it, to do more for climate change. And certainly there's a question asked when you look at the issues that are important to German voters. Climate change is, is quite high up on that list, but it didn't seem to translate, if you look at these exit poll results at least so far, to that much support for the Green Party. How do you explain that? Why is that? Well, the fact that um, the issue of climate change and the fight against climate change has become quite a mainstream topic means that also the other parties have picked up on that issue and have put it at the forefront of their campaigns and have become more of a competition for the Greens on that front. Uh, now, uh, if you look at what the Greens propose in terms of fighting climate change, they have policies that go a bit farther uh, than, for example, the Social Democrats or the Conservatives. And it could be that Germans are not quite ready to see those kinds of changes happen, for example, higher CO2 prices or uh, an end to combustion engine vehicles. While if we look at the conservatives, for example, or even the social democrats, some of their goals are um, a little less ambitious, we could say, and maybe Germans don't want that quite yet from the Greens. And Julia, give us an idea again, you know, what Annalena Baerbock and what the Greens would be looking to push in a possible coalition. They'll have to obviously walk back some of their campaign promises possibly, but uh, what do you think will be, if they enter this next German government, their biggest priority really? Well, they've said in their campaign numerous times that for them it's important to combine the fight against climate change with uh, the promotion of social equality. They have been criticized in the past for being a party for the elites that doesn't really care about poor people in the country. They're trying to move away from that image, and that is something that's important for them. They would want a 12 euro per hour minimum wage, something that the Social Democrats would also want, but not necessarily uh, the Free Democrats. Uh, they have these ambitious um, uh, climate goals that they uh, would want to push and they would also like to push for more investment not only in terms of uh, making the country more green but also for innovation digitalization and that's where they could find some more agreement maybe with uh, the free democrats the business uh, business friendly party but uh, definitely there's going to have to be room for for compromise if they do want to form a coalition with uh, a set of three parties mm -hmm. All right, Julia, thanks. Uh, we'll come back to you in a bit when we know a bit more. Again, we're waiting for more results, hoping to get some soon. Uh, Richard, I just want to bring you into the discussion we've been having there with, with Julia and our correspondence with all of uh, the parties. Uh, it does seem like it, as we said, could take quite a long time to get a new government. I mean, if we zoom out a little bit and look at this, again, we have so many viewers joining us from around the world who are, are looking to see what to expect from the next German government. It's, it's really isn't that clear. I mean, it could go in many directions. Yeah, it, it, it could go in many directions. We could end up with a government that is really very different in its makeup. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that in terms of foreign policy on the world stage that there's going to be some major disruption and a total change in position. Um, I was just in New York this week with the German foreign minister covering the UN General Assembly and uh, the foreign minister was there really trying to emphasize that, you know, whoever comes top in this election, whoever uh, forms the next government, that you can anticipate a broad kind of continuation of, of what they see as the sort of dependable German foreign policy, which, which goes back quite a long time. No big surprises. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't controversies. And there are big issues about things like um, how should Germany uh, hold its own against the rise of China and, and, and the challenge from Russia, authoritarian states, which are really challenging the, the way that you know, Western democracy works. Um, there's quite a debate going on here about that. And the, the makeup of the government could, could affect posture towards China, for instance, a willingness to go along with the United States in, in, in trying to rally democracies to take a more forthright uh, view towards China. But still, it's not going to change really big fundamentals in terms of 
uh, in terms of foreign policy. And I think all of these candidates, um, uh, Laschet, Schultz and Baerbock, are very much still in, a, in the centre ground mould uh, of, uh, of, of German politics. We're not talking about a party like, for instance, the left party, where we've been talking about whether they may make it into government or not. Uh, a party which is very adamantly opposed to NATO, very anti-American in its positioning, uh, they have absolutely no chance of leading a government. There's an outside chance that they could be a junior partner within that government. But if they wanted to get into such a government, they would need to make big concessions on that kind of area of policy. Yeah, I just want to jump in there, Richard, because I, I see we're bringing in some pictures now. Let's, let's listen in. These are the co-leaders. There's the chancellor candidate, Annalena Baerbock of the Greens. Let's see if we can listen uh, into her now. Well, first of all, let me say fantastic Berlin. Bettina's had to leave already, but the numbers are fantastic. Congratulations, even if we don't yet know what's going to happen, but well done Berlin, fantastic. And also what I've been hearing from Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania so far, great. And thank you to all of you from Robert and myself. And that just representing our 120,000 members, we're standing here thanking all of you. Thank you to everyone across Germany. It's been an amazing election campaign, a way we've never done before in this country, round the clock until last night, till the very last second. So many of us were out and about, over a, a hundred town halls with thousands of people, and the preparation for that around the clock. Fantastic town halls, fantastic. And wherever we could speak together, that was really amazing too, Robert. It was always a really special moment being there on the ground in the evening in Frankfurt or finally in Dusseldorf the last night. And just really getting a sense of so many people who weren't actually members of the Green Party but who were interested, where we really had a sense that there's a real longing for political debate in this country and a longing not just from those who for 40, 50, 60 years have been alive, but we're talking about school children, not just the ones at the Fridays for future demonstrations, but even before that. You know, some of them were saying, well, we had a free hour from school and we thought we'd come along and find out what's going on. So these are school children who want us to shape the future together because it's our future, everyone's future. It was amazing, amazing to really feel that 14 million children interested. Today is an unusual election evening. For the first time since 16 years, Nicht mehr Angela als Merkel no longer ran das as candidate for Chancellor. Für 16 very good years for Germany. And this is why I want to thank Merkel the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, for her work, first and foremost. However, it was clear to us, it was clear that without her in office, it was going to be a tight election campaign. It was going to be neck and neck. And that's exactly what's happened. It's been a neck and neck this evening is an extraordinary situation that we're experiencing here. We still don't have any reliable numbers, any reliable results. But what we can say is that we cannot be happy with these results. And all the same, the outcome of these elections is unclear. It's going to be a long night. And what is sure is that the election results are going to mean that for the CDU, for all democratic parties, it's going to be a challenge. We have to set the course for the next few years, and this is why we have to ensure that all Democrats in this country must overcome all of their contradictions and hold Germany together. 
It would seem that for the first time we are going to have a German government with three coalition partners. And we, as the Christian Democratic Union, have received a clear mandate from our voters. A vote cast for the Union is a vote cast against a left government. And this is why we will do everything we can to form a German government led by the Christian Democratic Union. Because what Germany needs now is a future coalition that modernizes our country. Germany needs a coalition for more sustainability in every sense of the word when it comes to climate protection, but also finances. We bear responsibility for the generations to come, for our children and grandchildren. And this responsibility is something we must do justice to more than we have in the past, particularly when it comes to the climate. We need a coalition that makes our country faster, more digitized, that frees our country, eases up red tape, and makes planning permission faster. We need a coalition that stands for more openness to the world and market economy solutions as well, one that strengthens Europe and that ensures that like-minded Democrats across the globe can create a future that will contribute to making the world a better place. And I will work towards this right now, together with Markus Söder of the CSU and with our whole team. And in this coalition, every partner must feel their ideas, their priorities reflected. It has to be a coalition that brings the country together, holds the country together one in which each can put into practice what they promised their voters. I congratulate everyone to their results and thank you for an election campaign that was nearly always fair. And particularly, I want to thank you the members of the election team of the CDU, the CSU, from the north to the south, east to the west. This was a successful election campaign. We caught up a lot of the ground we lost. You did a great deal. You never gave up. And that is what drives me for the future. The election campaign is over, and now what it's about is creating a stable coalition for a strong and modern Germany, and the German Chancellor will be the one who manages to bring together contradictions and create a shared program for the four years to come. A German Chancellor. Bundeskanzler wird der, der im deutschen German Chancellor will be the one genau diese Gegensätze who überwindet, is able to overcome these contradictions in the Lower House of Parliament, the Bundestag, who brings together MPs from across the country. It would have to be a Chancellor for everyone who lives in Germany. And that is the job ahead of us. There will be many intense debates with our political competitors in the days ahead. Dieser Bundeskanzler 
But this German Chancellor must develop a project that will last beyond the next few weeks. There's an important period ahead of us. I am ready to take this on. Okay, you've been watching there uh, Amin Laschet, the chancellor candidate of the Conservatives speaking. Uh, and Richard, you know, after seeing those uh, exit poll results and initial results we have that show a very, very tight race, uh, what did you make of what we heard from Amin Laschet there? Yeah, Amin Laschet trying to stay in the game. Um, clearly, his message, we're not giving up yet. I mean, we've been seeing during the course of the last, how long is it now? Just uh, just under an hour since the, those first exit polls came out. You know, the spin machines have been <laughs> like, uh, on, like on maximum settings. The Social Democrats selling this as a victory. Uh, the Christian Democrats, obviously, they cannot sell this as a victory, but he did say, I mean, Laschet there, this was a successful election campaign that we caught up a lot of the ground that we lost. Well, of course, in fact, his party has just lost a good um, seven or so, perhaps eight uh, points compared to last time and has had its worst election result ever. So that's definitely trying to put the bravest face on the situation that he possibly can. But the reality is that, you know, there is precedent going back a few decades, but there are precedents for part for coalition governments being put together in Germany by the party that came second in mm. an election. There's no rule that says the top party has to form the government. These precedents were a long time ago. The situation is perhaps different now. But still, trying to stay in the game and trying to say that he wants to, to put together this, this term that we heard earlier from, the, from one of the party leaders, a future coalition, um, which would be a coalition with the Conservatives, with that pro-business, de free Democrat party that we've talked about, and with the Greens. And uh, we're going to see a lot of manoeuvring uh, and a lot of outreach to those two parties uh, from the Conservatives and the Social Democrats in the hours and days ahead. Indeed, outreach. And you mentioned the Free Democrats. Again, they will play a, a crucial role now going forward. I think we uh, can bring in uh, at the Free Democrats at the moment, I think, yeah, the party leader. There he is, uh, Christian Lindner speaking. By zwei aufeinanderfolgenden Bundestagswahlen zweistellig. German elections after another, we have had double digit results, and this is a fantastic result. in here and here he is uh, at the social democrats party headquarters in berlin i see a, a raucous round of applause there for him as the party appears to have uh, achieved exactly the same result as the center right as angela merkel's party so we're going to listen now to what olaf scholz had to say friends
Liebe Freundinnen und Freunde. Friends. Ich freue mich. Ich freue mich, so viele hier zu sehen. Pleased to see so many of you here, and of course I'm very pleased that the citizens of this country have voted the way they did. They have decided that the Social Democratic Party is doing better than for a very long time, and this is a real success. It's going to be a long election night, that's for sure. But another thing that's sure is that many citizens have voted for the Social Democrats because they want a change in the government and they want the Chancellor to be Olaf Scholz. We have given for we said that we want more respect in this society. We worked towards ensuring an industrial modernization of our country, and we worked to ensure that we stop climate change. These are three major objectives that we need to overcome in our country objectives that we have all fought towards in the election campaign, but that the polls be developed as well as they are, that we're getting the exit polls results showing that we are getting a lot of support from the citizens in this country, and this is a mandate given to us to ensure that everything we said in the election campaign, all of our proposals be implemented, and that we push for this politically. But let me say at this point, thank you. Thank you to the citizens who cast their vote for me, for us, so that we have this kind of election result. But let me say, as one member of 400,000 members of the Social Democratic Party, thank you to every single one of you who pushed for this to happen. We're a pragmatic party. We know how to govern. We're an optimistic party that wants to push for a better future for all of us in Germany. But I think we've also shown that we have what it takes to govern a country, the ability to join ranks and have everyone support us. And the fact that that was the case is something I want to say thank you to all of you for. Being pragmatic, being optimistic and joining ranks, this is what we will show in the time ahead. And that's what's important. And I'm sure that the citizens of this country will be glad that they voted the way they did when they voted the Social Democrats. We will deliver on our promises. And so,
Jetzt warten wir auch das endgültige so let's wait for the final Aber election results. Wir uns an die But Dank. then we will get down to work. Thank you. Olaf Scholz there. Speaking to his party members there at the Social Democrats, the party headquarters here in Berlin, to a really jubilant crowd. And I'm going to try to bring in Nina Hazard there, who's actually literally standing uh, just above the crowd there at the party headquarters. Uh, Nina, if you can hear us, you know, there you are, Nina, we can see you now as well. We heard a similar message um, from Amin Laschet now again from Olaf Scholz, essentially uh, saying that we very well, uh, very much believe that we have the mandate here to, to build a government. Yeah, that's right. But uh, what else can they say? I mean, it's such a tight tight race uh, still and they're both aware that uh, we're going to have to look at the next couple of hours to find out whether there is some one party that will edge forward slightly so of course at this point in time they're both claiming a victory and the right to form a government and technically speaking is also possible to form a minority government but we're not quite there yet first of all uh, the idea is to form a government that has enough voter support um, to have ideally to have a majority also in Parliament and Olaf Scholz here in this speech I mean uh, the round of applause lasted about two minutes so the uh, SPD in an almost enthusiastic shape tonight and um, they're celebrating this strong candidate who really has managed to turn around uh, the SPD um, if you if you look at their history I mean in 1998 they were on 40 percent so they really were a big Ten party then they slumped down to 20 in the last federal election and he's pulled them back out and there is no denying and he said tonight he's st he stuck with his message that he's uh, tried to sell to voters for the last year uh, for the past year since he's been nominated as chancellor candidate he said it's all about pragmatism and optimism and unity and that's what he intends to continue doing all right thanks nina we're going to check in back with you uh, in a little bit as we find out more You're watching special DW coverage of the German election, and we have some slightly tweaked results for you. Now, remember, on one hand, German results tend to be very accurate, but this year we have postal ballots to, to, to count. So come with me. Let's look at where we are now. Things have changed slightly. Both the SPD center left and the conservatives are down a little bit from that 25%, just under, with the SPD just by a whisker ahead. Again, more ballots keep coming in. Postal ballots keep needing to be counted. Some postal, uh, some some uh, people are still voting after the, at this point because of some problems that we've been hearing out on the street. The Greens also slightly, slightly dropped a, a two-tenths of a percentage point. Things are basically where we've seen them. These could go a little bit up, a little bit down. As the night goes on, we will be more and more locked into these results. The Socialist Left Party fighting to stay in the Bundestag at that 5% threshold, although if they have some, if they, if they have at least three direct candidates, they will have some kind of representation in the Bundestag, but not nearly as much as they were hoping. Still quite a bit down uh, from their current uh, situation. Um, and the FTP, we saw also very happy with their result today. But look at this, as we've been saying now from our correspondents in the field is here in the studio, the era of the big tent party in Germany appears to be over, at least for now, with everybody down uh, quite a bit with the CDU, CSU. Remember the biggest party in Germany losing maybe eight percentage points since the 2017 election. The, even the SPD, which has gained since the 2017 election, they're down to historic lows. As we heard from Richard earlier, it could be, you know, it depends where you want to start counting from historically or from the 2017 election or from the polls in the last several weeks. Based on what you're counting from, you can decide if the party of your choice is doing better or worse. But again, the conservatives down, the socialists left down, the AFD far right a little bit down, the liberal party here in yellow, basically where they were in 2017, SPD, by their standards of the last couple of years, doing well, being competitive in this very fragmented situation that we're seeing. And of course, the Greens having done really well from their 2017 result, but still not enough to really 
have a decisive role and to see exactly decisively where we are going with these coalitions over the next weeks, possibly months. Let's see what these all mean for potential seats in the Bundestag. This number is going to keep on changing, so stick with us. Right now, again, we're looking neck and neck. It really can almost not be closer. One seat difference between the center right and the center left. The Greens getting a big boost of members in the parliament and the other parties you can see there. Um, uh, it's a quite a, a toss-up, really, as we've been hearing. This is going to be a very difficult coalition building session uh, over the next while. It's going to be a long night. And speaking of coalitions, let's have a look at all of the possible coalitions. I've been saying it looks like a modern art painting with all of these colors, and it sure is. This is what we need to get over the 50% line. As you heard from Nina earlier, you could technically have a minority government, but we're not there yet. Let's keep things as simple as possible to get over that 50% line. You would have to either see right now, according to the numbers, which again, they can change, you're looking at a possibility of the Conservatives staying in power with Armin Laschet as the Chancellor, doing a coalition with the center-left, even though they have to say they do not want to work together anymore, but it's possible, mathematically, along with the Greens. You can also see the center-left kicked out despite their, their, their relatively good performance today. You could still see them not get in the government, and you could have a center-right with the Greens and with the liberal free Democrats, which would see something like a climate and pro-business uh, mix-up going on there. And then you could have, you could flip it. You can toss out the center right and throw in the center left and have them with the Greens and the liberal free Democrats there in yellow. The much warned about from the conservative side, the much warned about red, red, green, or here you see pink, red, pink, green, uh, that looks like it, they won't have that 50% majority they would need. So a left-leaning government, probably not in the cards, but anything can happen over the next several weeks and months. Sumi, Rich, I don't know how you're looking at this, but I mean, I can't, I can't, I can't make you know heads or tails of this. What what might come of it? Yeah, there are so many possibilities, indeed, William. And it's going to be really interesting to see how things change as the night goes on. If you're just joining us, let's bring you up to date because you're watching our special coverage of the German election and exit polls. We just saw they show a virtual tie between the two main parties. The center-left Social Democrats they won nearly 25 percent of the vote. That is a big improvement on their 2017 results. Seeing pictures there from their party headquarters just a a little while ago. And uh, one, they say, gives them a mandate to govern. Now, the conservative CDU-CSU bloc, they also got around 25 percent. That is their weakest result in any federal election in 70 years. They say they're not happy with the result, but it is also a mandate to govern. Now, the Greens, they came in third. They could well play a role in the future coalition. But the outcome, it leaves wide open who will head up uh, the next government. So those are, that is rather where things stand at the moment. I want to get some more input from our correspondents, Michelle Kufner with the Conservatives and uh, Richard here uh, in the studio. Uh, Michelle, I just want to start with you quickly because we didn't uh, get to get your take on what we heard from Amin Laschet, again saying uh, essentially that it was a disappointing night in many ways for the Conservatives, something you mentioned already, but he very much will pursue building a coalition-led government. Well, he has no other option. Um, it's, uh, the result isn't bad enough to concede defeat, and it's not good enough to uh, claim that you are the party, you are the automatic candidate who should be calling the others to try and form a governing coalition. So he was totally left in limbo. Uh, so are uh, the CDU followers here in the room. So what do you do when you haven't quite lost, but you haven't quite won? Well, he recognized that the CDU had lost significantly. It's the worst result in its history, as we've heard. He said, we cannot be happy with this. At the same time, uh, he said there now needed to be a coalition for the future, as he now chooses uh, to call it. And that would be the preferred option, uh, together with the Greens and the Free Democrats. Um, but it's not quite clear yet whether he will have the moral authority, uh, authority externally and internally to make those calls. He also said that this was a challenge for all democratic parties here in Germany, that they should all now talk to each other, be constructive. So he's almost trying to sound presidential there. But he had no other option. Um, so it will be a very long night, he told us. Well, we do know that. And a lot more maths will have to be done until we know who even has the edge. I mean, as we just learned, it's, it's 
0.2 percentage points uh, that those two parties, the Social Democrats and the CDU, are apart now. Then we might have to throw in some complications of the election system, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Indeed, we will. And I don't think we can stress enough how remarkable that difference is, how small that difference is, Michaela. Uh, we've just been talking about Amin Lashid. I think we, we do have a clip of him speaking just a short while ago where you are um, at the party headquarters. Let's see if we can listen to that now. It was clear that without her in office, it was going to be a tight election campaign. It was going to be neck and neck. And that's exactly what's happened. It's been a neck and neck this evening is an extraordinary situation that we're experiencing here. We still don't have any reliable numbers, any reliable results. But what we can say is that we cannot be happy with these results. Richard, bring us uh, up to date again here, uh, or remind us, rather, how we got here. This, as Armin Laschet said, extraordinary situation of these two parties, essentially, you know, one percentage, not even a percentage point apart at this point. Yeah, well, it was interesting to hear Armin Laschet's attempt to uh, spin the situation, essentially, there. So, you know, he was saying that it was it was clear that with it, without Angela Merkel running again for office, that this election was going to be neck and neck. Well, actually, the polling suggested that that wasn't clear. Um, and the, going into the beginning of the year, that the Conservatives had a significant advantage over the Social Democrats. Uh, and Armin Laschet's enemies in the party will be thinking, no, it wasn't clear that it was going to be neck and neck. It was your mistakes that made it neck and neck. And what's going to be very interesting is, this, you know, especially if we think about Markus Söder, so we have to kind of dial back a little bit. Markus Söder, who is the uh, effectively the governor uh, of the state of Bavaria, um, who leads the conservatives wing there called the Christian Social Union. He's a very popular politician who who tried to challenge Laschet for this crown of the of the chancellor candidate of this conservative union. Um, this was a bitter power struggle, which really consumed the conservative party during the early part of the summer. Laschet won it by essentially uh, the, the sort of old guard of the, of the uh, Christian, of the CDU, so the senior kind of member of this, of this conservative alliance, the old guard rallying behind him and saying the, the Bavarian part can't sort of take over this role. Um, and from their point of view, from the point of view of supporters of Markus Söder, Laschet has essentially lost this election for the Conservatives. Mm. Um, so I think what uh, Michaela said there, this idea of his authority is going to be really, uh, really critical in the days ahead. Does he have the party, the authority within the party to kind of move ahead into these uh, coalition talks? Can he unite the party enough or will it dissolve into a kind of blame game and infighting with the people who say your candidacy messed this up? Um, essentially tearing the party apart. And also his authority towards these other parties, the Greens and the Free Democrats, can he project enough authority that they think, well, we want to get into bed with this party at all, you know? So I think that's going to be very, very interesting in its early days. He's obviously, he's tried to stay in the game with this statement tonight. He's, he's positioning himself as, I want to try and do this. We don't know if he's going to be able to. A lot will depend on what the numbers are really later tonight. If, if they end up significantly below the Social Democrats, and then this kind of psychology within the party, how that's going to affect his authority. Ms. Ellen, maybe you could just comment on that, what we just heard from Richard, what Amin Laschet's position is within his own conservative bloc at the moment, how much authority he has going into these next crucial hours, uh, days, weeks, really. Well, there's one thing that the conservative CDU CSU are very good at, particularly those Bavarians, which is closing ranks when you need to display unity. That's exactly what they did. They put on a great show of unity when Armin Laschet came to Bavaria, but Marco Suda lost against him. His own conservative bloc in Bavaria felt that he was the better candidate. They went on the record, so they actually did their bit to damage Armin Laschet's authority within their own party. And um, the, the knives might not be out 
yet, but um, people are certainly starting to reach for them as soon as he no longer has a chance of actually forming a government. Um, that will actually open that rift once again here within the Conservative CDU-CSU, which by the skin of its teeth um, pulled itself together to do what they always expect, which is contest an election, win them and form a government. Well, this didn't work out um, as well, according to the figures we know so now, but it, there certainly isn't a safe margin and that has already damaged him, no matter what comes after. Then again, he's a man who's recovered uh, from situations like these uh, before. He's a man who's always underestimated and who he is a power politician who, uh, as he just stressed now, actually, uh, wants to form a coalition where every party can actually fulfill what they promised their voters. So he's already putting quite a bit of political currency on the table there. He's in a spending mood uh, uh, towards those potential kingmakers, the Greens and the Free Democrats, uh, because that is also the key to his own political survival. Okay, so that's the view of him within the Conservative bloc. Richard, I want to ask about how the country sees him and how Germans see him. This is a man and, uh, at the head of his party who has promised to modernize the country, uh, to address climate change, digitalization, uh, education, uh, brick and mortars infrastructure as well, all of this. And yet he comes from a party, he's leading the party, who has been in power for the last 16 years. Did that make it more difficult for Amin Lashid? I think it definitely did. Um, and this is also, this is of course, not something that's so attributable to him as a candidate. This is really a structural challenge that the Conservative Party was bound to face in this election. They've been in power for 16 years. Angela Merkel, after 16 years, is saying, OK, for me, it's enough. I want to go and have a nap, as she actually said. Her party wants to keep going. Her party wants to keep going to 20 years. And I think Obviously, a party that wants to keep going in power for so long has to have the power to 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 redefine, to reimagine itself, to to claim, you know, to rejuvenate, and to claim new missions. And that gets very hard if you've been in in power for that incredible amount of time. So that has definitely been a challenge for them uh, to present them to be able to kind of present themselves as modernizers. And it's quite interesting that you know this language or this terminology that they're beginning to use now for a co potential coalition, which has previously been referred to by its colours. And this often happens. You know, Williams showed us his his modern art on the wall. You, you know, there's a lot of kind of the shorthand usually for coalitions is often the colours. It's been referred to as a Jamaica coalition. Well, he's now calling that a future coalition. So trying to kind of spin the idea of, of and essentially, wh where does he get the future kind of tinge as that in that future coalition? Well, it's from the other parties. It's from the Free Democrats, the Liberals, who are pro-business, pro-investment, and sort of um, trying to, they have a modernizing image in that sense. And the Greens, who have a modernizing image in saying that it's time to properly uh, tackle the climate crisis. So, so trying to position, you know, the, the, the conservative bloc in a way that, that comes across as fresh and new. But still, the fact will remain. If they end up leading a government, then, then after another four years, they will have been in power for 20 years. And I think, obviously, you know, there comes a moment among voters where they think, well, maybe a party has been in power for long enough that that starts to lead to problems. And it was interesting earlier this year, and we can move on into Sussex, but I think it's an interesting thing to bring in. There were a series of scandals during the earlier course of the, of the pandemic around members of parliament who were accused of using their contacts uh, to, uh, to um, do contracts for selling things like masks and other equipment associated with the pandemic. So this was seen as kind of grubby dealing, uh, using kind of political connections to make money on the side. And this is the kind of thing that voters look at and think, OK, maybe this party has been in power too long if it's starting to kind of behave in this way. Well, I want to come back to Michaela now and maybe bring that, close that circle again back to Angela Merkel, because Michaela, you've been looking very closely uh, at her legacy on a number of fronts, really, and her legacy in policy internationally here at home as well. What do you think this picture that we're getting of this essential essentially a stalemate uh, in this party landscape right now with these uh, exit poll results that we have. What does that tell us about Angela Merkel's uh, legacy, what she's left behind politically? 
Well, in 2017, when she actually lost several percentage points in those last elections, um, there was a lot of criticism that it was because of her. But uh, what we also keep learning back then and now is that many people actually voted for the Conservative CDU, CSU, exactly just because of her. And uh, this is now somewhat being separated. We've seen some more data coming in now, and uh, that suggests that the Social Democrats, the other Big Ten party here in Germany, which no longer really deserved the name in the last couple of years, now rejuvenated, took votes left, right and centre quite literally, um, that it's drawn almost one and a half voters potentially from Angela Merkel's conservative CDU. Now, there was a lot of inner party criticism that Angela Merkel had shifted her own party too much towards the Social Democrat SPD. Um, that seems to be where quite a few voters went. So uh, the Angela Merkel factor is gone, and uh, that has, uh, whether directly or because of her centrist policy, cost the conservative CDU dearly, along with the perceived weakness of its candidate. Having said that, um, Armin Laschet, who was also called the male Merkel, <laughs> may yet still pull it off. <laughs> yeah, he, so it's quite spectacular here in Germany. But what it does show, despite the fragmentation, is that there are still two strong big parties here in Germany, two big ten parties, but no longer as big as they used to be. Indeed. All right. Thank you, Michelle. We're going to come back to you again in a little bit. Uh, I think we're going to try to bring in our correspondent, uh, Simon Young. He's, he's at the Free Democrats. We don't have him just yet. We're going to bring him in in, in just a moment. So uh, we're going to try to get a hold of him. We have, of course, been talking about uh, the, the Free Democrats quite a bit, Richard, as the possible kingmakers yeah. going forward. Yeah. I mean, that is going to be really interesting to watch uh, how they take this situation forward. So... Who are the Free Democrats? So the Free Democrats are essentially, the, the, they're often referred to in a shorthand as the pro-business party. And mm. that is a pretty good kind of encapsulation of them. Because unlike in, say, the United States or the UK, um, the Conservatives haven't gone to a kind of full-on pro-market um, uh, positioning in how to deal with uh, economics and, and the functioning of the economy. Um, the... Uh, the Reagan and Thatcher revolutions, which took place in those two countries uh, in the Anglosphere, where there was a lot of deregulation and this belief in, you know, if you just kind of unshackle business, then you will create more wealth and that wealth will spread around the economy. That didn't happen in Germany. Um, but it's the Free Democrats who come closest to representing that within the political firmament here. So it's a relatively small niche. It's, uh, as we've seen, around 11% of the vote this time. But it does make them a significant voice. Um, and they are very likely to be in the next coalition, whichever it is, whether it's led by the Conservatives or it's led by the Social Democrats. And they are very likely to extract a high price in negotiations for entering that coalition and most likely to get uh, the finance ministry. And the finance ministry is an incredibly powerful um, political unit here. Of course, mm -hmm. it is in any country. Um, and that is absolutely the case in Germany. And especially given the number of challenges moving on post-pandemic, uh, investing to deal with climate change, a lot of these issues, uh, the finance ministry will be absolutely centre stage. And so seeing how they would deal with a potential centre-left government led by the Social Democrats or a potential centre-right one will be interesting to watch. It will be. Uh, our correspondent is off gathering some yeah. voices. Simon's there just with the, the Free Democrats gathering some voices. I also want to ask you about something we haven't discussed really yet is how big of a, an impact this German election and the outcome will have, of course, on Europe and, and European policy going forward. Yeah, well, Europe is, of course, watching this closely um, of what is going to happen. I mean, Angela Merkel has just been this kind of rock in Europe for years, hasn't she? Um, underestimated at the very beginning but in her first term, but, you know, she's been through, she's a veteran of so many crises over these 16 years. Um, and many of those crises have been centred on Europe and how she's kind of pulled through, through those has been really central to the narrative of how Europe has developed in recent years. She doesn't only have fans, that's for sure. Uh, we saw Yanis Varoufakis on our talk show just earlier with, with Max there. Obviously, he's somebody, the former Greek finance minister who had a lot of showdowns with Angela Merkel, is still carrying the scars of those. Um, but she was somebody who was kind of predictable, 
that that European leaders knew that they could kind of count on and that she has a legendary interest and capability for finding the compromise. <laughs> and this is at the heart of Europe. So certainly a lot of concern in Europe about, okay, who's going to replace her? Having said that, all of the three candidates are certainly pro-Europeans. There's no Eurosceptic getting into uh, senior positions here in Germany. But they do have slightly different, um, slightly different profiles, slightly different priorities. Armin Laschet and Annalena Baerbock certainly have had European EU dealings a lot in their biographies. Uh, Olaf Scholz a little bit less. Um, but still, I think none of them are really going to massively rock the boat in Europe. But I think also Europe is looking ahead to next year, the French elections. This is the next really big election. And that is where something much more dramatic could happen um, with the uh, National Front there uh, potentially uh, being a major challenge to Emmanuel Macron in that election. So Europe's on tenterhooks in a way more on that than on what happens in Germany. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are still waiting for that more concrete results forecast to come in. Again, these numbers are really are, are just trickling in there. Uh, something to perhaps mention, we are just talking about the Free Democrats uh, who have a, a certain perspective on the purse strings in Germany and that could have also a big impact on Europe. I, I think Simon Young brought, uh, brought in a soundbite for us. He was able to talk to Alexander uh, Lambsdorff, who is the uh, deputy head of the Free Democrats in the Bundestag. Uh, let's see what he told our Simon Young. It is a big change. Uh, Germany is turning into what I would call a more normal European nation. We do not have these big uh, uh, blocks anymore with two, you know, two or three smaller parties, assorted parties uh, on the margins. We now have a very different system. And I'm, I would be concerned if my party didn't have a role to play in that concept, but we do. And so therefore tonight, on election, eve, uh, on election night, I am not concerned. I am very happy with our historically excellent result. Not surprising, Richard. I mean, he's pretty happy with that result. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, he's going to be an interesting man to watch. Alexander Lambsdorff, um, he's, he was in the European Parliament for, for uh, many years before coming into the German Parliament here. Uh, he is somebody who, if in a future coalition the Free Democrats got the foreign ministry you're looking at the next foreign minister, most likely. So he has a lot of foreign policy experience. He actually started out his career in the foreign ministry in Berlin. So he's a, he's a, he's a diplomat as well as a politician. Um, uh, so an interesting guy to look at. What, is, no, what was he actually saying there? What does it actually mean? Um, he was sort of saying, OK, we're moving to a more fragmented political landscape. Now, we know that. That's, that's clear. Um, but he's indicating in that that the free Democrats are basically willing to talk to either potential uh, party, you know? So the Free Democrats in recent years have always kind of pinned their colours much more closely to the Conservatives. They're now having to shuffle into a much yeah. more kind of open position where they could also work with Olaf Scholz if he does come out as, as the much stronger player. Um, so, yeah, these little bits of the puzzles all moving <laughs> into place and, yeah, lots of spin going on as well because We're historically hoping. excellent yeah. result, I, it's a perhaps slightly a gloss on the result. But it's certainly, they do like to repeat the point and it's certainly something that's never happened with them, double digits twice in a row. So that is a continuity that they've never managed to achieve before. Oh, as we're seeing these bits of the puzzle come together, we, we know that everyone is hoping to get more results, uh, a more concrete picture of these numbers. We are waiting for that as well, and we'll bring you that as soon as uh, we get it. But let's go over to Hans Brandt, who's uh, with the left, because Hans, you know, a lot of people there at the left, of course, very much hoping that the left could be part of a, a possible German government. It really is uh, a question at this point, isn't it? Yes, it's a very, very uncertain uh, prospect at the moment. Uh, the, the crucial part is uh, the party needs to get 5% of the vote so that it can get a larger number of members into parliament that it can basically remain in parliament. And it's very unclear at the moment still whether it will achieve that. Um, at the moment, it is at exactly 5% in the most recent uh, numbers that have been produced by the uh, German public broadcasters. If it stayed at 5%, it would still have a larger number of members of parliament. But uh, unfortunately, it will still not be enough, in fact, to form a coalition uh, with the Social Democrats and the Greens. So that option of having uh, a, a, path, a path to power, as it were, a path to becoming, possibly having at least a chance of becoming part of a, the next German government, even if the party uh, 
takes the 5% hurdle, if it remains in Parliament with a large number of uh, members of Parliament, it might not be enough actually to form a coalition. So that would mean the party would be in Parliament, but it would not play any further role in the coalition discussions that we are going to be having in the next few weeks. So it's a very bitter night in the end for the, for the lefts, for the socialists. It really is a, a, on a razor's edge at the moment, Hans. If you could just remind our viewers, because we saw in the lead up to today, um, the Conservatives really warning against a coalition that would involve uh, the left party where you are being part of the government, why that is the case and why they're seen as a controversial possible member of the government. Well, they are the leftmost party in Germany. They are basically socialists, uh, and they have uh, a lot of criticism of international uh, uh, associations such as the, uh, the NATO alliance. Uh, they're very critical of the United States. Um, they're very uh, particularly more friendly towards Russia. So these are all uh, aspects of their international policy that would be uh, difficult within an international context within the European Union and internationally beyond that. Um, at the same time, there is a, a strong tradition in Germany, especially amongst conservatives, uh, of warning against the communist threat. This go, harks back to the Cold War period in Germany when the country itself was divided into two countries, one of Western uh, orientation and the other the, Social Democrat, uh, the German Democratic uh, um, Republic, East Germany being part of the Soviet uh, communist bloc. So this tradition of anti-communism is something that is uh, very strong amongst conservative voters in Germany. That is the feeling to which the campaign of the conservatives in the last couple of weeks tried to appeal, and it looks as though some of that appeal was successful. At the same time, we have to say the left party, the socialists, got much fewer votes than they had anticipated, and that is not likely to have had much to do with the campaign from the side of the Conservatives. It probably has more to do with the fact that the party itself is very divided internally, is not really convincing in uh, its political positions, even to people who would prefer um, a left party. Uh, so there's already some indication here uh, amongst people in this hall uh, of a kind of reckoning between the various factions within the left party, although there are appeals for unity, but um, there is going to be tension in the party. There's going to be a lot of uh, intense discussion in the next few weeks just within the party itself. Yeah, there will be intense discussion across Berlin. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Hans. We'll come back to you in a little bit. I want to cross right over to Julia Saudeli, uh, who has with her a uh, high-ranking member of the Green Party to discuss these election results. So, Julia, I'll, we'll hand over to you. Yes, we're here with Jürgen Trittin. He's a long-time member of the Green Party and a member of Parliament uh, for the party. Uh, Mr. Trittin, how do you see this result? Is it more of a disappointment or is it something to celebrate? It's a historic result. For the first time, we got the greatest, in the biggest increase of votes compared to our other parties. It's the best result in Green history, for sure. If we would have been now in the same situation like in the city of Berlin fighting who is head of government, it would be better. But in, as a first step, this is a clear message from the voters. That means that climate policy must be in the central of a new German government. But um, how come have the Germans maybe not voted as much for the Green Party as the party had anticipated or as the polls were showing at the beginning of the campaign? Look, I'm here in a situation, I've done the first government participation over a whole period in the state of Lower Saxony. At that time we had 5%. Now we are negotiating a, a, a new government from a position from around 15. That means we are three times stronger than at that time. And that is what we have to work on. We have to fulfill the expectations of voters who said we want strong Greens in the government because we need a clear climate policy. That is where we are focused and concentrated on. And how will uh, the party be able to bring forward a strong green agenda in a government that might be formed by maybe three parties that have maybe different uh, points of view? 
We don't know the end result because we don't know whether the left will enter parliament because there's a five percent threshold. But at the end, I'm expecting that there will be a three party government. But it is different. There are two parties who are winners the Social Democrats and much more winners the Greens. And there are the big losers, and that the Conservatives. And this is not a message from the voters to go back to government after 16 years of Merkel and 12 years of a so-called Grand Coalition. Does that mean that you would very much not like to have a government with the Conservatives, or is that door still open? We have to talk with everyone, but from the willing, if you see what the voters wanted, they didn't want an ongoing responsibility of the Conservatives in government. Jürgen Trittin, thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Julia. And uh, just very interesting to note there, all the parties, Richard, that we're saying, the spin, the gloss, very clearly Jürgen Trittin saying, uh, we are the winners, the Social Democrats, the Conservatives not. So it's going to be interesting to see how that message develops through the course of the night. But I do want to bring in Simon, who was with the Free Democrats. And Simon, we were talking a little bit about the, the Free Democrats as the kingmakers a little bit earlier. Um, tell us a bit more about how things have been developing there tonight, uh, where you are. Well, first of all, the Free Democrats themselves are very pleased. They feel that they've got a good result tonight. They've pushed their share of the vote up by about just 1%. In particular, um, Free Democrat members saying to me that they're pleased that they are a nose ahead of the far-right AFD. That could be important uh, for things like chairmanships of uh, parliamentary committees and so on going forward. But those are details right now. Of course, everyone's looking at the big picture as well. Uh, Christian Lindner, the FDP leader, was was saying earlier on when he addressed his uh, party members here at FDP HQ that they do not underestimate the difficulties of these coming coalition talks, but that they stand ready uh, to do what they can. He was also very interestingly uh, underlining common ground with the Greens. He says both the Free Democrats and the Greens, for all their differences, and they really stand on, on opposite sides of the political divide, you could say. Nonetheless, he says they both stand for change. They both want an alternative to the big established uh, bloc parties, as it were, uh, that he, uh, he, he sort of consigned to the past a little bit. So certainly looking for um, common ground with the Greens, and that could, of course, be key because the two most likely likely coalitions to come out of all this uh, will feature uh, the SPD, uh, sorry, the FDP and the Greens together mm -hmm. with one of those other two uh, large parties. Yeah, it's a bit of an alphabet soup. We're all trying to stay on top of that, Simon. Uh, coming back to uh, what the FDP might want to bring into government, uh, a lot of countries around the world, especially here in Europe, watching very closely to see what this next German government might be and, and what the FDP might stand for, what it might bring into that government. So what is uh, the Free Democrats' really biggest priority to bring into a possible coalition government? Well, what they say is that uh, Germany has an entrepreneurial uh, potential that is currently not being unleashed. Uh, they say that uh, there's a dead weight of bureaucracy. Uh, they say that, uh, you know, there's too much state interference, frankly. And uh, what they would like to see uh, is more, you know, more room for business to get on. They say in particular also that is uh, one of the answers to the challenges of uh, climate change. Uh, if you, uh, you know, if you, if you do that, if you allow the Mittelstand, the small and medium-sized German businesses, manufacturing businesses to come up with technical technological solutions, those are going to be key in answering the climate challenge rather than vast spending programs of, uh, of state money, they say. But of course, that does mean that they've got some arguing to do uh, if they find themselves in a, in a coalition with uh, the SPD and Greens, uh, who uh, probably think that large handouts of, uh, of state cash are a good idea. There appear to be pretty opposite positions there, Simon, but we'll see how they manage to come together. Okay, Simon, thank you. We'll come back to you a, a little bit later. Uh, Richard, you know, we are still waiting, I should mention to our viewers, we're going to see in about half an hour's time uh, this 
pretty special event that happens after uh, elections, which is something called the elephant round. This is basically, it's, it, not at all what it may sound like, but essentially it's the party leaders that come together and debate or, or talk about, react to the results of the election together. And it's always a very interesting uh, event, really, to watch, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's going to be really interesting to watch, watch the, you know, the mood in the room there. And it's basically a roundtable discussion, kind of chewing over the results. Uh, sometimes it can have, you know, quite an important effect on the outcome of, of what is then to follow. For instance, in 2005, the very first time that Angela Merkel uh, uh, won um, and uh, eventually became chancellor, um, she took place, took part in one of these elephant rounds for the very first time. Uh, and Gerhard Schröder um, was there, the, uh, who went on to become the outgoing chancellor. Now, Gerhard Schröder was very much in the uh, social democrat, very much in the old kind of macho mold uh, of German politicians. And he had scored such a kind of a comeback result where he, it was, he was predicted to lose, but he'd actually got a much better result than expected. And he came into this talk, into this round with an incredible amount of swagger, whereas Merkel was her usual kind of self-effacing uh, self. Um, and this is seen in retrospect as a total embarrassment for him, the way that he behaved in that. And she actually managed to go on and form a coalition, um, and he was consigned to political history. So it would be interesting to watch what goes on, because, of course, it's a very unpredictable situation that when, you know, the, especially Schultz and Laschet, the two top people going into that room, both of them trying to claim some, if not a victory, at least a mandate to try to, to form a coalition government. It's going to be very interesting to see how they uh, spar out on that. Yeah, Indeed. All of the party leaders will be weighing their words very carefully. OK, we're going to get another update on the results uh, with William now. That's right. The numbers keep coming in, keep t being tweaked a little bit. Let's have a look at what they currently stand at. Not huge changes, nothing too dramatic to report, but still it looks like the SPD is taking a slight lead over their conservative rivals, while the Greens have dipped a little bit from that original 15%. We saw them down to 14.3%. The liberal FDP in yellow, we've heard so much about them tonight and their role possibly as kingmakers in a future coalition. They're holding steady there in the 11% range. And the socialist left is just on this trying to stay in the Bundestag at all. You need to get 5% or three direct candidates to have any representation. There are many parties, many, like 47 parties in Germany in all, but only these are the ones that get into Parliament because they get over that 5% line and have enough direct candidates. The AFT, let's not forget them, the far right at 10.8%, down from their 2017 result, um, but they have been um, basically ruled out of any kind of possible coalition given their far-right views. No other party is willing to work with them. So we're not going to focus too much on them tonight. Now, we can, I think, a better look at things as the wins and losses. Who's up? Who's down? Because that shows a better picture of how we've been talking about tonight. You can win and still lose, or you can lose and still win. And that's what we see tonight. The CDU-CSU is having historic losses. They're at a historic low possibly losing about 8% 8 percentage, 8 off their 2017 result. Whereas the SPD, the center-left, they're up almost 5% from their 2017 result. And yet both those parties have a good shot at forming coalitions, even though one is far down and one is slightly up, bringing them to about a balanced place because the political field in Germany is just so fragmented. As we talked about, the socialist left, they were hoping to maybe even get into government with the Greens and the, social, and the, uh, the center left. They're, now they're just hoping to get into the Bundestag at all. The FTB, FDP, the Liberal Business Party, pro-business party, they're holding about steady where they were. As we've heard from Simon out at the, their campaign headquarters, feeling pretty good about where they are. What does this mean for seats? Let's have a look at that big, beautiful color palette, that half circle. That's it, that's the German Bundestag. Look how close it is between the center left and the center right. Now before, these numbers have somewhat flipped from before. Before we had the center right, the conservatives, on top by just a couple seats. Now we're looking at the center left up by a couple seats, but it's so close, it's almost, it's not even worth saying who's up and who's down. Basically, it is a dead tie, a dead heat there. The Greens, the Greens have a lot to be happy about tonight. Although they aren't as influential as they might have hoped a few months ago, they are gonna see quite 
a f quite a number more of their own candidates and their own um, parliamentarians getting into the next parliament. The FDP right behind them, the AFD, the far right, and then again, the center left. Will they, will they be in the Bundestag at all? That's what we're still finding out about counting the votes. But remember, this only shows us what the seats are in the parliament. It doesn't show us anything about the government, who the government might be. And that we can have a look at what might be the possible coalitions. Well, they've, both of the big parties, the center left, the center right, they've said no more working together. We don't want to have these, this two-party grand coalition anymore. They might not even have the numbers to do it. This is what's possible right now. So many possible colors here. You could have a center-left run government with still the center-right together and then being helped out with the Greens or the pro-business free Democrats. You could see no more conservatives and just the center left. You could see conservatives and no more center left. So this is what we're talking about tonight, how although they are in a dead heat and although they are at historic lows, both these parties, they may win and still lose. They may lose and still win. That's what the next several weeks are going to be telling us. Again, that last one on that list, just that red and that black, that is what both parties say they want to avoid but Sumi and Richard, you remember 2017. They said that then they wanted to avoid that, and that's exactly where we ended up. So anything is possible. We also ended up with months of coalition negotiations. So that is, of course, also possible. Uh, of course, it's, it's been a, a nail-biting, tense evening, also here in the studio. But we want to get a feeling of what things are like out on the streets uh, here in Berlin. Let's go back to our correspondent, uh, Jafar Abdul Karim, who has been speaking to voters for us uh, on the streets. Jafar, tell, give us an idea of, of how people have been reacting, if they have been, to, to the results we have so far. Different reactions we heard today. Some are really surprised. Others say it's expected uh, the way the results are uh, now. And uh, I'm standing now in a, a Berliner neighborhood where most of the people who live here are, uh, have a migration background, Germans with migration background. I'm, I'm joined by Yumna. I'm really excited to know what does Yumna think today about the results. Yumna, were you surprised? Um, not very much, to be honest. It was uh, expected that it will be a neck, and rec a neck race. Um, a little bit surprised that the Green Party did not get the amount of voters as I would like them to have. Um, but nonetheless, um, I think the SPD is until now a good winner, and I'm, I think I'm happy for them. Yes. What's one thing which is your topic, which is very important, if there is a coalition between uh, SPD or uh, others, what's the one topic that's your point of view is, is the most important for you? I can't say that, sorry for this answer, but I can't say that there is only one topic. Um, I think one of the most important ones is climate change, for one thing, and of course, um, yeah, um, people with migration background, how they will be treated, the rights for them, okay. uh, the rights of refugees, etc. This is something um, I think very crucial, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Yumna, Thank for uh, joining us. Uh, yes, uh, Sumi, you, we heard uh, Yumna from uh, the so-called Arab street here in Berlin, but I've been before also in different areas and I've asked different uh, people what do they think. and. Uh, Climate change is very important for, for, the, for a lot of people. Social justice is an important uh, topic uh, that I, I heard. And some of them will miss Angela Merkel the way they, they said it because they, they, uh, Angela Merkel gave them stability, but they say also it's time for change. That's interesting, Jeffrey, and we should say that you've been speaking to quite a few Green voters, and, and that is possibly because you're, of course, here in Berlin on the streets, and here in Berlin, the Greens appear to have come out uh, on top, right? Yes, and uh, I think they were really um, very happy because especially in, uh, when you talk to the younger generation, for them the Green Party is the party, uh, the, the party that represents them the most because they speak about the topic, they are really concerned every day and they say this is the party that should represent me and I think uh, they have a very big support. Nevertheless, 15% according mm -hmm. to now is not what they expected. Jaffa, we're still waiting, of course, to get those turnout numbers that we'll be looking closely at. But what's your sense? How interested have people been in this election? 
I think people have been uh, really interested in, the, in this election because when I uh, went to different uh, neighborhoods today and different areas in Berlin, I saw how people were really lining in queues and really excited also to, to vote and to be part of the change and to be an active part of the uh, elections today. And I have to also to mention, you know, the sun doesn't always shine in Berlin, but today <laughs> there was sunshine. So I think this also gave the last push and the last motivation for a lot of people to vote. But it's also important to mention that some of them, if they didn't go live and, uh, and, and, and joined uh, today the elections, they voted uh, via post, and that's also what I heard. But from my impression on the streets of Berlin today, it is an election day. People are talking about elections, and now, for sure, as you can look and see behind me, discussing the results of the elections. Right, the sun shining, a marathon and election day. Pretty unusual day in Berlin. Okay, thanks, Jafar. We'll come back to you, of course, a, a little bit later in the evening to hear a little bit more about what you've, you have been hearing uh, from voters. And you're watching DW's sure. special coverage of the election. Exit polls show a virtual tie between the two main parties. Uh, the center-left Social Democrats won nearly 25% of the vote. These are pictures from a little bit earlier in the night. It is a big improvement on their 2017 result and one that they say gives them the mandate to govern. Then the Conservatives, the CDU-CSU bloc, also got 25%, their weakest result in any federal election in 70 years. But Amin Laschet, their chancellor candidate, says that too is a mandate. Now, the Greens came in third. They could well play a role in the future coalition, but the outcome leaves wide open who will head up uh, the next government. Richard... Let's come back to, you know, coming back to some of these numbers that we've seen. Bring the viewers into the picture here of what these next um, days and weeks could look like here in Germany. Yeah, so uh, during the course of tonight, then then, then we'll get uh, closer and probably uh, at, maybe at the latest sometime tomorrow, get really a final result. Like, what are the final numbers? Where does it really shake down? If we go back to the questions we talked about at the very beginning, just before the election, before the result, the, the exit polls came out, Who's top and what's the gap between them and the second party? Once that is clear, then uh, what, is, what comes next is this thing called exploratory talks. So where parties talk to each other about, do we think maybe we could work out a coalition together? And these talks can be bilateral, they can be trilateral, so they can be in a, almost any kind of combination. Now, if at the end of tonight, the Social Democrats end up like, you know, a couple of points ahead in, 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 in uh, the result, then what could happen is that the, the Conservatives say, all right, we're going to sit back and just let you guys see if you can uh, get something going in a coalition and we're ready to spring in if you can't. That's one possible way. It could go another way. They might try to run sort of conversations in parallel, in maybe informal conversations. So there's going to be essentially like this period of, feelers, horse trading, whatever kind of like <laughs> metaphor you want to use for it, of trying to work out who can cobble together what you essentially need to run Germany. You need a majority in the Bundestag, in the parliament, what we've seen William uh, showing up on the screen here. So anyone who can get a majority and then go to parliament and then win a vote in parliament, then they can become chancellor. So you're going to see really feverish activity on both sides there. And you may get smaller parties talking to each other as well. There's you know, some talk that the Free Democrats might want to approach the Greens and talk to each other about, can we even work together and what kind of things could we work out together that we could then work out with one of the bigger parties too. So, I mean, we should warn our viewers here, like this, this is going to, we're going to be reporting about this for a long time. I mean, the last time the coalition... Uh, took almost six months to put together. Uh, this time, it's so complicated. It's possible it could take even longer. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe one side kind of realizes, okay, it's not working for us. Um, but yeah, a really long period of um, of political uncertainty here. And all the while, Merkel stays in office as the kind of caretaker. So business continues. I mean, during that six-month period four years ago, a lot of people remarked on, well, things seem to be going totally fine in Germany without a government, you know? <laughs> so, Angela um, Merkel's not gone just yet, of course. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so, yeah, she's around for a little while yet. 
Um, but it's going to be really fascinating to watch what happens. Well, it's also going to be fascinating to watch that candidate's debate, their yeah. party leader's debate, I should yeah. say, because it's not necessarily the chancellor's. That's coming up in just a little bit. We're going to be looking ahead to that. But uh, because we will not necessarily see all of the chancellor candidates, uh, we wanted to bring in a clip from Olaf Scholz, who was speaking uh, at the Social Democrats' party headquarters a little bit earlier, speaking to the crowd uh, there. Let's listen into what he had to say. Friends, I am pleased to see so many of you here, and of course I'm very pleased that the citizens of this country have voted the way they did. They have decided that the Social Democratic Party is doing better than for a very long time, and this is a real success. It's going to be a long election night, that's for sure. But another thing that's sure is that many citizens have voted for the Social Democrats because they want a change in the government and they want the Chancellor to be Olaf Scholz. We have geworben dafür. We said that we want more respect in this society. We work towards ensuring an industrial modernization of our country, and we worked to ensure that we stop climate change. These are three major objectives that we need to overcome in our country objectives that we have all fought towards in the election campaign, but that the polls be developed as well as they are, that we're getting the exit polls results showing that we are getting a lot of support from the citizens in this country, and this is a mandate given to us to ensure that everything we said in the election campaign, all of our proposals be implemented and that we push for this politically. But let me say at this point, thank you. Thank you to the citizens who cast their vote for me, for us, so that we have this kind of election result. But let me say, as one member of 400,000 members of the Social Democratic Party, thank you to every single one of you who pushed for this to happen. We're a pragmatic party. We know how to govern. We're an optimistic party that wants to push for a better future for all of us in Germany. But I think we've also shown that we have what it takes to govern a country, the ability to join ranks and have everyone support us. And the fact that that was the case is something I want to say thank you to all of you for. Being pragmatic, being optimistic and joining ranks, this is what we will show in the time ahead. And that's what's important. And I'm sure that the citizens of this country will be glad that they voted the way they did when they voted the Social Democrats. We will deliver on our promises.
Schauen wir also. Und so. Jetzt warten wir auf das endgültige so let's wait for the final election Aber results. Wir uns an die But Dank. then we will get down to work. Thank you. <laughs> Richard, interesting to see, to see there Olaf Scholz, a man who has been massively popular, even more popular than his own party as a chancellor candidate. And a lot of people in other parts of the world are looking to Germany to say, okay, if Olaf Scholz is chancellor, what can we expect from him? So what is important to know? About yeah, him? I mean, he doesn't have a massive international profile yet, does he? So he's been finance minister, uh, which means that he has quite significant uh, involvement in European issues. So all of the EU finance ministers who are especially members of, of countries where they use the Euro, the single currency, uh, they meet regularly as part of this thing called the Euro Group. And he also last year was um, uh, quite instrumental in putting together on the European basis what's called a recovery plan for dealing with the economic shock of the, of, uh, the pandemic right. uh, of, of the coronavirus. And this was seen as a bit of a milestone, this plan, because for the first time, Germany agreed to an approach which would essentially have all of the members uh, of uh, the single currency and the European Union, rather, uh, jointly guaranteeing bonds, which would be in issued to borrow money on the financial markets, and then that money would go to individual countries and they could invest that in recovery. Um, now, countries kind of jointly uh, guaranteeing these bonds, this has never been done before. And it's something that the, the Germans always rejected during the Euro crisis uh, uh, more than 10 years ago now, you know, surrounding Greece, Italy and other countries that were running into difficulties during that time. So that was seen as a bit of a watershed. Schultz holding this up as something uh, that he uh, has been instrumental in and definitely the, kind of a, you know, a, a sign of his commitment to Europe and the, and the, and the, the common currency. So that's one interesting uh, thing on, on foreign policy. On climate change, um, he will not be bold enough for a lot of the voters who we've seen in clips, for instance, from Jaffa around Berlin, people wanting climate change to be absolutely front and center. Schultz's campaign has included climate change, but his kind of top issues in this campaign have been more kind of bread and butter issues like uh, uh, increasing the minimum wage, kind of, kind of core social democratic kind of things like securing pensions, social policy, stuff like that. On climate change, he talks about believing that the moderate course that um, the government has taken recently on things like putting a price on carbon emissions, that he thinks that that's correct, the moderate course. So I think a lot of people who are kind of really pushing for a major transformation in climate policy may be disappointed by him. And then maybe one of the other interesting example, China. There's a lot of discussion in Europe and also in the United States and also in parts of Asia about trying to get democracies to rally together to try and sort of stick together against uh, what they see as China's increasing authoritarian influence around the world. Uh, Joe Biden has made this a real signature of his presidency so far. Olaf Scholz is very cautious about this. Um, yeah. He has talked about delusions of decoupling. Um, the idea that you can kind of sort of like disconnect a lot of the integration of the economies that's gone on between the West and China over the last 20 years or so. And that kind of comes partly from his, from his uh, business-oriented background that he wants to kind of secure jobs in Germany and he's worried uh, that mm -hmm. tackling China too strongly uh, could undermine that. Indeed. Uh, those are interesting perspectives on Olaf Scholz, what the world might be looking at. Uh, we have, of course, through the course of the day, been talking to a number of voters. So I want to bring in again some of the, the voices that we've heard, DW reporters out in the streets in Berlin today. So let's uh, listen to a clip of, of what German voters think. 
On a national level, it's very important to me that the questions of climate protection and social justice can be answered, in particular by the next federal government. It's important to me that we define the future of Germany for the good of the climate and society, and that young people also participate in the election. We need changes with regards to the climate, because a lot simply must happen now that has not happened in recent decades. And that's a very important point for me in this year's election. The climate crisis is the overarching issue, so other goals as important as they are, like good pay, good working conditions, these classic election issues can only happen if the rest is taken care of. I thought about who to vote for for a long time. It hasn't been easy. Merkel is leaving, and I think that's very sad for Germany and Europe. And her successor must prove themselves. For me, it was important that both Europe and Germany remain strong. So that's how I came to a decision. Basically, it's important to me that as many people vote as possible, especially the younger generation, because I think that there are many political issues that will run long into the future and which must be pursued. So that's why it's my goal today to come here and to urge and encourage young people to do the same. All right, we have some new numbers for you and some new data, including data that I've been really excited for personally. Let's have a look at the current numbers. The center left is starting to pull ahead. It's still very, very, very close, but they are starting to pull ahead, looking like a percentage difference between Olaf Scholz's center left and Armin Laschet's center right. The greens seem to be slipping a little bit as these numbers keep getting tossed around and jumbled about. Um, but, and the rest are pretty much staying where they are. But let's get to some exciting information, which is where, who took votes from whom, right? We, we're starting to get the first information first, the Greens, right? Where did the Greens benefit? Well, it looks like, look at that, 830,000 votes of normally conservative, uh, center, excuse me, center right CDU CSU votes, looks like they went to the Greens. The Greens also seem to think that they've profited from taking votes from the socialist left, from the SPD. They took a lot of votes from a lot of the parties, but really, up here, look at this. CDU, CSU lost a lot of votes, 830,000 votes is what we're looking at right now, to the Greens and from the SPD as well, and the socialist left. That might explain why the left is not uh, done so well in this current Bundestag. Now let's look, we have, I think, also the CDU, who did they get votes from? Well, we could see, and this explains why they're down eight points, they lost a lot of votes in the other direction, as we just saw, going to, losing, look at, oh my goodness, look at this, almost 1.4 million voters went from the center right to the center left. We've been seeing about Olaf Scholz's popularity for weeks now. We can't say for sure that's the reason why, but that is looking like a very strong correlation as to why the CDU lost 1.4 million voters to the SPD, 830,000, as we just said, to the Greens, and they lost 470,000 to the FTP. Non-voters, they even lost non-voters. People just didn't want to show up and vote for anybody, 130,000 voters. And interestingly, they caught a little bit of the far right and the far left. That's the numbers we have for you right now. I think we have more. On this exciting night, back at the table, Sumi and Richard. Thanks, William. Very curious to talk to those uh, far-right voters who somehow went to the Greens. But we're, we're going to now head, Richard, very shortly to that leaders' debate, party leaders' debate. And uh, I have on my screen already the setup. I know our viewers can't see that yet. We're going to go to that as soon as it begins. But, uh, Richard, I see all of the party leaders are there, and it does seem like it's starting. So I'd like to quickly thank Richard, because he's leaving us at this point for your analysis, and we're going to listen in uh, to the party leaders. And candidates. Aus dem alten Telegrafenamt 
aus der Mitte der Hauptstadt. Deutschland hat gewählt. Fall einen neuen Kanzler nach 16 Jahren, Angela Merkel. Wer regiert mit wem und wer sitzt künftig auf den Oppositionsbänken? Zwei Anmerkungen noch tested negatively just before the meeting and we are discussing on the basis of the projections from the exit polls after eight o'clock. Where is Germany going and what will the government constellation be? We want to discuss that with the challenger for the center-left party, Olaf Scholz, and the CDU-CSU joint candidate, Armin Laschet, with the candidate for the Green Party, Annalena Baerbock, and the chairperson of the FDP, Liberal Pro-Business Party, Christian Lindner, with Alice Weidel of the AFD, and uh, with uh, Janine Wissler of the Left Party and the CSU Party leader Markus Söder. To everybody here, a very warm welcome and, of course, welcome to you at the television screens. I join you in welcoming everyone. Mr. Scholz, you are maybe tonight's winner. The counting is still going on, so we don't really know yet. But irrespective of this, on the basis of results known so far, do you say you have the right to form a government? And if so, who will you call first? Who will you offer the exploratory talks to? First of all, the vote of the citizens is very unequivocal. Uh, SPD votes, i.e. for the centre-left party, have gone up, and the results of the polls have also shown us ahead very clearly, which is an encouraging message, and I think it's also a very clear mandate for us to make sure we get a good and capable government for Germany, which will look into the jobs most important for the future, how we will manage to organize more respect within society, how we will manage to push forward industrial modernization in Germany, and that we can stop man-made climate change. In the next few days and weeks, that's going to be settled and as fast as possible. But you are not going to tell us who we call first? I've always said that I think there uh, are a lot of overlaps here with uh, my neighbor, but just the two of us won't be enough. It'll have to be three parties, but I think we will settle this fairly quickly. But I think the respect vis-a-vis uh, -vis the citizens uh, would demand that we wait until all the votes are counted and we can see clearly. But my wish is to be constructive, to respect the different approaches the different political parties bring forward so that every Everybody, including the whole country, will feel reflected in a new government. Mr. Laschet uh, got about eight per point losses in this election. That is the highest loss of the CDU-CSU. It's also the, wor the worst and weakest results that the CDU-CSU ever achieved in a federal election. You said tonight you still want to be the chancellor, but with this result, isn't that the situation where a party chairman has to consider personal consequences? Well, first of all, it is a loss of of votes, which is not good. We've seen a situation where, for the first time in 16 years of Angela Merkel, the Chancellor uh, just hasn't uh, run for office anymore, so nobody had the, the bonus of the existing office, and the result is such that uh, from within the German government, we'll have to find a, a, a new government from a, the centre of parliament. No party is strong enough to do it on its own. The, the voter has given us the job to do it, and as I say, from within the centre of the parliament will have to find as many uh, commonalities between probably three political parties. At the moment, you are ranking second in the exit polls from the two main public broadcasters that can change. But if you end up uh, the runner-up, will you still claim to have the right to form a government and with what sort of consolation? I've just described it. Uh, the person who will be the chancellor has to manage to bring different parliamentary groups together and end up with a majority. In all the 70 years of the Federal German Republic, this has been the case. And not every time the party that had the most votes ended up uh, also forming the government. So it is the great job of the Democrat Democratic parties now to see where we have the most overlaps between us. And I think for the time ahead of us, what we need first is economic strength, stability,
solutions commensurate with the market economy. We need a real thrust when it comes to the administration of the country. I'm speaking of digitization. And in this decade, climate protection will have the job to change whole industrial societies. A brief follow-up, Mr. Lascher. The CDU saw it differently. You always said that when you're just the run-up, you can't claim to uh, be the chancellor. Well, I've described you the situation. Mr. Söder explained the situation as the CDU CSU sees it. I think the matter is utterly clear. It's not getting together some majority purely arithmetically. I, I, I want the sort of government where every partner is there and is visible, not a government where just one is the chancellor and who can push forward his or her points. We want a government where all the different constellations are put together in such a way that we end up with a coalition that we all enjoy. In the last days of the Grand Coalition, that wasn't necessarily always the case. So what we need is, a, is an alliance that really brings Germany forward, that reconciles different uh, movements. That's what I stand for. Um, to make this very clear, um, you, um, Mr. Söder, are sort of um, sharing the position with Mr. Lascher and the CDU. If this runner-up position, only the second, uh, becomes clear, will you still say this gives you the right to form a government? First of all, it's quite clear that when we have to wait for the result. You've said it very clearly. There's a fluctuation among the percentages and the seats for the parliament. In some of the ARD polls, the um, CDU is just uh, some more members of parliament, which would underline uh, our claim to form the government. But ultimately, it's up to what the voters do, who, who they trust to form the government. We had a, a, a system, red, red, green, which has got a bit of a slap in the face today. That's not what the voters want. And there's also basically a slap against Olaf Scholz, because that was the idea he was pushing forward. So we don't want a backward-looking uh, alliance. We want something which helps Germany stay stable and perhaps renew itself. And I think with Amin Lasha, we can underline uh, this claim, maybe together with the FDP and the Green Party, because I think then we would see the greatest wish for change, reform, renewal, and we offer to be the right partner for just that. Well, I think, Mr. Zuda, one question we still have to ask. Given the losses which you have had at the CDU CSU, would the result have been better had you been the candidate for your party? You would have been the preferred candidate after all. Well, that's uh, the news from yesterday, and in the difficult situation we are in, it doesn't help us at all to look past. I mean, we've actually done a wonderful spurt at the end, and I must say, I have a lot of respect vis a vis Armin Lascher because there was so much stuff talked about, about people who laughed, about people and their CVs, all things which were not important instead of looking at what really matters. And I think he was dealt with unjustly, and he has my respect to my support. Ms. Baerbock, at the beginning, April, May, um, the result was such that today you should be a loser, because I'm sure that's a disappointing increase in the number of votes you got. Yes, it's an increase, but you initially wanted more. Was it too much you wanted to be the first Green Chancellor? Why didn't it work, despite the flood disaster, despite climate change? Because these are all issues that would have ended up with you as the candidate. Well, obviously, the target we set ourselves as the Green Party to be the leading force in this country, that's something we didn't achieve. We uh, ended up far below that. Are you disappointed? Well, obviously, it's not something which makes me all that cheerful, quite obviously. It's absolutely right, though, to challenge the CDU-CSU, making clear that we need renewal. Democracy needs alternative options. And it, it did give a new dynamic development to this election. And the next government has to be a new alliance. That's what the vote results in. We've increased our share of the vote, and there's a clear mandate for the Green Party to implement what we want to do in the next government, and we have responsibility for doing it. Because uh, just because we now have a result, that doesn't mean that renewal isn't, isn't necessary anymore. On the contrary, it's the top uh, job for the next time. We talk about that later, but I want to ask you 10 percentage points more than uh, at the high point point of the polls in April. What does it mean for the sort of power play within the Greens, within your party? I mean, does it mean that from, from tonight Robert Habeck is the number one and not you anymore? We made very clear in the spring that we are a team in all the exploratory talks and we set up a proper team because we want to be the leading power in the country. We want to lead the country. 
quite obviously that was unsuccessful, but we still have a clear mandate from the voters for renewal in this country. And Robert Habeck and I are going to do this together in the uh, exploratory talks. And you also asked what happened with a view to the earlier polls in the summer. Well, in the first few months, we, we had a sort of fight with the CDU CSU, and the most decisive question was, what will the next government be? Will there be genuine renewal? And then at the very moment when the center-left party, the SPD, took over from us, overtook us in, in the election, it suddenly became a different race. But the need, what needs to be done, that hasn't changed. We still need to do something for Germany now. Mr. Lindner, a bit of an increase, and you are now the kingmaker. But just with the Conservative Party, as we've heard, that won't be enough. So you need to talk to the Greens, to Mrs. Baerbock, and find some sort of arrangement. This time, will you say, better govern with an unloved partner than not govern at all? The FDP has been and still is willing to shoulder responsibility. We are in government in German regions in different constellations in North Rhine-Westphalia. We are in a coalition with the uh, Conservatives, Armin Laschet, Black Yellow, as we call it. Then we have um, the Traffic Light Coalition in rhine palatinate We have a so-called Germany Coalition. Um, so we are very independent also in the way we moved into this election campaign. Uh, for some part, there was even a campaign of the Conservatives against the FDP. So, so we were totally independent in how we started into the campaign, and we are now as independent emerging from it. We advertised a policy of the centre. We want to have a prosperity generated be before we can distribute it. We are in favour of being open vis-à-vis -vis technology, and with our independent position, we will start the negotiations. But it means you will also talk to Olaf Scholz and his SPD center-left party, because the so-called traffic-like option, SPD, uh, FDP and Greens, could be the best option. It's not that easy to read what this result means. We see that the center parties of the political spectrum are strengthened, whereas the extreme margins have lost. None of the former big ten parties have got more than 25-26%, which means that 75% of German citizens have actually not voted for the party of whoever is the next chancellor. So, Mr. Pecker, it might actually be advisable that the party, which has campaigned against the status quo of the Grand Coalition, the party which wanted to overcome this status quo, starting from a very different angle, in other words, that the Greens and the FDP are the first to talk with each other, and then we can structure what comes afterwards. Brief question, Mr. Baerbock, would you be willing to first talk to Mr. Lindner before um, you talk about the winner and runner-up? Well, in recent days, we have made very clear, Robert Habeck and I, that this sort of logic that there is one person who calls all the other parties um, is not necessarily something which is good for this new dawn which our country needs. So it's actually quite sensible that different parties will start talking to each other in different constellations. I think the first discussion is starting right now, in this round. So amazingly, you um, are here, uh, in, instead of um, Ms. Janine Wissler, you are a um, candidate. You're currently still fighting whether or not you get into parliament isn't clear yet. Did you have the wrong candidate? Was she too far left, too far removed from the men? No, not at all. Janine Wissler and Dieter Bartsch did a fantastic election campaign. In, in recent years, we've done a lot of mistakes, which is borne out by the current results, because it's not the result of just this campaign. It's a long period where in certain subjects we haven't made a decision, we haven't been clear. And obviously, after 30 years in the opposition in the federal parliament, it's very difficult for us to make clear that we are willing to assume responsibility. We do so and can do it in various regions, as we've proved. But you're absolutely right, it's not a nice evening for us, and it's going to be a very long night too. I assume that we will be represented in the uh, new parliament, and we are going to use the next four years to develop and to emerge stronger. Ms. Weidel, in your case, it's pretty simple. Nobody wants to uh, work with you, and you lost votes. What's the reason? Internal 
disputes, bad work in the opposition. Where do you see the reasons for this result? We are very happy with this result. We have a two-digit uh, result again. Some forecasts, after all, said that the FDB would be completely ephemeral and appear once in the German parliament, and after the first parliament, uh, we'd be chucked out again. We proved them wrong. We can rely on a sound basis of our own voters. And since you've just compared the elections now and the elections in 2017, of course, there is a special effect here, namely that we have the so-called free voters, free and independent voters who followed in our wake. It's a very COVID-critical party uh, when it comes to its grassroots support. And if we were to uh, take these effects out, then we actually have a result better than in 2017. In other words, we have done a considerable improvement here. And that shows uh, that we did excellent work while in the opposition. And it's a long light to come. We will see what the various uh, forecasts and projections will tell us. We'll have results later tonight, maybe tomorrow morning. And we are looking calmly and um, with good humor into the next parliament. Mr. Schultz, you want to be the next chancellor, even though a chancellor has never been voted in with such few votes. Now, as Mr. Lindner said, more than 70% of the electorate did not vote for you. And for the first time, a chancellor is going to have to share power with two parties if the model that you prefer with the Social Democrat Green Party, FDP, the traffic light coalition, and it could be a difficult coalition, would you be then be a weak chef with two even weaker waiters, as Gerhard Schröder of the SPD once said? Well, this whole comparison of the chefs and the waiters is something I've never really understood. I think it's about working with your coalition partners on an equal footing and part of that means that you have to bring things together such that the result is one that helps the country make progress. So it's not just about the sort of management logic of parties, but it's about it's a different kind of power mathematician than it was, for example, with the SPD and the Green Party, where the SPD was much larger than the Green Party. That's true, but sometimes the current coalition seemed like a party, a, a coalition coalition of three parties, didn't it, Mr. Soda? Wouldn't you agree to that? So I am rather used to dealing with three partners in that regard. But if we look around the countries around us, we see many where this is a normal part of political life, so we will manage it. The aim is to have a government that has clear objectives that undertakes governing together so that if we understand if we work together, we want to be re-elected again. It cannot be the case as how I've seen it with the Conservative and the FDP party that were in power briefly. So if we analyze the results, we are seeing that left party, green party, SPD is no longer an option. You were saying that it could perhaps be an option for the Social Democrats. Was it a mistake to rule out, or rather to keep that option open until the very end? Did you not maybe push voters to the conservatives in that regard? I don't think so. I think we were saying we wanted to have the citizens in Germany decide who goes into parliament here. And so we tried to resist all of these temptations to form a government long before elections were actually held, because that's not a very respectful approach to the electorate. First, we have to listen and see what they wanted. And they wanted many things different. The Social Democrats are much stronger than they were in the last election. They're much stronger than they were in the polls in the last months and weeks. So let me say that there are a couple of parties sitting here that have achieved more. That's the SPD and the Green, the FDP, and others have lost voters, and that's a clear message too. 
Mr. Laschet, Olaf Scholz wants to be Chancellor, so do you. So now, let's talk about what happens if you aren't Chancellor and you're number two. What would you advise your party to do? Renewal in the opposition, being a junior partner of the Social Democrats? Or, a question that we need to ask, could you remain party chairman in a constellation like that? Well, we haven't even got all the results of the votes yet. We're still waiting. And I think we've seen clearly that the only person who's going to be chancellor is someone who has a majority in the German lower House of Parliament, the Bundestag. And therefore, I would say, let us first wait and see what direction the voters want us to go in. What are we talking about? What are the issues here? It's not the navel-gazing of deciding of what's going to happen to who if this or that happens, that speculation. We will discuss what needs to be done when the time has come. For now, the time is to look at how we can get a government together in the situation we find ourselves in here at the heart of Europe. I think even in our three-way showdown, for example, recently, we didn't talk enough about Europe and international policy. All of Europe is looking at what will emerge from Germany in a situation that we find ourselves in now, where in the election night we don't know who's going to be chancellor. It's very rare that we've been in this situation. Yes, but we have had a situation where there was only one option left, and that was an arithmetic a mathematical option. Can the Christian Democrats be number two? Well, I think that everyone believes that the working style of the Grand Coalition as we have had it is not the way forward, regardless of who's the junior partner. We need a new start, and it can't be a contrived one. I mean, the Grand Coalition for the Social Democrats wasn't their perfect ideal in 2008. We tried to form a government with CDU, Green, and FTP, and that didn't work, and at some point we did go to a grand coalition again. And what's happening now has to at least bring together different aspects of society where something will emerge that will maybe give this country a new push forward, bringing together the environment and business in a way they haven't been dovetailed in the past. So you're not excluding opposition. Well, we're thinking about success here. Let's think about success and not about failure. I'm someone who thinks about success. I'm someone who wants something good to emerge from all of this for Germany. Well, if you're thinking about success, I'm sure you're thinking about being the king maker, and it could be a number of parties that are that. Now, you have focused on coalition with the Green Party and the Christian Democrats. What would Olaf Scholz have to offer you for it not to become a Social Democrat Green FDP coalition? What is it that you'd have to have? Well, you have asked on the one hand about Mr. Scholz, but you've also referred to Ms. Baerbock and quoted her in this context. Now, I've read the party programs of the others, and if you do that, you'll be aware of the fact that the agreement is mainly between the Christian Democrats and the FDP. I said that before the elections, and I'll certainly repeat it now. For us, the ideas of increasing taxes or eroding the debt break after after the elections are not acceptable ideas. I believe that the next government will have to be far greener, far more aware of the environment, and I think we have to see that the voters have said that they want policymakers to focus on the environment more, and we'll have to implement that. And if I see the result that the FDP has achieved, pushing an openness for different types of technologies, for more liberal values for our citizens, strengthening the economic upturn. I would hope that these things would also be found in a new coalition. But Mr. Frey, if you will allow me, one thing is for sure, the good news that we are seeing here, unlike what we've seen in other European democracies in Germany, we're going to be forming a coalition, forming a government from the democratic heart 
of politics that will be possible. We will not need the groups that are on the margins, which is a good news for those who are looking to Germany, worrying about Germany's stability. Certainly, they'll be able to see that Germany will remain stable. So essentially, Mr. Lidner, you're saying that you are able to enter into a coalition with the Social Democrats and the Green Party. Well, we are doing that in North Rhine-Westphalia, but still you'd be drawing the wrong conclusion if you were to suggest that this is our preferred option. What we are interested in are the issues. Mr. Becker said that as well. Four years ago, we could have had a coalition with the CDU and the Green Party, but the idea of the two coalition partners was that the FDP would have to just basically sign their coalition agreement, and our issues would not have played a role at all. And that must change, and it will change. And I have to say that if we do discuss a coalition with the CDU and the Green Party, I would always push for the Green Party and the CDU to deal with the FDP better with us than they did then, and any coalition would have to. Let's ask the Green Party, Ms. Baerbock, like the FDP, you have two options to be part of the government. Would a coalition with the CDU and the FDP, something that you could communicate to your grassroots supporters? There's a clear majority for being in the government, and that is the mandate of the elections as well, that the new government must set the course for carbon neutrality in this country in the next two decades. And it's not just one ministry responsible for that. What that means, looking to industry that's already working towards this, that we set all of the barriers such that Germany doesn't just work towards carbon neutrality as a country, but that we ensure that the prosperity of this country remains as well. We see this through the Agriculture and Transport Ministry as well. And this is the major challenge facing the next government. So my mandate is to take responsibility as the chair of the Green Party together with Robert Habeck to look at where we can implement this major responsibility that we have, not just as a party, but as a country in the world. And of course, we must speak to all of the stakeholders. But to enter into a new coalition agreement, it's not about the lowest common denominator here. In this historical moment, we must set the course for the future. And many, many young people voted for us in this country. So we're ahead of the game with young voters. And that's not just a matter of the environment. It's about justice between the generations. Mr. Soda, we'll talk about issues as well with you. And I'd like to ask what the most important issue for you would be there in this coalition. But again, just to analyze it, the CSU did not do very well in terms of its state assembly leadership. It's fallen even further. It's higher than the conservatives generally in the country, but it's not going to be a result that you'll be happy with. Do you take personal responsibility for this poor result? Do you think you fought against Armin Laschet for too long instead of fighting for him? Well, we got the best possible result with 40% in the European elections and in the Bavarian local elections, cities like Nuremberg, Nuremberg and Augsburg are now are voted now voted for us as well. You have to look at our results generally. I'm talking about this evening, though. Yeah, but you also have to see it in context. As Ms. Weidel said, the Free Voters Party took some of our votes, I'm afraid. There's 2 or 3 percent that the Freie Wähler, the Free Voters, took might risk an a coalition that our voters would have preferred. So we don't like the results, of course, but I think, Armin, you and I have shown in the last few weeks that we can really pull all the stops out. And I think that the CSU and the CDU really joined forces. We were very much behind, behind you. But we're all responsible for what happens. I think there's a lot of pointing the fingers in a way that we shouldn't have. That's a blame game. But I think we have to form a government from this election result. And that's the point here. And I think after these 16 years, there really is a need for change, a desire for change to tackle the challenges facing us. And we need to really exert true leadership to do this. And we can't just manage it 
hochwertigen notariellen Funktion versehen. Dann I mean, you, you can't Kraft just rubber stamp everything. There has to be a real force behind it. There has to be a real vision for the future. And I think we definitely have that more than any of the others. Of course, there's a certain amount of tactical strategy here, everybody referring to their programs. But I think we're all going to have to go out of our comfort zone and work out what's really possible. So do you think you might have to move to Berlin? How odd is that might be for a Bavarian state premier? Well, I'm happy to come here and visit you in Berlin, like I'm doing now. But if you look at the constella constellations that we have here, I think right from the word go, it's going to be important to negotiate in the coalition committee. I mean, those negotiations were very important, and I was very present in the last negotiations. And I think as the party chairs, we will be playing a major role there. I think in historical terms, I am perhaps one of the friendlier chairs of the Christian Social Union, the CSU, not least in terms of our relationship with the our sister party, the CDU. Now, you don't have to be all strategic and tactical with you. It's about real existence. You've lost ground even in your strong bastions in Eastern Germany, even behind the far-right AFD. Why is it that you're losing voters? Do you think you've maybe been focusing on the wrong issues, as Zara Wagenknecht accused you of doing? First of all, of course, our losses, we can't make up for them tonight. But the ones who really lose are the ones who form the so-called center coalition, which some people are beginning to forge right here and then. And what you're forgetting is the many millions of people who, after 16 years of being governed by the conservatives, have ended up with not enough money to live on, who live in, in poor housing, who can't afford holidays, who spend 40 plus percent of their income on rent. It's the pensioners who rely on having their pensions raised. We're talking about those who need a higher minimum wage to have any income at all. That will be sufficient. And none of these things are recognized by this center as their problem. Well, I'm sorry, but these are not the people who vote for you, because if they did, you wouldn't be fighting to get in past this uh, five percent threshold. I think there is a huge uh, contradiction here, from, from my angle, we've uh, put the right question, the social question in this country, because that is a burning issue, particularly when we're looking at social cohesion in our society. And the contradiction is that people don't trust us to actually push for these things. And you're right, I said already that we made mistakes in the past and we will review them. There is one thing, however, that I do understand. The next government is not going, uh, about going to be about Armin um, Laschet enjoying governing. It's going to make sure we look after those people who live in poverty, and that's not a few, it's millions. You said you'd be happy tonight and with this election results, Ms. Weidel, but your party is terribly torn apart between the um, radical opposition of the Volkish type and the part of the party that wants to be in government. You don't have the option to join a government, and you've lost votes. Don't you think you need to make a decision between Mr. Meuthen of the moderate wing and Mr. Hooker of the extremist wing? No, we don't have to make this decision. And let me go back to what you said, this sort of nationalist idea. That, that is not something which we have, and I really uh, would deny that absolutely. What I find much more interesting, both during the election campaign and tonight, is that uh, the Greens, for example, um, the party that wishes is a climate government suddenly are stylized to be part of the political center in Germany. Have we, got, have we come this far that we can think of the Greens as coalition partners? If we got this far, I can only say that's the end of Germany as an industrial manufacturing base. I think in four years' time when we meet again, the situation will be very different. Until tonight, all of you around this table have fought in the election campaign, put forward with your viewpoint now, election promises have to be turned into compromise solutions. 
so where are you willing to make concessions in order to be able to form a coalition and to avoid a torturous process such as we had in 2017? Mr Lindner, it's about um, what you share with the Greens. We already indicated that. Whether we're talking about the traffic light coalition, centre-left FDP Greens or Jamaica, which is um, conservative FDP Greens, what will you find harder to waive the tax uh, reduction or the solar panels, or do you think you can combine the climate and the tax issues? Well, Mr. Frey, I feel a bit overtaxed to actually start coalition negotiations and a television program. Well, you can tell us which direction we're going. Well, we haven't even got the official result, the final result. But let me make you a suggestion. Before the elections, we already uh, said we want a wonderful depreciation program, private um, investment, which would really serve digitization and have a fast tax effect. That will have a dual implication. On the one hand, we would drive the modernization of the economy, particularly the medium-sized businesses, and on the other hand, it would make it possible that the currently lamentably low growth rates of the country could rise. And I think this is an offer when we want to link various matters. That offer needs to be on the table. Mr. Lindner doesn't want to start coalition negotiations here and now at least. Ms. Weber, I'll try with you. Would you be willing to accept this debt break so that uh, you have a concession to union and FDP, where well, we don't just accept it, it's enshrined in the Constitution. We have made clear that if we want to tackle the forward-looking challenges of our country, we can't uh, just uh, always stick with other things. We need to have digitization, we need to be climate neutral, carbon neutral, we need to have investments. We have uh, more than 140 million euros that the local authorities and municipalities need to invest, so we need to extend the debt break by an investment uh, clause so that investment necessary future of the country can actually be made. But, I mean, you're putting this as if it's a marketplace. Polit the political arena isn't a marketplace. Obviously, in politics, you have to make compromises. Otherwise, you can say, I've got a 50% majority and I'll do my program and that's it. But this is not how it works. The question is, what are the big issues for the future of this country? Climate protection, social justice, children and young people need to be in involved and have a future and, of course, responsibility. And that is something which we need to do. And what do we need in order to do it? So it's a good thing if one party says, we know that um, instead of the solar, whatever, we do a special depreciation. But it's not about how it's done. It's about the target that we wish to achieve. And if we achieve that target, I mean, that is, after all, uh, the responsibility of a democratic party, Germany renewal. And we need to do this, and especially when we're talking about the climate. Time doesn't wait for us. Mr. Lascher, that was almost like a, a whole government program on miniature. We're not negotiating for a coalition, but Ms. Weber has outlined in very few words the whole program. Is there anything here where you'd say, no way, not with me? Well, what Ms. Weber has just described are things I find extremely helpful. Just to say, what is it that we want to achieve? If we want solar to be extended, we had said we make a special program where loans are made available through the KFW Bank for Reconstruction, zero interest rate for photovoltaics. You had uh, ideas how to make it uh, forward, and the Green said for every house there should be mandatory solar. I mean, there are all sorts of different ways of doing it, but the target is the same, and that's, after all, our job now. Right now, we have to talk about the actual facts and define what will need to happen in the next few years. Ms. Baerbock said she needs massive investments in order to achieve these climate targets, and you want to reduce taxes. How can you marry the two? No, of course we need massive investments. It goes without saying. It's actually written into our manifesto. We simply believe that you achieve greater tax revenue by saying after this pandemic, we allow incentives to be given to people willing to invest, because we believe the economy will start starting up with more tax revenue rather than by punishing those who are supposed to invest. That was the disagreement in the election campaign, but the fact that investment is necessary is not in, in doubt. So I believe that now 
Yes, this is the time when the social question, and by the way, here I would disagree with you when you say that these two uh, conservative parties do not stand for social questions. Many uh, workers and employees vote CDU CSU because of social matters. And if we can create new jobs, then this would be the best answer to the social question, much better than many of the things that you of the left party are saying. So the idea is economic growth. It has to be ecological, it has to be sustainable, and the necessary investments have already been rightly described. Well, Mr. Scholz, I return to you. Tax hikes mean sabotaging the recovery, is what Mr. Lindner said, and he demanded to reduce taxes. If you want to have a coalition, where will you make your concessions? We don't negotiate here, is what Mr. Lindner said, Ms. Baerbock said, and that is right. It wouldn't be appropriate. We now have to talk to our respective parties about what will happen, and I think it's important that we always comply with two criteria. The first is that every single political party and their voters need to be reflected in a government, because after all, voters cast their votes because they had certain ideas, and at the same time, we have to make sure that we achieve progress for our country. And there are expectations, and these need to be fulfilled. So it's about truly making things move forward for Germany. I already mentioned that the industrializing and, and modernizing effect for our country, that's what we need to push forward. Otherwise, in the next 10, 20, 30 years, we won't have good jobs, and we'll have to mournfully watch other continents getting more prosperous. This is not a situation I can accept. So it's always going to be an important matter. And I think in real terms, it's about making sure that we stop man-made climate change. I think this is an area where we need to talk about industrial policy, whether that can be used to achieve it. And we're talking about primarily investments from the private sector, as we have been saying here and elsewhere. So it's not public funding that was primarily needed. We have to make these things happen, but it, we also have to make it possible that we get to be a modern industrialized nation while also embracing climate protection. And the question of respect within society plays a major role for me. It simply cannot be that many of the people think, well, there is a good future looming, but it won't help them. They won't benefit. And during the COVID pandemic, we have seen that suddenly we recognize the achievements of certain people, and we need to keep that alive afterwards, too. Well, what you've just said is one thing, but people want to know what kind of government will get them a bit more money in their pockets, with what government, which government they'll feel better. Well, the last few weeks and months I've been making that very clear, how this can work. And now we'll have to talk to each other. That's the right way. What is amazing isn't the fact that uh, you have three parties needing to form a government. What I want to make happen is that the formation of the government can be done quickly, quickly, Mr. Zuda. As part of the debate, even though we don't want to negotiate here, but the Jamaica coalition, the conservative liberal green coalition, that might have to face the question, do we phase out the internal combustion engine? Do you see any room for maneuver? The Greens say from 2030, no more such engines. If you've seen the IAA, the International uh, Automobile Association, in in Munich lately. You've seen how far industry has gone. I think 2030 is probably not feasible. That would be too too much uh, of a problem. But the 20, uh, 2035 end of fossil fuel uh, combustion engine is possible. There are the synthetic fuels. But of course, it needs a lot of technology progress. It needs e-mobility progress. It needs a lot more charging stations in Germany. We in Bavaria have more than anywhere else in Germany. We also need a big hydrogen initiative, and we need to promote synthetic fuels. And I think the absolute decisive point is, and we shouldn't just be talking about bans all the time, we also need to promote technology. But the, the crucial thing, and there's the slight difference between our different ecology um, approaches, is that we are not looking at always saying 
Not this, not that, but incentives, offers. But I think a lot can be achieved. I want uh, carbon neutrality in 2040 in Bavaria, and this will cost a billion euros just for that one state. And there are a lot of ecological and economical abilities that need to be brought together for that. And uh, I think that's important. And let me say, we want to carry the country with us here, because it's not enough just to carry the urban elites with you. We also need the people from the countryside, and it's very important that we compensate people for increased uh, electricity prices, like, for example, in, uh, raising the commuter pay. Well, when we're analysing the voters, um, you've lost a lot of votes to the SPD. Wouldn't that mean that your positions in the left party vis-à-vis -vis NATO and the United States need to be very carefully revised and maybe chucked overboard? Maybe we should all consider how we uh, view NATO and foreign policy. Afghanistan has shown what happens, what interventionist approaches of the German army or NATO achieve, namely nothing. And I think um, actually they're doing a better job um, at the moment than we're doing in Germany to achieve uh, reconciliation, detente, talking about not arming up the nation, not having more confrontations. And I think uh, the voters moving from us to the SPD are very clear. The polarization between the two challenges, Mr. Lasch and Mr. Scholz, was a contributing factor. And I've done a lot of door-to-door -door canvassing in my experiences. People really wanted uh, change and, and a more left-wing approach, and that's why they voted Olaf Scholz. We would have preferred they voted for our party, but uh, uh, it's very much the polarization between the two. Well, you and now, Ms. Weidel, are no longer the strongest opposition party. You are not the one who will speak just after the Chancellor, whoever that will be, and you've lost important uh, committees, like the Budget Committee in Parliament. How will re you react to the situation, which is going to make your life in the Parliament more difficult? It's not going to get more difficult. In principle, the Budget Committee normally is chaired by the strongest opposition party, which for four years has been us. The strongest opposition party, that is a status we will indeed lose, partly because the uh, party political setup is going to shift because of the election results, that's very clear. But we will continue as before with a constructive, positive opposition work. And Look here, as the FD, AFD, we um, have uh, divisions and we use the uh, where everybody is known how he or she votes. And we've been able to test, the, the voters have been able to test all our candidates and seen how they voted on elementary issues. Without the AFD, there wouldn't have been so many divisions where um, MPs had to make clear how they voted. No, 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 no Ms. Baerbock interjected no, but that is not true. We had a lot of divisions uh, which we applied. For. And I must say, uh, this has also worked to the detriment of the Conservative parties, as we see tonight. After 16 years of the Merkel government, all we know is that that's over. We don't know who's going to be governing with whom, but we still don't know that since the polls have just closed. But now we're going to talk about the time. So, Mr. Scholz, you're going to be decisive here. Do you think there's going to be a 17th New Year's State of the Nation address from Ms. Merkel? Is it going to take as long as it did in 2017? Or do you think we're going to have a new government by Christmas? I hope we'll certainly get there faster so that Ms. Merkel will not have to hold the New Year's talk again. How long exactly, then? How long do you think it's allowed to go on? Well, I wouldn't want to name an actual date. I think that would be absurd. But certainly we must do everything we can to ensure that we're finished by Christmas, hopefully well before. And I think if we speak with one another on the basis of constructive negotiations and not just let things run, we have to show political leadership and get a sense of where we can enter into compromises that don't just work on paper, but really in the work of governing our country. And Mr. Laschet, you have said that you also want to become chancellor. How much time do you give yourself then to reach a sustainable government coalition? We're talking 
distinguishing here between exploratory talks and actually forming a government. How long will the exploratory talks take? How long will it be until the government really knows in what direction the government is moving? Well, in formal terms, it might well take longer because the situation is quite complex. I hope that we're fast, and I hope that we have a very different style of exploratory talks than we did last time. We don't want to spend weeks in a, a parliamentary society arguing about various different terms and sentences and then to start coalition negotiations. I don't think we have time for that approach this time. And in the last entire elections, what we realized was that one of the defining features of the last elections wasn't in the coalition agreement at the end. And now, you know, the whole pandemic has taken two years. I mean, in 2013, nobody talked about a worldwide crisis of migratory flows, and yet that was definitive. And so I think that in my country and in the government that I ran, What's important is that the stakeholders involved in a government like this know that they can count on one another when there's a crisis. And this is something you can clarify very quickly with the basic issues. I would hope we would be fast in this. Germany will have the presidency of the G7 next year, which is a very important forum of the major industrial countries in the world. And if all of the issues that have been discussed here are to play a role there, the new German government must get down to business quickly. So I hope we'll be fast. So before Christmas. Yes, certainly before Christmas. Ms. Baerbock, we know today that you are not going to be the next chancellor, but the question is, who are the Greens prepared to talk with? What process are you planning? Will you be negotiating in parallel exploratory talks and then have the grassroots members vote the rank and file, or how are you going to do it? Well, we can't make any decisions before we've even spoken to one another. That would be a cart before the horse. But I would just like to respond to what Mr. Lash had said. We have to see what the major crises are, the biggest crisis, and the real opportunity is the climate crisis. And that must be the defining issue for the new government. And that is the basis for the new government. And it's crucial for our voters as well, even if we're not happy with the results. It's clear that we need a Green Party in this government. This evening has shown that very clearly. So to achieve as much as possible there, you might negotiate for a very long time. Negotiations aren't a means in themselves. The mandate from our voters and all of the voters can expect that they get a better government than they've had for the last eight years at least. And this this is why we must take on the challenges facing us, do just to them, formulate a government position paper that tackles the challenges that we must take on. That's the challenge I see as the leader of a democratic party. So you've given us a sense here of what might happen. You suggested that there might be talks between the smaller parties, but how do you expect, Mr. Lindner, that things will develop? Or do we as citizens have to imagine that Mr. Laschet and Mr. Scholz are going to be negotiating parallel and you'll go Monday to him and Tuesday to her and the whole thing will be sewn up in two weeks? Well, I cannot give you a response to that yet, Mr. Frey, because all we can do is make an offer and others need to go away and think about what sort of structures they want to have, what their priorities are, what their partners might be. All I can do is offer and say that I think, like all of us, we need to form a government and we need to form it quickly. I mean, Laschet was right to refer to the G7 presidency. There's a need for real action in the world of business and the climate legislation in this country also means means that we must act quickly, and Europe is also waiting for Germany to have a government quickly. 2017, I had some experiences. Within four weeks, we could form a government with Armin Laschet. And in Berlin, we couldn't even get coalition talks going within four weeks. We just had exploratory talks. The conclusions I'm drawing from this is if you enter into exploratory talks, all of the important issues need to come onto the table right away. You don't have to have worked through them in detail, but very quickly, you 
you have to look at where is the common ground, what's important to this partner, what's important to another partner. So will there be parallel negotiations? And then you'll say, get going. Well, just let me say that the other thing. So first I said quick. The other thing I said was that with the exploratory talks, we should discuss the most important issues and not sort of fudge things. And the other thing we'd like to say, obviously the Green Party have to see if they would accept this offer. I ha have heard Robert Harbach talking about this, saying that the Green Party and the FDP, who had the largest polarizations or the largest differences in terms of their party programs, that these two already speak and look at where there is a common denominator between the two of us. Would you like to respond to that, Ms. Baerbock? Well, actually, I said that at the start of this show, that it cannot be the case as it was the last time, and the election results, we, we still don't even know who's won the elections, and there isn't one party that says, oh, I have twice as many votes as everyone else. It is clear that we have to start talks right away so that the election result really is implemented. Well, Mr. Zoda, the G7 might be one reason to form a German government quickly, but quite apart from that, looking at the state elections coming up in two years in Bavaria to preserve your position as Bavarian state premier, don't you have to do everything possible to ensure that the CSU is involved in a government? Well, it's not just the German state parliaments nor the G7 presidency to have two contradictory aspects that define these things. The point is we need to pick up speed here. We need to take clear steps, not little baby steps, but we have to, instead of negotiating on our little difficulties and compromises, we have to make major decisions for our country and do it together. So at the end of the day, what's important is not the individual issues, but that we have a common spirit and understanding of what this country needs. That's what's decisive. And from my own perspective, if I think about Ms. Baerbock, Mr. Habeck, Mr. Laschet, Mr. Lindner, myself, you know, many of us are a common generation. I think we can really get some Thing off the ground. We could really re carry out renewal for this country and not stay in our trenches. I think we have to govern our country well, and that is the main objective for the people in this country. Well, your result isn't so wonderful, and a CSU that's involved in the government is certainly going to have an easier position than a, a CSU in the opposition, surely. But we have to achieve something for the people. Obviously, we want to be in the government. Of course we do. Now, now, it's not just going, achieving your position in the German government. You've lost ground in Mecklenburg, for Pommern. Is there a risk that the left party, as a political force in Germany, are going to disappear altogether? No, I certainly don't think that. The state assembly elections in Mecklenburg, for Pommern, are very much defined by Manuel Schleswig. She got nearly 40% of the SPD, and that's nearly an absolute majority. So for a very long time, we haven't seen that. And then regarding Berlin, we have a very special constellation there. There isn't an incumbent who applied for the job again, if you like. So we have to see how that all pans out, because we haven't got the final results there either. But otherwise, I wouldn't say that anyone here knows how they're going to find a coalition. This is all just empty words and much ado about nothing. But the difference is strong. And Annalena Baerbock said it clearly as well. If we invest in our infrastructure, be it education, health, transport, then we have to raise taxes from the wealthy so that we can actually pay for these things. None of you are responding to that, so I'm very much looking in forward to finding out how you're going to form an, a coalition. Now, Ms. Weidel, the AFD lost some ground with you as the top candidate. Perhaps you could respond briefly and ask, tell us whether or not you're going to remain chair of your party? Well, I just said that, you know, you have to look at the actual results here. We're basically where we were if you take out certain special conditions that we had last time.
Um, to respond to your question, I can say quite clearly our MPs in the parliamentary group are going to decide that. We are going to constitute our parliamentary group on Wednesday. Just tell us if you want to be chair or if you don't. Well, we're going to, there's going to be a voting on Wednesday. I mean, for four years, I have been very successful as the chair of my party, and Tio Kupala has done a wonderful job of the elections campaign. And so on Wednesday, we will run as candidates again. But of course, it's the MPs who will have to decide. So the final questions that we are going to put are the two possible next candidates, Mr. Laschet, by tomorrow at the parliamentary group meeting, you're going to have to declare whether or not you're going to be the next or be prepared to be the next chancellor. And if not, you'll have to lead the opposition, perhaps. Is that right? Well, tomorrow we're meeting with the executive committee of the CDU, and my intention is to enter into coalition negotiations as party chair, and we'll see what happens after that. But you've also said that despite the fact that the CDU have had poor results, you want to remain in the position of chair. Yes, we want to lead the next German government. We want it to be a German government where everyone who has agreed on a coalition enter into the next four years in an upbeat, positive manner. We need the will of all for this, and so I want to stay the chair for this. Now, Mr. Scholz, much the same. You want to be the next chancellor, but it's still not clear this evening whether you will be. If you aren't, what's going to happen with you? Will you be leader of the opposition, head of the parliamentary group of the SPD? And will you reach for a party chair position? I certainly won't be. Not at all. We have a wonderful par parliamentary group leader as well. I want to be chancellor of Germany, and I think many of the electorate see it the same way. That's how I read this election result, that they want me to be chancellor too. And I will certainly do everything possible to ensure that we form a government that does justice to the requests and the desires of the electorate. Many parties have lost voters, but many others have certainly gained a lot of ground. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all for the Berlin round, and we want to say thank you now for all of our guests here in Berlin, in the old telegraphic office. Thank you for your interest. And now we will continue with calculations of this nail-biter election. Thank you very much. have just been watching the leaders debate here. Welcome back to our studio, our live coverage here at DW News. I want to introduce our chief political correspondent, Melinda Crane, who's just uh, joining us now to help take us through the, the latter part of this evening. Melinda, what are your thoughts? A very unusual territory for this election. Absolutely. Very unusual territory for Germany in general. We are going to see undoubtedly the first three-party coalition since uh, the period immediately after World War II. We've just gotten a little bit of a taste of how difficult that is going to be. Coalition negotiations facing uh, a lot of hurdles, particularly from the two parties that are go going to wind up being kingmakers, the Green Party and the Liberal Free Democrats. And it remains, uh, you know, we often talked about the, wall the election campaign being boring, but actually this is anything but boring. This <laughs> is wide open. We really can't say at the moment where this is heading. We can't even say which of the two parties now in the lead yeah. are likely uh, to be, uh, have the best chances of forming uh, the next government. So it's uh, it's absolutely fascinating and there's going to be a lot to talk about. There's plenty for us to talk about and uh, we're going to also discuss the leaders debate that we just saw and William's going to bring us all of the latest numbers. I first want to bring you all up to, de uh, up to date on what we've been seeing until now. Um, you have been watching our special coverage and exit polls and the results that we have until now essentially show a virtual tie between the two main parties. The central-left Social Democrats have won around 25% of the vote. Again, William's going to be updating us soon. That is a big improvement on their 2017 result, and they say they have the mandate to govern. 
Now, if you look at the Conservatives, the CDU-CSU bloc, you see Armin Laschet here, they got a lot, around 25% as well. That is their weakest result in more than 70 years, but they also say that is enough to mandate as a mandate to govern. With their strongest showing ever, the Greens came in third and could well play a role, as we heard, in the next coalition government. So let's get an update now uh, on where the numbers stand in this very uh, unusual, as we said, night in German politics. And William's going to take us through uh, where the latest numbers are uh, at the moment. That's right. Well, as you just heard from Melinda, this is really unprecedented territory. Let's look at these, these numbers. They're even new to me. So let's have a look where the SPD is creeping ahead with 25.7% of the vote. The center-right, basically where they've been now since uh, polls closed and we've been getting the first results, 24.5%. That is still very, very close. Both parties claiming a mandate. Both parties saying they're going to try to form coalitions, whether it's the center-left or the center-right, with the kingmakers, the FDP that's in yellow, who are happy to go with either party, as would the Greens have expressed willingness to go with either party. But this doesn't show the full picture, does it? No. We need to see who's up and who's down. So maybe we can have a quick look at the pluses and minuses, because that shows us the picture. For example, it's a very hard night for the center-right. They are claiming a mandate, but they are more than 8.8 .8 points down from their 2017 result, whereas the SPD is up more than 5%, and the Greens also up more than 5%. These are good numbers for them, but it is still way too much of a dead heat given how fragmented the political situation here is in Germany. So many parties involved. Big disappointing night for the socialist left. They'll be lucky if they get, can get into the Bundestag at all. Uh, they, there was some talk of maybe even having uh, a role in the government. That is looking ever less likely. And the FTP staying basically where they were in 2017, enough to make them quite an important uh, player in the upcoming coalition talks. Let's see how these numbers will look in the parliament, right? Big, big, big parliament we have in Germany. 730 seats projected. That could go up as counting goes on. Right now we have the SPD, the center left, moving ahead with 204 seats in the Bundestag followed by the, uh, the center-left, center-right, excuse me, center-right, CDU, 197 seats. The Greens are going to be sending a lot more of their own parliamentarians to the next Bundestag, whatever the government might look at. This is just the legislature, right? This doesn't tell us who's actually running things in government, but I think we can show you the possible coalitions that might come out of this potpourri of numbers, this rainbow of colors that we have. Well... That first one is the most interesting one because this is the one that would be basically what we have right now between the center left and the center right, which they have both said they want nothing to do with again, just like they said in 2017. There are other alternatives and that involves the Greens and the Liberal Party, the FDP, either in a more center left coalition with the center left, the SPD, or a more center right coalition with the CDU CSU. Now it should be uh, pointed out that the Greens have made it their stated purpose to try to go into coalition with the SPD, and the Liberal Free Democrats have put on the table that they would prefer, as they have historically, to go into coalition with the center-right. But again, sue me, Melinda, as you know, it's going to all depend on what's on the table, what's being offered, and who is actually going to take a deal. And Melinda, you and I were just talking about the fact that there were far more mail-in ballots, so postal ballots this year, because for various reasons, obviously, also due to the pandemic. And we've seen that shift a bit, the numbers, as the night has gone on. Yeah, and it's going to keep on shifting because they are not uh, yet all counted. So we may not have uh, a really firm result for some time. The interesting thing is mail-in uh, votes tend to come from older voters, and that seems to be the case this year as well. And uh, we also have seen that some of the voters who migrated away from uh, the Christian Democrats, uh, from the conservatives, are older voters, which is interesting. So uh, clearly that's why the fact that these mail-in votes are now coming in, that's not actually apparently helping the CDU all that much. In fact, we've seen a slight widening now of the gap with the Social Democrats taking a little bit more of a lead than it looked like they had earlier in the evening. Indeed, and that is the messaging we also heard from Olaf Scholz in that uh, debate that we just saw. Uh, and we have a clip that we want to play of Olaf Scholz talking about his mandate to govern and how he sees that. Let's take a look. 
Wir sind eine pragmatische Partei, die We're weiß, wie man regiert. Wir sind eine We zuversichtliche Partei, die We're an optimistic party that wants to push for a better future for, for all of us in Germany. But I think we've also shown that we have what it takes to govern a country, the ability to join ranks and have everyone support us. And the fact that that was the case is something I want to say thank you to all of you for. All right, so Olaf Scholz, they're thanking party members and voters. And, and we have Nina Haza back with us, who's uh, been following the Social Democrats at their election party at their party headquarters all night. And Nina, I also want to bring you in on this and ask you what you thought about what we heard um, from Olaf Scholz in that debate just now. Clearly a, a very measured approach, as is usually the case with Olaf Scholz, uh, but very clearly uh, stating that he sees that his party can move forward with trying to build a coalition as difficult as that process might be. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Olaf Scholz is not losing optimism. And I spoke to a couple of people when the debate was on here at the headquarters. They were, of course, also listening to what their boss was saying. And um, they were all cautiously confident. They said that the Greens, of course, will play an important role. And it is really up to the Greens to decide whether they just want to push through their agenda of tackling the climate crisis properly and no matter who with, or whether they will uh, look at the party manifesto of the Conservatives and the Liberals and have their doubts about whether that will actually be possible. So um, the people here at the SPD are very much looking at the Greens, but of course they're also becoming more and more optimistic as the evening's going on because of the rising numbers that are coming in uh, from the postal ballots. Yeah, indeed. And, and Melinda, you know, what we're seeing here is essentially the Social Democrats who really, you know, put on this in impressive performance in the last month and a half, really, before the election to overtake the Conservatives. I mean, how uh, significant is this, these results that we're seeing? Certainly, it's very significant that the SPD is on the way up while the CDU is on the way down. If you want to win over potential co coalition partners, obviously it's better if you're coming from a position of strength, which Olaf Schultz certainly is. And, uh, and this is personally for him also a great success. And that's going to give him some additional weight as well when he courts these other parties trying to form a coalition but that leaderships uh, round that we just that leadership round that we just saw that discussion amongst the party chair people uh, clearly indicated some of the hurdles that are going to be out there uh, because we essentially have two very different visions for where Germany is going now there are many people in this country who wanted change and voted for change. They went to the SPD, they went to the Greens. There are others who are worried about how much change this country can handle, how much change they personally can handle. And they, of course, voted for something that looks a little bit more like business as usual, which is essentially what the CDU was promising them. Now, the Greens, being in that change uh, camp and certainly looking for a much stronger role for the state, are they really going to find a good way to go together with the liberal free Democrats yeah. who say roll back the state? And what we really need is just to unleash private initiative. There are some very big hurdles and they came out very clearly in that discussion. Well, Nina, coming back to the Social Democrats and Olaf Scholz, what's going to be key for them going into coalition negotiations in these coming days? Well, what's going to be key is, of course, that their numbers keep rising and that they have their strong support um, that uh, Melinda was talking about as well. And here tonight was a big success for the Social Democrats. They have been celebrating all around, essentially. If you look at the other elections that have been happening here today as well, in mecklenburg vorpommern in the regional election, um, Manuela Schwesig, the incumbent um, state leader, was re-elected with a resounding success leaving everybody far behind. And then here in Berlin, it's a neck and neck race between the SPD and the Greens. So they are very optimistic. And of course, it's the spirit that they have at the moment. They are very optimistic that uh, they've managed to turn around that trend where the social democracy was essentially declared dead. And they say, no, very much not so. We offer what's needed. We offer some change, but we're going to do it in a responsible and more solid way than possibly others.
Yeah, that is an interesting point there, Nina. We'll be coming back to you as we see the numbers inch up or down over the course uh, of the evening. I, I want to bring in uh, our chief political editor, Michelle Kufner, who's over at the Christian Democrats uh, with the conservatives at the moment as well. Um, to bring you into this conversation, Michelle, we've been talking here with Melinda as well about where the country is heading, especially in these coming days and weeks in the uh, coalition negotiations. So what did you take away from that leaders round where we saw uh, them starting to discuss the possibilities of what might uh, what might come? Well, first of all, we took uh, away a commitment from both um, Olaf Scholz, whose SPD is still in the lead, and Armin Laschet, who still intends to also uh, attempt to try and form a government, that they are both committing themselves to doing exactly that before Christmas, which is a very interesting point because last time it took more than five months and then it all um, kind of faded away again. And then um, the second uh, commitment is from Armin Laschet, uh, from Angela Merkel's partner, who sees the grand coalition completely have come to an end. So even though that's a mathematical po um, possibility and the Social Democrats themselves have ruled it out, but even Angela Merkel's party is ruling that out now. And the third thing is <laughs> that there was some very interesting chemistry between the two potential kingmakers, um, the Free Democrats and the Greens, who have put as a possibility on the table that they may be holding talks amongst each other before they decide to sit down with the other two big parties. So these, this is the third 25% in this equation, yeah. <laughs> potentially. Um, the idea is to speed this up, but it doesn't make it less complicated. Well, it certainly makes for some interesting math, Michaela. We, we have a clip I want to bring in of Amin Lachet speaking earlier about his position on forming a coalition. So let's see if we can bring in that clip now. It would seem that for the first time we are going to have a German government with three coalition partners. And we, as the Christian Democratic Union, have received a clear mandate from our voters. A vote cast for the Union is a vote cast against a left government. And this is why we will do everything we can to form a German government led by the Christian Democratic Union. Melinda, I just saw you shaking your head at that comment from Amin Laschet there saying uh, about uh, the fact that German voters cast a ballot against a left-leaning coalition. They're saying that partly uh, because that's uh, the campaign they ran in the last weeks before the election. It was uh, uh, essentially digging deep into the uh, into the uh, the box of old uh, campaign tricks they had used in prior uh, election campaigns uh, and talking about the terrible threat of a left leaning coalition. But the fact is that voters in Germany vote for parties. They don't vote for coalitions. The parties they then elect get together and negotiate, and out of that, coalitions are born. But the, the, the voters are not expressing a preference about a particular coalition. He's trying to derive his party's mandate to form a government from a negative, from his declaration that the governors didn't want a left-leaning government, so they must actually then want a conservative-led government. And that's a, 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 a big uh, leap of faith that I don't quite see in the, in the numbers that, uh, that are currently coming in. Well, it certainly shows uh, just how unusual the current situation is. So we're going to continue talking more about this through the course of the night, Melinda and also Michaela. So thanks, uh, first of all, for that analysis. But we want to get a picture of how the world is, of course, looking at this German election. And we want to go to Max Hoffmann with the second of our special election discussion panels, this time focusing on foreign policy and whether German foreign policy might need an overhaul. So, Max, I'll hand over to you. Well, thank you, Sumi. Um, we don't know yet what the next German government is going to look like, as we have debated already over the course of the evening. But we do know that the next uh, German government is going to have a foreign minister, maybe even a female foreign minister, that will have to think about whether to do sort of a reset or at least an overhaul of German foreign policy. If you think about all the problems, the foreign policy problems that the German government faced in the last months, rising Chinese influence, of course, what happened in Afghanistan. So we have a lot to talk about with our 
panel today, and I have uh, three distinguished panelists. I'm very happy that they are with us today from Germany. We have Hanna Neumann, who is a member of the European Parliament for the Greens. Uh, and she says Germany's future foreign policy role should be European, based on a strong commitment to human rights and the Paris Climate Agreement. From Russia, we have Andrei Kortunov, Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council. That's a state-sponsored Russian think tank. And he says Berlin has been the European champion in preventing the continent from falling apart and the global leader in promoting multilateralism. Welcome. And from the United States of America, we have Anthony Gardner, who is the former U.S. ambassador to the European Union under the Obama administration. And he says Germany post Merkel should bear the burdens of keeping the EU strong and cohesive. So thank you to all our three panelists for being here with us today. And I would like to kick it off with a question to Hannah Neumann, who just uh, told us that she came directly from the, the, the party of, of the Greens in Berlin, because they do have something to celebrate. They made a relatively big gain, so will most likely be part of the next government. And we'll have to handle situations like uh, the one in Afghanistan that we uh, saw unfold over the summer. So tell us, Ms. Neumann, what would you or what would you have done differently? Well, um, I mean, in Afghanistan, you're speaking about over the summer. I think many mistakes have been done before the summer, especially with uh, former president, U.S. President Trump, directly negotiating with the Taliban and not being inclusive towards the Afghan government. And so we had faced this for the unilateral decision of the U.S. before the summer to fully withdraw. And I think it would have been good had we had stronger European cooperation and could we have at least uphold the airport for a bit longer, make sure there are proper evacuations. That is something that could have been different. Were we stronger as a European Union? Yes, indeed. And also right now, um, with these many, um, especially human rights defenders in Pakistan and other neighboring countries, could we have proper resettlement contingents, for example, in the European Union and save them? So on the coherent side, we could do a lot in Afghanistan would we work together in a more progressive way? But you're also talking about military strength. If you're talking about uh, running the, the airport in Kabul, for example, just the Europeans, like to put this to Anthony Gardner, do Americans e even believe that the Europeans are capable of doing something like that? Some skepticism, of course, in Congress, um, some of whom think that the only measure of influence is military. And I think that's uh, wrong. It's unfortunate. Uh, there are areas where the Europe does lead and very effectively on climate change is just being one of them, but also on regulatory issues, some of them very, very significant and on trade. And I've argued for a long time that the EU is, in fact, a superpower. It doesn't like to think of itself as a superpower, but it is certainly in those three areas, regulation and on trade and on climate, but not only. But you're right. On, on Look, on military and security issues, the EU has a long way to go, and Germany can contribute to that. What do you expect or what would you like uh, Germany to do in the next four years when it comes to foreign policy, also security policy? Well, I, you, you quoted me at the very beginning, and I think that's the, the key point. Um, Germany has a very special role uh, as now the leader of the 27. Uh, and I say that because the UK obviously now has, has left, but was, was playing an important role. And by that, I mean um, several things. First of all, using what's called the fiscal space that it has to spend more uh, and to abandon what was perhaps over-orthodox uh, views on uh, debt. Um, we now have a 750, mil 750 billion uh, EU a bond issuance, which is backed by all the member states. That could be the beginning of something new, which I hope will be the case. But Germany also, in terms of its internal narrative inside the country, should be clear with its own people that it is the first and primary beneficiary of the single market in the euro. And therefore, as the primary beneficiary, it bears a special burden to keep the EU cohesive and strong domestically and indeed to spend more and stop, in fact, beggaring its neighbors, as was the case under austerity. Uh, there are other areas as well where I think Germany has a special role, and I would say I'm personally uh, thankful for the role that Angela Merkel played during the difficult years for many of us of Donald Trump. She was the adult in the room. She was the safe pair of hands. 
But I think now Germany can move beyond just being cautious and now being more proactive. More proactive, keeping the EU together, being more cohesive. I would like to put this to Mr. Kartanov in, in Russia. Um, it's, it appears that Russia uh, wasn't very happy when the EU is cohesive. On the contrary, seemed to try to wedge a gap between many EU countries. Uh, how would you like uh, a more cohesive European Union? Well, I think it's clear <laughs> that in Moscow they always preferred to deal with Berlin rather than with Brussels. My personal take is that it is a mistake because you cannot have good relations with the with Berlin uh, without uh, having good relations uh, with the European Union at large. But definitely the German role in the European Union is critical. I, and I think that in certain ways uh, Germany has always uh, taken the lead uh, in building relations uh, between Europe and Russia. It was very instrumental, for example, in signing the Minsk agreements in Ukraine. And uh, Angela Merkel contributed a lot personally uh, into uh, this agreement, uh, into dealing with the crisis uh, in and around Ukraine. Uh, and uh, definitely in Moscow, they would prefer to see uh, continuity in the German foreign policy rather than change. I think uh, it's very clear. But um, you understand that from a perspective, from a European perspective, the dealings of uh, the German government when it came specifically to Ukraine and the dealings of the EU weren't very effective. Sanctions and negotiations, you mentioned Minsk I and Minsk II, all of this did not change the policies of, uh, of uh, Vladimir Putin. So from a European perspective, that was not effective, correct? Well, that's correct. But uh, on, the other, on the other side, uh, we do not know what could have happened uh, if not uh, for the German engagement. Uh, probably uh, we would uh, have uh, a higher level of escalation uh, probably we would uh, have uh, more casualties uh, among the civilian population. So uh, I think that it would be wrong to say that uh, the German policy accomplished nothing. Uh, of course, we all hoped that uh, probably by today this uh, conflict uh, would be already behind us. But uh, still, uh, even if it is possible to freeze it, it is already a major accomplishment, at least in my view. Ms. Neumann, how would uh, a green foreign minister deal with Russia? I, I am pretty sure that the issue of human rights um, will play a bigger role than it did under the Merkel government. We have the disagreement on Nord Stream. And here, Mr. Gartner made the point very well that in the areas where the European Union stands as one, be it on trade and commercial policy, for example, we are very strong. But whenever we fall apart, uh, we lose this kind of strength. And that is what we see far too often in foreign policy. Russia, it's one example. We have the sanctions by the European Union. On the other hand, the Merkel and the SPD government continue to build Nord Stream and have this kind of friendly relationship with Russia, undermining the European position. We have the same situation in Libya, where we clearly have an arms embargo, but we know that countries are exporting weapons to neighboring countries of Libya that then end up in Libya. And here, the key is not a bigger military spending for me inside the European Union, but it's really to work strong steps towards a truly common foreign and security policy. And that is how we have a stronger European Union and how we can also be much clearer with regards to countries such as Russia. Well, that always sounds very good. And um, I think it's not very far away what, from what Angela Merkel would tell you. But at the same time, there's the issue of economic ties between uh, Russia and Germany specifically, for example, when it comes to gas. You mentioned Nord Stream 2. People need gas in, in winter to heat their uh, apartments and everything. And wouldn't you be, um, well, reluctant to have this conflict spiral into something that could really affect the lives of German citizens? No one has the interest to spiral the conflict just because of spiraling it. But the assumption that the Merkel government had, also vis-a-vis -vis China, by the way, that by having economic ties, we can somehow change the political system, the human rights situation in the country where we have these close ties, economic ties, be it China, be it Russia, um, it failed. 
we didn't see the change happening on the political side. Rather, we now see that German, German companies, but also other European companies, really facing a hard time in Russia, in China, and in other countries. So from the green side, we would balance the human rights, democracy interests, and the economic interests clearly differently. Okay, thank you very much. You mentioned Nord Stream uh, 2, and I would like to put this to uh, Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner, what would your expectations be from the future German government when it comes to Nord Stream 2? Well, that's one example I wanted to mention at the beginning. Uh, I say Germany should make the EU stronger. You know, solidarity, I would say, is a two-way street. Angela Merkel often invokes solidarity quite appropriately, but at key moments, she didn't actually respect it. Nord Stream 2 is one example where she decided to, to take that decision and split the EU in a very serious way, a split that continues today. But I also was at post in Brussels when um, she negotiated with uh, Turkey and announced a deal on migrants uh, that was, in uh, fact, a complete surprise to the other 27. There are a few other examples. So solidarity is a, is a two-way street. Nord Stream is now basically a done deal. Uh, I didn't approve of the way the Trump administration was handling this. However, I think it is a, a, a not just an economic deal, it is a political deal with clear ramifications for Ukraine. Now I think Germany needs to make sure that Russia lives up to its side of the bargain. Make sure that Ukraine actually is financially independent, that doesn't lose its transit fees, right? Uh, and that there should be snapback mechanisms in case Russia, in fact, doesn't live up to its word. And more importantly, that Germany and the EU really should focus now on energy diversification of supply routes uh, and also on sources, which is extremely important given that the reliance will go up, likely, on Russian gas. And just a reminder for our viewers across the world at the moment, Nord Stream 2, of course, is a gas pipeline that uh, will deliver gas directly from Russia to Germany, bypassing Ukraine that in the past had been the main uh, supplier here where the gas was led through. So I would like to hand it over to Mr. Kortinov now. Um, how do you see Nord Stream 2 evolving? And do you agree with what Mr. Gardner said? Well, I would uh, probably make a footnote to that. I think that the game is not over. There are still issues related to, to certification, and we still don't know how much gas uh, uh, will uh, uh, be uh, transmitted through this pipeline. Uh, so I think that there are many ways in which uh, uh, the importance of this uh, pipeline can be reduced. Uh, and of course, the Ukrainian transit uh, is uh, one of the preconditions uh, for this uh, pipeline to start operating at its full capacity. Uh, again, you know, if you uh, look at the Russian position, I think that uh, they would love uh, to sell more gas uh, to Europe. Uh, and uh, if uh, their position would be that uh, if you want uh, to preserve the Ukrainian uh, transit, uh, you should buy more gas from Russia. So uh, in a nutshell, Europe uh, has to decide uh, whether it likes to reduce uh, its dependence on the Russian gas. And in this case, all pipelines will suffer, including the Nord Stream 2 and, of course, the Ukrainian transit. Or uh, Europe would like uh, to increase this cooperation with Russia that will justify preservation of the Ukrainian transit, but also uh, the utilization of the Nord Stream 2 project. Ms. Neumann, uh, you mentioned uh, mechanisms like the one with, with Russia, and I think there are similarities to, to China. You can obviously tell me if you think I'm wrong, but uh, do you feel like uh, the current, uh, or, yeah, well, the current German government and those before were tough enough on, on China when it comes to human rights and um, maybe also putting human rights above economic interests? Well, clearly, I don't think they were tough enough. They just had the hope by being nice to China. At one point, China will be nice to us, and that didn't work out. But let me just make one point to finish the discussion on Nord Stream, because that is where actually domestic and foreign policy are so closely interlinked. Mr. Gardner spoke about diversification. And especially in the energy sector, the best way forward for diversification and independence is a massive scale-up of domestic renewables. Right. And now now back to China, because that is obviously something that uh, we need to talk about when we talk about foreign German foreign policy, massive economic ties, some would say even dependence. And uh, on the other hand, China, which is uh, gaining influence all over the world, very strong muscle, also in e eastern parts of the European Union. Again, to you, Ms. Neumann, 
a green foreign minister would do what? A green foreign minister would be much stronger spoken out on human rights, which would not stop us from trying to cooperate in other fields where we have common interests. And if China is, for example, serious about its announcement when it comes to um, moving away from coal, when it comes to stepping up its um, climate ambitions, that's clearly an area where, where we can cooperate. But this will never stop us from speaking out on the massive human rights violations that we see in China. And I think that is a clear shift away from the policy of this government that was just rather being silent, hoping that things will change by being silent, and they didn't. Do you think that's realistic, uh, Mr. Gardner, given the, the economic ties that Germany and, and China have? Well, I hope it's the case, because I think it's appropriate to do so, and I agree entirely um, that uh, that doesn't preclude us from working with China in areas where our interests overlap. And I think climate is clearly one of them, and non-proliferation is another. There, there are indeed others, but we should be speaking out about human rights. One gets the impression that Germany's foreign policy regarding China has too often been shaped by its German export commercial interests. Now, that's not unique. I mean, every country, of course, does that to a certain extent, but I would say Germany is particularly the case. I think Germany also has underestimated the leverage it has with China as a member of the EU on trade. There are a lot of things the EU does that China listens to, whether it's potentially closing off its public procurement market to countries or companies from countries that don't open their markets to public procurement, and China's one of them, there are, there are others, but particularly to companies that benefit from subsidies and um, that are state-owned enterprises. Uh, and there is a lot of other leverage in terms of changing the WTO rules, of reforming our system of trade, of being a champion for multilateralism, but making sure the trade agreements are enforced. Uh, and also looking at foreign direct investment and foreign, you know, screening of foreign investment, of ensuring that there is supply chain diversification, resilience, a lot of other ways. Germany, I think, underestimates the leverage it has with China to force effective reform. Is it that or is it that Germany is shying away from using that leverage? Well, perhaps both. I, I, happen, I happen to think it's both. Uh, I think there are voices that are saying, well, we can't really affect change with China, so therefore let's just trade more with them and let's hope for the best. That clearly hasn't happened. It's failed. I mean, anyone who's believed that uh, China's going to play nice, is going to reform because it's get, get, it gets richer, is clearly, um, you know, is, is, is not, uh, it, it, it's not true. Um, so I think we need to use the leverage that we have at our disposal. Um, Mr. Kornov, what uh, Kortunov, I'm sorry, uh, apologies. What would the, the expectations be from the Russian perspective when it comes to EU Chinese, Chinese or German Chinese relations for the next four years? It's hard to tell. I think that uh, in Russia, the uh, as obsessed about sovereignty as they are in Beijing, uh, both countries. Uh, do not uh, want uh, uh, foreign powers to interfere into their domestic affairs, at least how they perceive their domestic affairs. So basically, I think that uh, China and Russia are likely to stand uh, close to each other regarding the issues of uh, sovereignty and non-interference. Uh, having said that, uh, I also believe that uh, uh, Russia is uh, interested uh, in uh, stronger relations between the European Union and China uh, because that uh, might contribute uh, to the European strategic autonomy from the United States. And uh, I think that uh, in the Kremlin they would like to see more of this autonomy rather than less of this autonomy. So generally speaking, uh, this relationship uh, should be encouraged uh, uh, from Moscow to the extent Moscow can play a role here. So we've talked a lot about what uh, German foreign policy should look like in the next year. Now let's have a last uh, quick round here. Given the numbers we're seeing from Germany with preliminary election results and, and uh, the calculations, um, what do you think um, the German foreign policy will actually look like in the next four years? And let's start with you, Mr. Kortenhoff. <laughs> Uh, I do believe that uh, we will not see a revolution in the German foreign policy. Indeed, uh, with the Green uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, definitely there'll be more emphasis on human rights, uh, on climate change. Uh, uh, Germany will be tough on Russia and China. 
but I don't think uh, it will be a major departure from the uh, legacy of Angela Merkel. I think that uh, her influence will still be significant uh, in the German foreign policy, no matter who leads the country after her. And you, Mr. Gardner? I agree with that. I don't see a huge change, although certainly uh, I agree in those areas there will be some change on Russia and China. But those in the United States who think that Germany uh, and the EU will now be willing partners in a uh, Chinese, you know, anti-Chinese coalition, I think will be disappointed. Uh, I think Germany will try to chart a, a course that is different from the United States. It's less suspicious of China. It also has less at stake um, in the region around China, um, but it continues to want to trade with China. So I think there will be those who are disappointed if they expect a, a major shift. And what do you think about that, Ms. Neumann? I have to admit it's a bit too early to tell because it will depend a lot on whether this will be social democratic or Christian democratically led government. I rather think it will be the world that is going to force us to change our foreign policy and to make sure that together with the French, we will shape a European, a stronger European role. I know that the term strategic autonomy is interpreted very differently by very different actors, as we just heard in this discussion. But I think there's no way we cannot move together with a stronger Europe. That is something I think everyone made very clear in the campaigning and that the issue of climate will play a stronger role in um, German and the US foreign policy. Thank you very much to our panelists uh, today. Very interesting discussion, obviously a lot to talk about, a lot to think about it. But first and foremost, we need to figure out what the actual government is going to look like. And that's something that uh, Sumi and uh, Melinda can do in our other studio because maybe we have some new numbers and uh, maybe that'll get us closer to knowing what kind of coalition will govern Germany in the next four years. And with that, I would like to hand it back. Thank you. We're going to bring you the new numbers in just a moment, but just a quick update for all of you. If you happen to be just tuning in, you're watching our special coverage of the election, and the exit polls do show essentially a tie between the two main parties. So the latest results suggest that the center-left have, the Social Democrats have won just over 25% of the vote, and that is a big improvement on their 2017 result, and one they say gives them a mandate to govern. I'm in Lashat here, you see, from the Conservatives, also got around 25%, just under it appears in the latest numbers. That's their weakest result in more than 70 years, but they say they have a mandate to form a coalition. You see here the Greens, they had their strongest showing ever. They came in third, and they could very well play a role in the next coalition. Melinda, I, I want to come back to some of the points that we just saw in that uh, talk round there with Max uh, about foreign policy. If we look at the different coalition possibilities that exist that are on the table at the moment, how could they play out on a foreign policy stage? You know, it's interesting because foreign policy played a, a very small role in the actual election campaigning. The parties were very, very focused on other issues. Uh, also, EU, Europe, uh, directly played a very small role. But the fact is, we can say a few things about how co coalitions could play out simply by virtue of the fact that for Germany, it, this is the strongest economy in the EU. So what Germany does domestically has major implications, both for Europe and, in fact, in, in the world at large. And, um, and it's interesting because when they get down to coalition negotiations, one of the things they're going to be talking about is who gets what post. That's one of the bargaining yeah. chips you use in those negotiations. Now, we know that uh, both the Green Party and the Liberal Free Democrats have a great hankering for the finance ministry. Why is that? Because the finance minister essentially has a de facto veto of what happens in nearly every other ministry. And the finance minister has a lot of weight on the international stage and a great deal of weight on the European one. In fact, many people would say he's far more important than the foreign minister, particularly within Europe. Now, the liberal Free Democrats are known to favor stronger intergovernmental 
cooperation between the EU member states, but not more EU integration. With the Greens, it's the other way around. They would like a much more integrated EU, fiscally integrated EU, an EU that can really move as an economic actor and use uh, fiscal tools, meaning uh, taxes, meaning spending, to address crucial needs within Europe. You will not see a, a, an FDP finance minister willingly go along with such a thing. So we have here uh, one of the big hurdles for getting those two parties into any kind of a coalition, be it led by the Conservatives or by the Social Democrats. That will be a crucial issue and it will have major implications for Europe. And I think there will be many Europeans watching this evening what's happening here in Germany and asking themselves, how can this play out for us? Mm -hmm. Well, watch who is likely to get that crucial post in the finance ministry because that will very much determine where Germany goes on EU politics. And for certainly Mr. Lindner, if it went to him, yeah. he could well make the frugal four the frugal five. And yeah. we could see a much greater strengthening of that old austerity line with real implications for divisions within the EU. That's the view for the EU. What about those other big foreign policy questions? Could any of these coalition constellations see a real departure from Chancellor Merkel's approach. Absolutely, and here, interestingly enough, we see some proximity between the Greens and the Liberal Free Democrats. Both of them said during the course of the election campaign, they'd like to see Germany get tougher with Russia, get tougher with China, really speak out about human rights, and that might be a place where they can find a little bit of commonality. And that certainly would take us in a different direction from what we just heard, those, uh, those uh, criticisms that Germany acts too much on the basis of its commercial interests. One last point on that. We have also seen that uh, both the Greens and the SPD, they have a whole lot of overlap anyway. But both of them would like to see Germany putting into its trade agreements more provisions that would guarantee that trading partners uh, keep up with certain social and environmental standards. So again, a slight departure from purely commercial interests as the driver of, of trade. Well, all of this, again, very much going to depend on how the numbers develop over the course of the evening and uh, in the coming hours. So let's get an update on the numbers with William now. Time keeps ticking and those results keep coming in. Let's see what the latest are. They're as new for me as they are for you. So let's have a look. The SPD ticking up there now, 25.8% it looks like. They are pulling ahead. It's starting to separate a little bit. Still very, very close. Both parties, the SPD and the CDU-CSU Conservative Union Bloc, they're both going to be vying to make, it, to make a coalition and lead the next German government, but the union has pretty much been staying stable in that 24% area, while the SPD seems to be pulling ahead just a little bit as more postal ballots are being counted, as more regular ballots are being counted. The Greens looks like they're, st they're sticking around in about that 14% category, and the liberal FDP that Melinda was just talking so much about also holding steady in that 11%. And meanwhile, that socialist left down here, this pink bar, they are, will be lucky if they get into the Bundestag at all. They are holding on by their fingernails to stay in the Bundestag with that 5% threshold cutoff. Now let's look at who's up, who's down in this election in comparison to the 2017 election. Here you are, you can see it. You can see the historic loss of votes by the CDU, CSU, the union bloc, uh, that has been running government basically for the last 16 years under Angela Merkel. They're still competitive with the SPD who are up. This is what, why we say that even tonight if you win, you could still lose in terms of forming a government or you could lose tonight, but still win in terms of forming a government. It will all depend who does coalition negotiations with whom. We can see now in the parliament how the seats will look in terms of who gets the most Right now, again, SPD adding a few more seats here. 205 we're at about now. CDU losing one or two here and there from our previous estimate at 195. The Greens, it's going to be a much greener Bundestag, it looks like, in the next, the next legislative period because a lot more green representatives are going to be sitting there as well as the liberal FDP and then the other smaller 
parties. Now, I think we have some of more of my favorite data, which is voter migration data. Yes, we do. Here we have the FDP. We just heard so much about these liberal free Democrats, the kingmakers. Where have they gotten their votes from? Look at this. Young people, some of which are first-time voters, those 18-year-olds, have been very attracted to what the FDP is offering in terms of their claims of their promises of digitalization, of more innovation in the marketplace, these kinds of things. So the, the, the youth are actually out in force at 22% with the FDP and following kind of in that order towards age um, down to 70 plus, 70 plus just with 8%. And I think we can also see from the CDU, CSU, that's our black our party in black. Who supports them the most? Not really a surprise, tried and true. The older you get, the more conservative you tend to get. That's true in Germany, that's true in a lot of countries. The union relies on older voters and Germany skews old. More people in Germany are old than they are young. You can imagine that even if Germany was any younger, they would be doing even worse than they were, but it looks like older voters came out and gave their vote to the CDU, CSU, conservative bloc. There's gonna be so much more to talk about. So many more of these kinds of numbers are gonna be coming out through the night. Let's hand it back over to Sumi and Melinda. Thanks, William. That's really interesting data. And, and as we're talking about voters, I wanna uh, head back to our correspondent, Jafar Abdul Karim, who's been talking to voters all day. And uh, he's uh, from the, joining us from the district of Kreuzberg in Berlin, where he's been speaking to some more voters. Uh, Jafar, give us an idea of what people are telling you at this point, as the numbers do seem so uh, up and down. Yes, uh, what I hear is um, most of the people I talk to are disappointed, especially the younger generation. They expected the Green Party to get much more higher voters. And uh, some of them are uh, even disappointed. How can that the alternative for Germany, the far right party, reaches 10 percent when it comes to Germany? This is something also people are thinking about. And uh, most of them also say they expected that the uh, Social Democrats might be today's uh, winner, the way it looks till now. So different opinions. There's no one clear um, um, opinion here on the streets. Really very different and diverse uh, opinions. Jafar, we should, of course, say here in Berlin that there does seem to be a, a large amount of support for the Green Party. So you, of course, are going to be running into a lot of people who support the Greens, uh, which is what we've seen over the course of the evening from the people you've been speaking to. Uh, but how much interest is sure. there in this election? From my point of view, what I, what I experienced today, there is big interest in today's election because when I was driving with my bicycle through Berlin and then talking to different people in different parts of the city here in Berlin, you could see the lines, people waiting, and some of them really I talked to waited for maybe more than one hour. Like four years ago when I talked to voters, I cannot remember that someone stood like for more than one hour to wait and uh, to vote. And when you talk to people also, especially the younger generation, they want, they want to see a change. They say it's time for a change, especially when it comes to the climate issue. And uh, I think that's why the interest when I look around here in Berlin was uh, very big. And also to mention now, I think it's night and you cannot, we cannot see the sun anymore. But we also have to mention, you know, the sun doesn't always shine in Berlin but today was a really shiny day and I think everyone was like okay let's go out let's vote and uh, let's be part of this elections yeah it's a pretty unusual sunny day for late September here in Berlin Jaffar but would you say yes. that uh, climate change was really the number one topic among the voters who you spoke to here in Berlin that they wanted to see uh, addressed by the next government Yes, I would, I would um, uh, say this and I would confirm this, that the people I talk to, do, uh, to, uh, to if it's here in Kreuzberg or also uh, in, in Neukölln or in other areas of, of Berlin, you can see there's a big concern when it comes to the climate change. Compared to the last uh, uh, four years ago, climate change wasn't that a priority to compare it 
to, to today. And also it's about uh, social justice. A lot of people talk mm. about social justice. And I have also to mention, I, I went to areas where you have high numbers of uh, migrants living there, and they are really concerned uh, what's, uh, what's the, um, the Germany's approach when it comes to refugees, when it comes to uh, living all together, when it comes maybe to some of them. They also mentioned when, uh, when they are facing racism, how will the government uh, um, um, deal with it? So totally different uh, uh, topics. But what I can really confirm is the interest is there and climate change is a priority. All right. Jafar Abdul Karim gathering the voices of voters for us on the streets of Berlin tonight. Thanks so much uh, for that update. As we heard there, climate change, a big part of this election. Green, the Green Party do, do, does look set to uh, play a big part in this next government. Uh, let's take a listen to what uh, the candidate for the Greens, Annalena Bebark, had to say a little bit earlier tonight. And just really getting a sense of so many people who weren't actually members of the Green Party but who were interested, where we really had a sense that there's a real longing for political debate in this country and a longing not just from those who for 40, 50, 60 years have been alive, but we're talking about school children, not just the ones at the Fridays for Future demonstrations, but even before that. You know, some of them were saying, well, we had a free hour from school and we thought we'd come along and find out what's going on. So these are school children who want us to shape the future together because it's our future, everyone's future. It was amazing. Listening to the Greens chancellor candidate there, let's bring in our correspondents who've been following the smaller parties. Uh, we have uh, Simon Young with the Free Democrats, uh, the FDP, and we also have, uh, I think we have also uh, Julia Sedelli with the Greens. Oh, we have a problem with the line, I hear, so we're going to try to bring them in in a moment. But Melinda, if I can ask you, we were just hearing there about uh, many green voters here on the streets of Berlin saying very clearly they want to see a change in climate change. And we saw Annalena Baerbock in that candidate's round earlier saying, yeah, this is exactly what this result shows. So where do we see the dissonance between the overall result and, uh, yeah? There are enormous tensions in Germany around this issue, uh, as in many, many other countries as well. People who live in big cities, people who have um, great digital skills, who mm -hmm. can work from their homes, they are absolutely the winners when it comes to modernization. And certainly the bicycle riding uh, startup scene in Berlin, absolutely, they're all for transformation. If you live in the countryside, if you commute by car to work because there's no good public transportation in your area, if the schools your children go to don't have adequate digital uh, options for the kids, you may be a lot more worried about what change will mean for you because you may worry that you won't be able to afford to drive that car to work. You may be worried that your children are going to far, fall farther and farther behind uh, because your school isn't up to snuff. For these voters, it may be very threatening when someone like Baerbach talks about uh, a climate government uh, and a climate-driven uh, change policy. So she and others who want to see that kind of change have talked about the need for climate justice mm -hmm. and to be sure that we take people along on this journey, whether it's by giving them rebates uh, on, their, on their electricity prices when those go up or whether it's by giving them what the Greens call uh, citizens' uh, energy money. But whatever it is, there is a real tension between state and country, city and countryside when it comes to change. And uh, this election definitely is a watershed, but we can't say that we see a clear, uh, overwhelming majority saying, yeah, let's push forward with rapid, major transformation. There are many people who are worried, and it will be important for those who negotiate now on the coalition to be sure that they have those those voters in mind as well.
Well, certainly we saw a lot of young voters casting their ballots. If you look at the, the statistics that William brought us earlier, a lot of young voters voting for the Greens and also for the Free Democrats. I think, uh, I think we can bring in our correspondents. If the line is working, uh, we can see uh, Simon Young with the Free Democrats and Julius O'Delli with the Greens. Uh, I don't see you two yet. I hope you can hear me uh, if you can. Uh, yeah, there you are. Now we see you on our screens. Uh, Julie, I want to start with you because we've just been hearing there about how the Greens were a bit struggling uh, to deal with this divide between their support in big cities like Berlin, where they have appeared to do very well, and the countryside, where they really have struggled, also in the former East. I mean, how have they tried to address that, and why hasn't it really worked until now? This is an issue that the party is very much aware of. I spoke to Jürgen Trittin, who's been a longtime uh, Green member. He was a former minister in the previous Green government, and that's what he told me. We are an urban party. We are a party for younger, educated people, and it's something that they still haven't been able to crack, how to try to reach out to other people. And uh, in the past, they've been accused of being an elitist party, a party of bands that only wants to prohibit the use of combustion engine cars uh, stop people from eating meat and it's a reputation that they've been trying to move away from but they are clearly still struggling with that they've tried to uh, in this campaign uh, bring together uh, the issue of climate change and social justice social equality and say that they want to put forward policies that uh, couple these two issues and go hand in hand with these two things but it possibly has not reached the voters enough in the regions where the greens are the weakest so yes the countryside the east and outside of the big cities Simon, I want to come to you because, again, remarkable to see that so many young voters and also first-time voters we're seeing in that age bracket of from, I think, 18 to 24, a lot of voters casting their ballots for the Free Democrats, the FDP. Can you explain that to us? Well, the Free Democrats uh, in the past were sometimes thought of as just a party of business. The current leader, Christian Lindner, has uh, made it his, uh, his job to kind of focus that down to uh, entrepreneurs, to small business owners, to start up uh, business owners and uh, particularly speaking I think there to a younger kind of uh, business person and as Melinda mentioned people with digital skills, uh, people who want to be mobile, who don't, uh, you know, who don't perhaps feel at home either in, uh, in the state sector nor with the, the big corporate uh, businesses, uh, you know, the daimler Benz and so on of, of Germany. So uh, that's the clientele that the FDP have been trying to speak to increasingly in recent years. And I think uh, certainly with uh, urban uh, groups like that, younger people certainly have answered uh, that call and we've seen their share of the vote uh, move up, if, if only uh, just marginally tonight. OK, I have a question I want to put to both of you, starting with you, Simon. We heard in that leaders' uh, debate a little bit earlier that Christian Lindner, the head of the Free Democrats, suggested that the Greens and the Free Democrats should come together first and talk first before those larger coalition negotiations start. I mean, Simon, what do you make of that? Well, I think in a way that makes a lot of sense because, uh, you know, the two most likely uh, coalition, three-way coalition options that come out of uh, the numbers tonight uh, are, both feature the Greens with the Free Democrats, smaller parties that have obviously got to work out how much of their agenda they can get into a government plan before they then go and, you know, try and sell it to the, the bigger party that will be leading that, whether it's Christian Democrats uh, on the one side or Social Democrats uh, on the other. So certainly Christian Lindner of the FDP, he's been saying, you know, we and the Greens, we both stand in our different ways for renewal and change in Germany, for doing things differently. So if we can, uh, you know, get together and, uh, you know, speak that language, maybe we can find common ground that we can put in the service of a, of a national coalition government. And Julia, what do you make of that from the perspective of the Greens? Is that, does that make sense for the Greens as also, also to take the next step of talking to the Free Democrats, the two perhaps kingmakers of this election? It does definitely make sense, also looking at the experience that the Greens and the uh, Free Democrats went through with the previous uh, gov election in 2017. They were in coalition talks with the Conservative CDU, the Greens and the Free Democrats, and after long negotiations where they seem to be making way, 
the Free Democrats suddenly pulled out because they couldn't agree on important policy points. So I think it would be important for the Greens to try to find an agreement specifically with the Free Democrats to try to avoid the situation that they had four years ago and have some easier negotiations this time. We'll see how that goes. And Julius Odelli with the Greens and Simon Young with the Free Democrats. We'll talk to you both a little bit later. Uh, thank you for those updates from uh, the respective election parties where you were at. So, Melinda, you know, from hearing what we just heard our two correspondents say, do you think that this is going to be the way forward that we're going to see the Greens and the FDP, two parties that did, as we just heard, try to come together in a coalition government last time? It failed because the Free Democrats pulled out of those negotiations. Do you think that's going to be the first step now? It's really hard to say because, in fact, um, let's say you were in the Green Party and it's looking more and more like Olaf Scholz is likely uh, to have a stronger mandate to form the new government by virtue of the fact that he's the real winner in this election. The SPD uh, has uh, has won a great many votes in comparison to four years ago, whereas the CDU has its uh, historically lowest uh, result ever. So uh, if if you were Olaf Scholz, you would certainly, if you were the, the, the Green Party, you would certainly want Olaf Scholz at your side when you start negotiating mm -hmm. with the liberal free democrats who take very very different positions on some key issues starting with finances major transformation requires major investment yeah. there is a 500 billion euro investment gap in this country that means to get the kind of modernization, digitalization, and climate infrastructure that we need. That includes electric transmission lines. That's to in bring, the Greens program, isn't yeah, it? It is. To bring uh, uh, wind energy from the North Sea down to the south of Germany, you need major new transmission lines. Those are public sector investments. You need big money to do that. Where's that money going to come from? If the Free Democrats are saying we're not going to have tax increases and we want to stick to the debt break that prescribes uh, no new debt and essentially a limit on the amount of debt that the government can take, they're going to have enormous difficulties in filling that investment gap and in doing all the things that the parties on paper are committing themselves to do. So that's a huge hurdle. Now, Olaf Scholz and the Greens want to relax or at least rethink the debt break. And uh, uh, Baerbock, the, uh, the Green uh, Chancellor candidate, actually gave an indication today of a little bit of flexibility because she pointed out in answer to a question that the debt break is actually part of the Constitution. So nobody's saying, uh, you know, we reject it because it's, it's, it's law. But you could rethink the debt break. You could say that certain kinds of investment don't count against that sort of debt because they are investment in the future and they will generate returns. And many of the investments I just listed could be seen uh, as falling into that category. So she gave a little bit of a an opening. Of opportunity. But yeah. if you were going in that direction, you'd want an ally. And of course, the SPD would be the natural ally for the Greens on that point. It's exactly the other way around if you were a liberal free democrat you'd rather be able to go to the cdu and say hey we need your help here because we want to keep that really tight debt break on so that we don't uh, see the government debt rise and so that we uh, don't have to raise taxes and so you wouldn't necessarily want to be going head to head with the greens who also have a few more percentage points uh, win in this election right so many considerations to take into these coalition negotiations and let's get an idea again of, of where the numbers stand let's hand over to william who's going to take us through again uh, where the numbers are at the moment. That's right. We've got some more new numbers for you. New for you. New for me. Let's put them up on the wall and have a look. SPD keeps creeping on up. 25.9%. It seems like not a lot, but when it's this close, every tenth of a percent counts in terms of in terms of parties being able to make a claim to the next government, to make a claim to building a coalition, to having that right, so to speak. Whereas the, the union bloc, they're, them in black, they are pretty much stable. They've been stable there for a while, around that 24% mark. The Greens also keep them pretty stable, 14.5%. So the story here right now is how much more, how much of a difference can the SPD eke out ahead of 
their union rivals to be able to stake a claim to making that coalition. Everybody else so far seems to be pretty much stable, except, and here's the big one, the socialist left. Right now we've been seeing them at 5%, but depending on what poll data, what count you're looking at and when, they might be just under that 5% threshold, might be just at that 5% threshold. There's still no guarantee that they're gonna make it into the parliament at all after all of these months of the center-right using a scare tactic about the possibility of the left getting into government. They might not even get into the Bundestag, so we might be looking at a whole different story here. We have more of my favorite data, voter migration. Now we're gonna look at the SPD. Where did the SPD get its votes for? For votes from 1.4 million union voters, people in Germany who at one point voted for the CDU, CSU, now voting for the SPD. They flopped from the center right to the center left. And they also got some votes from a handful of other parties from the socialist left that might explain why the left is struggling now to keep in the Bundestag at all. Non-voters have come over to the SPD. So people who didn't vote before, now 330,000 of them have decided to give their vote to the center left. Interestingly, the far right, 220,000 of them seem to hear Olaf Scholz and his SPD's message of more, more of a social policy, more of a, of a redistribution of wealth to some degree. And they even got some votes from the Free Democrats, but they lost votes to the Greens, 230,000 uh, from the center left to the Greens. And I think we can also see the Greens voter migration. So we just heard that they gained 230,000 votes from the center left, but they also gained real big from the union. So we're starting to see why the CDU-CSU is so down in comparison to their 2017 result, about eight, nine points now that they're down because they've lost so much votes from other, or gone to other parties. The Greens also taking from the socialist left, another reason why the left might be just hanging on by a thread there, and the other parties you can see there. So just a huge kind of flip-flop in who's voting for whom. And like I said, this is my most favorite data because it really shows the, the motions, the movements of the political landscape here in Germany. Yeah, and what voters are thinking and how willing they are to change their affiliations, which is very interesting. Uh, we're going to bring in uh, Nina Haza with the Social Democrats at the moment because we w I want to get an update on how things are looking on, at that end as well, especially as we've seen the numbers for the Social Democrats ticking up a bit. So, uh, Nina, if we can bring you in. I uh, can't see you just yet, but I think you can hear us. There you are. I uh, want to ask, you know, as we see the Social Democrats numbers ticking up, we saw some pretty interesting voter migration data that's there that showed that uh, the SPD was able to, to pick up so many voters from the union. I mean, can you explain to us how they managed to do that? I think a lot, of course, has to do with the fact that Angela Merkel is not running again. You know, she has decided to hand over the job to some somebody else. And uh, we all know somebody here in Germany who says, um, I don't really like the Conservatives, but I do like Angela Merkel, which is why I've been voting um, CDU in the recent past and now that factor is not there anymore of course it's not the only one but it has become very clear under Armin Laschet that he's intending to steer the party into a much more traditionally conservative direction that became clear when he chose uh, the personnel around him with Friedrich Merz one of the more controversial figures um, who goes back a long time and um, is a famous figure here in German politics so you know that became clear to German voters as well and then, of course, Olaf Scholz managed to portray himself as the most competent, as the most solid candidate to succeed Angela Merkel with the most experience in politics, with the biggest, um, longest years in governing positions out of all the three um, who were in that uh, race to succeed Angela Merkel. And, uh, yeah, he is the current finance minister. He's Angela Merkel's deputy. And, of course, he's also learned from her. He's learned certain skills from her how to deal with crisis and now he's intending to sell that idea that uh, you can trust me, I know how to manage crises, I'm an effective crisis manager, uh, you can trust me, I will do this solidly and this is something that Germans have always appreciated about Angela Merkel, this no-nonsense, no-ideology-driven approach to politics and apparently this is something that people associate with Olaf Scholz, at least that is what the latest projections seem to be suggesting.
they do seem to be suggesting, and Melinda, I want to get your view on that as well. Olaf Scholz then, as Nina has put it, really seems to be even a, a receptacle, if you will, for all of these voters who would cast a ballot for Angela Merkel. Is that right? I think that's right. And, you know, I said before that the voters in a parliamentary democracy like Germany's don't elect coalitions, they elect parties. They actually also don't elect individuals, supposedly. This is not a head-to-head -head race the way it would be in, say, the United States uh, between different individuals. Uh, they are the chancellor candidates of their parties, and the vote you cast is for the party. Nonetheless, the character of the different chancellor candidates played a very big role in this election. And Olaf Scholz consistently had far higher poll ratings than Armin Laschet, the conservative chancellor candidate. Why is that? Well, I think it's very much what, what Nina uh, just described, that pragmatism, that airy, a, a, a aura of sort of calm competence. By the way, both he and Angela Merkel are from northern Germany, mm. and that aura is very much a northern German, no-nonsense, uh, you know, hands-on, rather modest, um, low charisma. That seems to be something that Germans uh, respond to quite well. Whereas Armin Laschet, as you know, ran into trouble during the uh, the floods in Germany, in his own state, uh, where he is uh, the uh, the um, state uh, minister. But he uh, he was laughing. He was caught on camera laughing when Germany's federal president was speaking at a, uh, a site where the floods had caused terrible damage. And I think it cemented many voters' perspective that he isn't up to the task. And that, I think, again, is it, it's the end of the Merkel area, and people are rethinking their attachments to the Conservative Party, mm. the CDU, and looked at him and thought, well, he, actually, he's not the successor to Merkel. He can't fill her shoes. And unfortunately, in many of his subsequent election campaign per, uh, uh, appearances, you had the sense that he wasn't quite in an authentic place for for. Mm what he himself believes, but that he was sort of trying to be all things to all people. And we saw a bit of that this evening as well. Well, we're going to talk about Amin Lashad. I want to say thanks, uh, first of all, to Nina. We'll let you go uh, watch those numbers a little bit more, Nina, and come back to you a little bit later. Uh, and we're going to bring in Michele Kufner, who's with the Christian Democrats. And Michele, that's a question I'd love to put to you as well. Was it essentially Angela Merkel, after 16 years stepping out of this race, or the candidate who the Christian Democrats and the, the CDU CSU, so the conservative bloc selected to try to replace her, uh, was, was that perhaps what led to this historic uh, result, historic loss, let's say, for the Conservatives? Or was it a combination? It certainly was a combination, but there's a question of proportionality there. And Amin Laschet uh, also used that to a certain degree as an excuse. He said it, they knew it would always be difficult at the end of 16 years of Angela Merkel. I mean, when he came on stage, he first of all thanked Angela Merkel, who got a huge round of applause. And um, I saw an interesting other piece of polling here where um, voters were asked, um, ask, would you have voted for uh, the party you voted for um, without that candidate. The question was, I only voted for the SPD because of Olaf Scholz, and Olaf Scholz got 48% agreeing to that. <laughs> but Armin Laschet got 10, and um, Annalena Baerbock got six. So uh, that tells you quite a lot about the strength of the candidate. Um, Olaf Scholz, and also about the weakness um, of Armin Laschet, which I think is safe to say after this dramatic loss, this worst result in um, modern German history for the Conservative camp, um, is his personal um, setback. I don't want to say defeat, because he is not defeated. I mean, they're, they're down, the CDU is down, but they're not out of the race, and neither is Armin Laschet. He's not out of the race of actually forming a coalition. And this is the interesting thing about how German politics works as well. You don't have to be, uh, there's no all out winner necessarily, now it's back to the parties and to their ability to actually form and forge a compromise coalitions, something like the marriage contract of, of coalitions. They write it all down and then they agree to a, a joint program. 
and that's like a new phase that we're coming into now with three parties rather than two in the past. So it's getting more complicated. And this is interestingly something that Amin Nashid is very well used to because as a state premier, he has a very slim majority just by one vote. He also has a coalition to deal with there. And that, people close to him say, is his strength to find out what the other side needs and to forge exactly these kinds of compromises. So a very interesting time. Interesting indeed, Michelle. We'll let you go listen into some of the conversations there at the Conservative Party's headquarters uh, to see where things might be heading. So thanks uh, for now. All right, well, we have been talking a lot about uh, climate change through the course of the evening and hearing out what uh, an important is it issue it is for voters. We can go now back to Max Hoffman with the last of our special election discussion panels looking at climate change and whether Germany is a climate sinner or savior. Max, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Sumi. That's exactly what we're going to try to find out, but obviously also what the world expects from the new German government. As you just said, uh, fighting climate change was one of the main topics of this election. It's obviously a topic that's very close to the heart of the Green Party as well. Young people expect action here, but as you said, you know, Germany has a very uh, complicated role there. Big industries, car industry on the one hand, on the other hand, trying to be a front runner when it comes to climate technology. So this is what we're going to talk about. Germany, a front runner or a culprit when it comes to climate change. And I have a great panel for this with us today. From Uganda, we have Hilda Nakabuye with us. She's a climate and environmental rights activist. And importantly, uh, she's the founder of Fridays for Future in Uganda. Thank you very much for being with us today. And she says... The German government needs to stick to its 1.5 degree promise. Also with us today from Germany, Dr. Lukas Köhler from the liberal and business-friendly German party FDP. He's their expert on the topic of climate change and the environment. And he says Germany's next government has a responsibility to ensure the highest possible return on emission savings for every euro spent. Finally, from Paris, France, Rana Adib. She is the executive secretary of REN21, an international policy network for renewable energy. So she's an absolute expert on that topic, and we're looking forward for, to hearing from her on this one. And she says, renewable energy must be a key performance indicator for all economic activity and in all sectors. So welcome, everybody. And let's kick it off uh, with uh, Hilda Nakabuye today, because... Uh, Ms. Nakabuya, you marched on Friday with Fridays for Future, uh, a big uh, event day all over the world. You maybe even influenced the outcome of the German election a little bit with Fridays for Future. We don't know. So what do you have to say now to those that want to form the new German government? Uh, well, thank you for this opportunity. It's quite late in my area right now. It's coming to midnight, but I'm here not because I want but because we are in a crisis. And if you are in a crisis, you have to act either way, you don't have to wait. So for those that are preparing for the German uh, elections coming soon, one message that I have for you, and especially to the councillors that are standing in, I personally do not, haven't yet seen the concrete action or the concrete view or the hope that we, activists, young people, the young generation should have in councillors like this to be. So we are, the councillors are not showing enough because to combat the climate crisis, we need political will. And that will is uh, not something we are seeing in the chancellors right now. That is what we demand. and. German but can you say exactly what you, you know, a little more precisely what you expect from the German government? Maybe give us an example. Well, I don't have so much expectations because they haven't already done enough. So my expectation is to see more concrete actions being taken by the German government and also in line with uh, staying below 1.5 degrees Celsius. This should be taken seriously as German is one of the biggest emitters in history. So it should lead the transition, a just transition. Okay, and uh, your words were heard by Lukas Köhler, who might 
uh, his, whose party might be part of the next uh, German government. Actually, the odds are pretty high that this is going to happen. So have you received the message and are you intending to follow it? Yes, of course. I, I do believe that um, one of the biggest issues we will have in the next couple of weeks is to form a, a government that is willing to act uh, quick and, and decisive enough to uh, follow the 1.5 degree pledge we have within the Paris Agreement. Not the, uh, numerous things will be will have to be done. Um, and of course, it will not be easy. And of course, there's a big change. Uh, if, uh, but we've seen that with this election now, um, the people in Germany want a, a progressive government that is tackling climate change, and that will be uh, focusing on exactly those things, getting concrete measures done. And um, both the liberals as well as the greens uh, have it in their agendas, uh, in their, in their, in their um, how you say, in the, um, in the stuff the that we wrote down for the election. Yeah, program. Thanks. Um, Campaign program. Yeah, but if I may, program. if I may interrupt you real, real quick, uh, there, Mr. Kula. I mean, the Greens and the FDP, so the Free Democrat, Democratic, Business Friendly Party that you are part of, are not necessarily known to overlap uh, or to agree on what kind of measures should be taken for to protect uh, the climate. How do you see that working out? Well, that is a, the, the most interesting question for the next weeks, right? And I do believe that there is no, that we can't play out um, ecology against economy. If we do try that, then we will fail. I do believe that we have to, well, let's take a, a concrete example. For example, um, getting out of coal way before 2038. Um, and my beliefs even around or before 2030 is a, a key piece, is a cornerstone um, and that will work only with more renewables, but that will work only as well with a new market design. So we do need both. We do need uh, the aims of the Greens uh, with, with specific um, ideas on how and which way we want to go. But we also need to think about the market because you can't just switch off German energy, right? So you will need more renewables, but you also need um, ways to finance them. You need um, energy prices not to skyrocket uh, like they do at the moment right. because of the high gas price. And Just a reminder for our viewers watching invest. us across the world at the moment that the goal, the official goal um, of, of the German Green Party is to get out of the coal business by 2030. So uh, I would like to hand it over to Ms. Adib here, what uh, Mr. Kurla said. Do you agree with that? I think what is very clear is that um, fossil fuel is responsible for 75% of the CO2 emissions, which means that today, um, and I think that's something we see globally, but also in Germany, that it is not enough to support energy efficiency and, um, and renewable energy, but uh, that we clearly need to move out of fossil fuel. And this obviously in the German case means coal, but it also means um, moving basically um, the transport sector um, to an efficient and renewable based sector. And I think here, the targets are very far from being very ambitious. Um, you said they're very far that, from uh, being very ambitious. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, exactly. Okay, they're so you would like to have more ambitious goals, that, right? Yes, I think there is much more ambition needed. It's the same when we are looking into heating and cooling, uh, whether it is in the building sector or in industry. And this is the case of Germany, but it's a case actually uh, globally. And why is this so important? Um, we are seeing that the transition is happening in the power sector um, and advancing very well. And uh, in these sectors, basically, renewable energy today is the least cost option. So that's also why over 80% of new capacities are building on on uh, wind and on photovoltaics. When we are looking, however, at the energy demand, we're consuming over 80% of the energy for heating, cooling, and transportation. And um, what needs to happen today, and I think this is the big task of the government to come, is to really take a lead in driving this transition from a fossil fuel-based economy to a renewables-based economy in an integrated way. So it's not enough anymore that climate is a discussion of the environmental ministry. It needs to be anchored in any economic activity and any political activity. And um, Germany, who has been a historic front runner, I guess, in terms of the development of the energy transition, clearly um, has a big task today to take a lead and drive the integrated transition, which has been decided at the European level, uh, but also um, be an inspirer and inspiration for other mm. governments uh, globally. 
Ms. Nakabuye, what you're just hearing here is, I would say, and probably uh, Mr. Köhler and um, Ms. Adib would, would agree on that, is, is, is a very typical discussion that we have on how to fight climate change. It's usually quite technical, um, market, uh, renewables, uh, quotas and all that. From your perspective in Uganda, do you feel this is, this is something that could actually work? Are you optimistic that this, the measures we're just hearing will actually have an effect? Well, um, the measures will only have an effect if they are put into action and not just written in papers. So it should be more of action than the discussion that is being taken. That's, what, that's how I hope that these measures will work. If we just stopped talking about them and then put them into concrete action. But doesn't uh, putting something into concrete action also require and will require from the German government in the next four years to, you know, to return some papers, to do this in a, in a democratic way and, and actually in, you know, have the bureaucracy behind it? You, you do agree that this is necessary, right? In some situations, we have to act. Uh, some situations call for concrete action, like real agent action, for example, if you are having an urgent problem, your house is on fire, you don't think about how much it will cost after you call the, um, the, the, after you call the fire brigade or after you go to the hospital, you think about how to save lives and how this is going to work. So you act urgently. You don't look at what it will cost, but first of all, saving lives. Mr. Köhler, do you think a lot about how much um, fighting climate change will cost in Germany? Well, of course, we Germans, we do think a lot about costs, but um, we um, also think about the, what, it, what it will cost not to act. But um, I'm, I'm not sure if the example of the, the house on fire is correct, um, just because it's not only the house that, that's on fire, right? If we stay in this example, it's also the, the, the firefighters who are on fire and, and the rest of the, the town and, and everything around. So I do believe that looking at costs is important. Um, because we're not talking about changing one particular thing. As we've just heard before, uh, transportation and, and um, housing sectors are immensely problematic to change because it's, it's easier, or, well, it's not easier, but it's um, quicker to change the energy system because you're only talking about uh, people within the market of energy. But if you talk about housing, if you talk about cars, if you about, uh, talk about transportation, then a lot of people are really directly affected and the change is difficult and, and it needs to be quick and, and combining difficult and quick needs that you have, well, means that you have to look at one particular side and that is how do, how do you get the best for the euro to spend? And um, it, it, because course, you mentioned I the car industry, the costs. German car industry, I think that's a very good yeah. example because obviously that's one of the the identity uh, industries of Germany. Nothing else is associated as much when it comes to industries than than cars. And um, how what is the concept here to save the German car industry, uh, but make it uh, emission free? If, if you've completely correctly mentioned that we it's 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 a big big ingrained part of our identity to have a, a strong car in the industry with huge amounts of, of people having good and innovative ideas but it's not ingrained in our identity to use oil for that right so fossil fuels are not we don't we don't have big capacities of producing fossil fuels so we have no you know no closer connection to those and um, so of course we will have to have a strong German car industry, or we do want to have a strong, strong car industry, but it's a question: what what kind of cars are they producing? And um, so there will be cars that will be produced um, for the le electrical sector, right? Electrical cars uh, are on the move or, and on the front runners. If you look at the big um, big fair here in in in, in Munich uh, last weeks, uh, you have a lot of new cars, but you have also uh, hydrogen in cars. And of course, if you want, if we want to reduce CO2 in, a, in an amount that is um, capable of uh, achieving the 1.5 degree uh, aim, and that is, is, that is massively important, then we have to use and we have to produce a synthetic fuels. So because yeah. just, just, just to let you give me, let me give one number, just real quick. Yes. We have 1.5 billion cars in the world 
and they will be running for the next 30 years and most of them run on fossil fuels and we have to we have to include synthetic um, fuels and what part of the german um, the, the german idea will be um, to show that it's possible to create uh, and and achieve this with a cheap price Ms. Adib, does that sound like a plan that is actually going to work for you? I think it's a plan that is going to work, but I also think that it's a plan which uh, puts a lot of hope in the new technologies. And I would like to bring to just mention one number. Um, according to the International Energy Agency, 50% of the CO2 reductions which are necessary to meet the Paris goal are technology that already exist. And I think this is something where, um, and this also builds on your question you had before on how do we also make this discussion, not a technological discussion, but a societal discussion, which is something which really urgently needs to happen because citizens will need to also participate in this endeavor. The industry will need to participate in the transformation. The finance sector will need to do so. Um, it is very clear that um, there is a part where solutions already exist and just need to wait to be deployed. When we're speaking about the energy infrastructure here, we're speaking about um, tenfold increase of PV capacities, fivefold increase of uh, wind capacities. This means massive transmission distribution lines. And um, when we're speaking about the electricity or electrification of the transport sector, this also means massive distribution infrastructure and charging stations. This has two challenges, I guess. One is we need to develop this infrastructure. This is massive investment and there needs to be a support of all market players, of industry, of uh, the richest people in the country that are also the bigger polluters to participate in building uh, these infrastructure. This is something which is very clear. So public-private collaboration is, part, mm. is necessary. The other part is when we are speaking about a massive transformation, there will also be a pushback basically of, uh, of citizens in terms of societal acceptance. And one thing which is very clear is that policy needs to shape it in a way that citizens will also support this transition and benefit from it, whether it is in terms of local jobs, better air quality, um, reduced costs, because uh, let's be honest. And I think right. the so they see the benefits of what's happening. Euros. So they see the benefits. I mean, um, Ms. Adib, we, I'm sure you have yeah. that discussion also in France, and we have that discussion all over the world, is um, basically having uh, the balance between banning certain things and also innovating, you know, is it at all, I mean, the FTP, the Free Liberals, for example, have their focus, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Kula, more on the innovation side than on the banning of things side, now, and some perceive that other parties have it wrong. Do you see in your studies what the right balance is here, or is it, is it something that cannot actually be quantified? I think there is a, this very much depends on the on the technological maturity we have and on the market maturity. As I said, when we're looking into the power sector, so the markets, um, here we already speak about uh, technologies that are least cost option and are economic. So it is more about how do we also in, establish the infrastructure and the market when they are free can uh, regulate them, provided the governments phase out the fossil fuel subsidies. And I think that is something which is uh, still also existing in Germany. As in 115 other countries. Uh, when we are speaking about other areas, so um, I think we spoke about hydrogen, for instance, which is indeed important when we are speaking about the industry as the steel industry, etc. Here, there is, it's very clear that we need technological innovation. Same for digitalization, etc. So there are areas where technological innovation is still needed. What is very clear, I take the example again from hydrogen, when we speak about hydrogen, a sustainable hydrogen, a climate neutral hydrogen is only hydrogen coming from renewable energy. So it means massively building up the infrastructure. And that is something where sometimes the discussions is a bit uh, focused on technology will bring the hope for everything. And I think it's never black and white. What is very right. clear is the transition needs to be inclusive and citizens need also to be involved basically uh, and benefit from this and renewables can do that. And one of those citizens is, of course, Ms. Nakabuya in Uganda at the moment. Uh, when it comes to cars, because you, we haven't heard from you yet what you think about the whole car industry. If you were German car minister or transportation minister for a day, what would, what would your first measure be, Ms. Nakabuya? Well, um, my first measure is cars. I mean, the car industry in Uganda, 
in my country, I would put uh, an end to importation of second-hand cars that are greatly contributing to the air pollution in the country. And also, uh, just giving my thought about Germany, I think that uh, this the use of fossil uh, cars, uh, especially that use fossil fuels, should be reduced. And we need clean transportation that is sustainable. That means reduction in the making and importation of cars that use fossil fuels, but rather find means uh, of clean transportation, like use of trains and bicycles that are actually eco-friendly. Okay, and because we're kind of running out of time, we need to get back to our numbers and possible coalition forming in Germany. I just would like to put a question to all three of you with a with a brief answer, right? Because the topic here is Germany, when it comes to climate change, is Germany a front runner or a culprit? So if you can tell me front runner or culprit, I would like to start with you, Ms. Nakabuye. Well, I think it's a culprit given the amount of emissions that we emit. Uh, German alone last year emitted 604.8 metric tons of carbon. So that is a lot, being that it's the first, uh, sorry, it's the fourth emitter in history. So I think it's Th a culprit. Thank you. So work. culprit here, Mr. Köhler? The next front government has the possibility to be a front runner, and that's what we're working for. But so far a culprit, is that correct? Did I understand you correctly? No, no, I don't. I don't think so. I would not agree. I, I do think that in a lot of parts we are front runner. All right, and uh, Ms. Adib, what do you think? I think historically uh, Germany um, has been a front runner because it was a first uh, first mover. Has gone down quite a bit when we're looking at the uh, capacities mm -hmm. and the transition, how it's handled in uh, some end use sectors today. And I think the voters have actually uh, sent quite a strong signal with regard to this um, that climate needs to be at the heart of the next government. And I think um, if the government takes basically um, the voice of the voters uh, seriously, but also the international agreements um, Germany committed to, um, there is a real chance to uh, become a front runner again because uh, Germany does have a lot of uh, potential and is also a really important country uh, internationally that can also take other countries uh, with its on its way. And we'll see if the next government leads up to all those expectations. Thank you very much to Uganda, to Munich, to Paris uh, for your contributions. And um, first of all, of course, as always, we still need to figure out what the next German government is actually going to be. And I'm sure that Sumi and Melinda will help us understand whether we've come any closer with the numbers. Max, 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 Max. The first thing we're going to do is get an update of where we stand right now. If you're just tuning in with us, uh, vote counting is still underway. Preliminary results show a tight race between the two main parties. Now, the center left, Social Democrats have taken the lead with nearly 26% of the vote. That is a big improvement on their last result and one they say gives them a mandate to govern. The Conservatives, the CDU CSU, they are at 24.5%. That is their weakest result in more than 70 years. But they say it is still enough for them to form a government. And the Greens came in third. They could, as we know, play a role in this next coalition that is looking more and more likely. And William's going to have an update on those numbers now. That's right. You just heard it from Sumi, those numbers. Let's have a look at them. Seeing is believing. Where are we now? The SPD keeps creeping up. Every tenth of a percent more vote for them gives them more of a mandate to make a coalition with some of the smaller parties. The CDU, CSU is now down a, a, a couple tenths of a percent, flirting now with 24 percent. So that gap is widening. It's still very close. The union is still going to be claiming that they have the ability to make a coalition. So the next days and weeks are going to be very unclear and there's going to be a lot of back and forth. Meanwhile, the smaller parties are staying fairly where we've seen them all night with the Greens in that 14% range, dropping from their high at the beginning of the night at 15% and the FTP quite solid at 11 and a half percent. While the socialists left flirting with getting kicked out of the Bundestag, not having any seats in there at all if they can't hold on to that 5%. Let's uh, turn it back over to the ladies at the table.
Thank you, William, for bringing us up to date. And Melinda, is it becoming clear now who will form the next government? A little bit clearer, but we certainly don't have the final word. Looks like the Social Democrats are in a much stronger position than the Christian Democrats with this uh, their lead widening. But uh, that still can change in the course of the night. We don't yet have a, a an absolute firm final result. We certainly don't. What are you going to be looking for in the coming hours and days in, as these coalition negotiations start and move forward? Keep your eye on whether that gap widens, because that will make it ever harder for Armin Laschet to claim to have any kind of a mandate uh, to form the next government, and then keep your eye on how the Greens and uh, the Liberal Democrats position themselves also vis-a-vis -vis each other. All right. Well, it's going to be very, very interesting, as you said. This is unusual territory for a German election. It's certainly something we've enjoyed watching. You are watching DW News from Berlin. We're going to take a short break now, but do not go away because Brent Goff is going to be here at the news desk. He's going to have more election coverage in just a few minutes. So for all of us here in the studio at the moment, thank you so much for watching. And please don't go away. We're going to bring you all the latest updates as they come to us through the course of the night. Every day counts for us and for our planet. Global Ideas is on its way to bring you more conservation. How do we make cities greener? How can we protect animals and their habitats? What to do with all our waste? We can make a difference by choosing reforestation over deforestation, recycling over disposable, smart new solutions over stains set in our ways. The Earth is truly unique, and we know that that uniqueness is what allows us to live and survive. Global Ideas, the environmental series in Global 3000, on DW and online. Are you ready to get a little more extreme? These places in Europe are smashing all the records. Step into a bold adventure. Just don't lose your grip. It's the treasure map for modern globetrotters. Discover some of Europe's record-breaking sites. On Euromax, YouTube, and now also in book form. When I first menstruated, I had no clue whatsoever. A film about a taboo. Menstruation has always been a shameful, dirty secret. About women and girls across the world. Most of the girls end up being at home. They miss their schools. Against silence and for equal opportunity. <laughs> taboo menstruation. It's as if Pandora's box is opening. Pandora's Box starts October 11th on DW. It was 2016 I said goodbye to the Queen because I wanted to see if Germany was for me. 
the last few years have been quite a ride, getting fully in touch with the German inside. I've really done my homework when it comes to German beers, and of course I always look right in the eyes for a cheers. But perhaps the biggest sign's a new hobby of mine. I'm no longer a prude, I love to be in the nude. There are pros and there are cons, but when you're feeling more forgiving, you'll realise each culture's just another way of living. Are you ready to meet the Germans? Then join me, Rachel Stewart, on DW. This is DW News, live from Berlin. Tonight, the results of the German election, a winner and the next chancellor, simply too close to call. The Social Democrats and the Conservatives are both claiming that they have a mandate to govern. Will it take days, weeks, or even months until someone blinks first? You're watching DW News' special coverage of the German election and the results. I'm Brent Goff. It's good to have you with us. Germany has voted. It was predicted to be close, but few thought that it would be this close. Initial exit polls show the two main parties almost neck and neck, and ballot counting continues, and the center-left Social Democrats seem to be pulling ahead of the conservative CDU-CSU parties. Let's take a look now at the first results. The Social Democrats, the SPD, they have, as you see right there, 26 percent just ahead of the conservatives, the CDU, at about 24 percent. This is the CDU's worst result in post-war German history. Coming in third tonight, the Greens with nearly 15 percent of the vote, a very strong showing they are likely to play a role in any future government. The business-friendly FDP party with nearly 12 percent also fared well tonight. The far-right AFD will also take a place in Parliament again, and as you see, the Socialist Left Party with about 5 percent of the vote. Let's look at what all of this would mean in terms of seats in Parliament. The SPD is projected to win more than 200 seats. The CDU will have slightly fewer. The Greens and the FDP will make up a fair chunk of the Parliament as well. We'll continue now with our analysis of what this could all mean in just a moment. But first, a look at how the parties reacted to the first results tonight. Celebrations at the headquarters of the Social Democrats as the first exit polls came in. In an election night like no other, they put the centre-left SPD and their conservative rivals on almost even numbers. A race without a clear winner. Still, even a near tie was a triumph for the Social Democrats and their Chancellor candidate Olaf Scholz. This is going to be a long election night, that's for sure. But another thing's for sure, too, that many citizens of this country have chosen the SPD because they want to see a change of government and they want the new chancellor to be Olaf Scholz. It was a chastening night for the CDU, the party of outgoing Chancellor Angela Merkel. The opinion polls had already suggested it, and as the first figures came in, their fears were confirmed. The results are the worst in the Conservative Party's history. Their Chancellor candidate Armin Laschet first thanked Merkel for her 16 years in office. And despite the disastrous result, he presented the Conservatives as the party with the mandate to govern. We will do everything we can to build a government under the leadership of the CDU. Because Germany needs a coalition for the future, one that will modernize our country. Over at the Green Party, there were celebrations. But given the environmentalists had originally been riding high in the polls, it wasn't quite what they had hoped for. But they came in third and made huge gains since the last election four years ago. Tonight, we can't just celebrate. For the first time, we wanted to be the leading party and shape this country. 
dieses Land zu gestalten. Wir wollten we wanted more. Das haben we wir didn't achieve that partly because of our mistakes in the campaign and my own mistakes. Eigener Fehler von mir. It was a good evening for the business-friendly FDP. For the second election running, they're in double digits. A huge success for a party that has struggled to make it into the Bundestag in the past. The parties on the fringes of the political spectrum both had disappointing nights. The far-right AFD, who caused a stir when they entered parliament for the first time four years ago, failed to improve on their results. While the socialist left parties saw their vote share drop by around 4%. With the vote more fragmented than it's ever been, it's still unclear which of the two main parties will be able to form a government. As the era of Angela Merkel ends, Germany's political fate is hanging in the balance. And joining me here at the big table now is our chief political correspondent, Melinda Crane. Wow, an exciting night, Melinda. And we've got both of these parties, the Social Democrats and the conservative CDUs, the leaders of both of these parties, almost both claiming that they have a mandate to form a new government and to be the next chancellor. Absolutely. Uh, the SPD's lead has been creeping up over the course of the night, but we don't yet to have a firm final result. And the CDU, although lagging behind, is saying that it has a mandate, interestingly enough, because it's interpreting uh, the voters' wishes to be that they don't have a left-leaning government, so that must mean they want a conservative-led mm -hmm. one. That's a certain leap they're taking there with that reasoning, but it does confirm the direction they took in their election campaign. And we saw the Green um, Party tonight, their <laughs> best performance that they've ever seen in a national election. <laughs> and it's enough to make you, it's enough to make you <laughs> cough there, Melinda. Um, but if we look at what it means for them in terms of a mandate, obviously they're not going to be able to be the leader or to be in charge of the next government, but is it the voter message here tonight Climate change has to be at the top of the agenda for any party or any government that comes in. You know, the, <clears throat> excuse me, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a real mixed message, actually, on the part of the voters. We have one camp that clearly wants transformational change. Mm -hmm. That's the camp that voted for the Greens, also to some degree for the SPD. But we have another camp that's very worried about what change would mean for them, that are frightened of what it could mean in terms of their families falling farther behind. And that group is definitely the one that voted for what amounts to a little bit more of business as, business as usual, namely the CDU. All right, stand by, Melinda. We're going to take it now to our political correspondent, Nina Hasler. She was at the Social Democrats election night event here in Berlin. Here's her assessment. There was a lot of cheering when the first exit polls came through and minutes of applause when the Chancellor candidate Olaf Scholz took to the stage here in Berlin. The Social Democrats on Sunday night celebrated what they called an election victory. They say that the German voters have given them the right to form a government. They also celebrated a successful election campaign with a solid Chancellor candidate who didn't commit many major mistakes like his rivals did. Now whether the unity that the party showed during the election campaign will persist now that the election campaign is over that will only become visible during the coalition negotiations and that was nina hazard there at spd headquarters let's go now to michaela kufner across town at the conservative cdu party event michaela it's good to see you so we've got CDU leader Armin Laschet also claiming that he has a mandate from the voters to form a new government that would have him as the next chancellor. Yes, uh, in German you call it, um, you, you kind of, a flucht nach vorne, you step, uh, go a step forward. Uh, by uh, really seeking shelter because uh, he, uh, of course, had to reason why he has the worst result for the conservative camp uh, in modern German history. And at the same time, uh, underlining his claim that the conservatives may be a bit down, but certainly not out of that race uh, to form the next coalition. And uh, that's also why when we saw this big round, debating round, there was a lot of political 
political currency already being stashed up on the table, with Armin Laschet stressing that all parties in a coalition need to be able to deliver to their voters what they promised, as in, if you come into a coalition with the Conservatives, dear Greens and Free Democrats, you will see a lot of um, points really translating into policy and potentially also a lot of ministries. So um, this, these are very interesting times as we see the parties uh, cautiously start talking to each other. And Michaela, help our viewers understand this. The, the Conservative CDU party had its worst showing ever in a national election tonight. And yet <laughs> the, the leader of that party, Armin Laschet, said tonight on television that he has a mandate to start talks to form a new government, a new government that would make him the chancellor. I mean, what's the logic there? Well, the logic is, and it, the logic isn't completely wrong, uh, because um, today Germany didn't vote on the next chancellor, it voted on MPs, on parliament. It's the parliament who gets to elect the next chancellor, and Armin Laschet, co formally correctly, argues that uh, whoever finds that centre ground majority for a chancellor uh, should be in the lead. And the Social Democrats, uh, although they are uh, more than a percentage point ahead, do not have that majority. It's really interesting because we're seeing the German political landscape fragment more, but essentially split three ways uh, with almost uh, uh, more than a quarter of the votes for the Social Democrats, maybe just slightly below for Angela Merkel's Conservative CDU CSU. And the other two parties uh, we are expecting to see in a coalition, either way it swings, the Greens and the Free Democrats also almost making up uh, a quarter uh, with the, the other quarter left to other parties. Now, you need 50%. So um, the uh, current coalition continuing between the Social Democrats and the Conservatives, those two big 10 parties here in Germany, that's been ruled out by both sides. But at this point in time, I wouldn't be willing to rule it out because it could become a last straw in what could be very complicated um, attempts to find that majority. And Michaela, this is the election that sees Angela Merkel step down after 16 years in power. The fact that her party mm -hmm. had such a poor showing, poor performance in this election, what does this say about her legacy and the political world that she leaves behind? Well, it says a lot about the election campaign. It says a lot about her own popularity because certainly the Merkel factor, you didn't, you know, did you elect the Conservatives uh, because of Angela Merkel? It looks like that a surprisingly large number voted for them only because of Angela Merkel, who was criticized internally for shifting her party more to the center, to the left, as some argue. And it also tells us a lot about the strength of the uh, Social Democrat uh, candidate, Olaf Scholz, who is her current vice chancellor, who also claims the kind of style of Merkel stability politics uh, that Angela Merkel was so known for. And she really was very late to step up and, and stand side by side with her own candidate, Armin Laschet, because she formally wanted to stay out of the race of her own succession. Well, that certainly backfired on her conservative party. And um, there's a lot of uh, bruises that you can see it's emptying out now. Many people have gone home. They just want to wait until those results have firmed up and they're really in a position to think straight about what that means in terms of finding majorities. But whatever happens, a lot of soul searching okay. to be done. Dare I say, potentially a big rift breaking open here in the Conservative camp. Okay, Michaela Kupfner covering the Conservative CDU side of this election night. Michaela, thank you. Well, climate change turned out to be a major issue in this election, and the Greens, they do look set to play a big part in the next German government. Here's the Greens' chancellor candidate, Annalena Baerbock, earlier tonight.
and just really getting a sense of so many people who weren't actually members of the Green Party but who were interested, where we really had a sense that there's a real longing for political debate in this country and a longing not just from those who for 40, 50, 60 years have been alive, but we're talking about school children, not just the ones at the Fridays for Future demonstrations, but even before that. You know, some of them were saying, well, we had a free hour from school and we thought we'd come along and find out what's going on. So these are school children who want us to shape the future together because it's our future, everyone's future. It was amazing. That was Annalena Baerbock there. DW's Julius Haldeli was at the Greens post-election party. Here's her take on the reaction there to the results. It's a mixed bag for the Green Party here tonight. On the one hand, disappointment. For the first time, they had put forward a chancellor candidate and they thought they might actually be able to win the election. But it looks like they might have to settle for third place. On the other hand, it looks like they might have achieved their best result ever in federal elections and won a few percentage points compared to the last election. So something to celebrate. But what's in focus now for the party is trying to have a strong role in the next German government so that they can put forward their climate agenda and try to put forward policy that fights climate change. And our chief political correspondent, Melinda Crane, she's back here at the table with me. Melinda, regardless of what these the two bigger parties decide or who blinks first, the Greens are going to play a role in the next government, aren't they? Absolutely. We essentially, what we can clearly see right now is that we have two potential kingmakers in this party landscape. One is the Green Party. The other one are the Liberal Free Democrats. Mm -hmm. And... Those are the two parties that essentially are now at the disposition of the bigger parties as they talk about trying to form a government. And the question will be, what can either Olaf Scholz, the, the leader of the Social Democrats, or Amin Laschet, if in fact he does have the numbers that would work mathematically, and that is an open question. At this point, uh, the CDU numbers have been dropping over the course of the evening. If they drop a lot further, he might not even be able to get to 50% with those two other parties. But anyway, the question will be, what can the party that wants to form a government offer to those two other parties. Mm -hmm. Now, the SPD and the Greens have a lot of commonality. They've made that clear. They've practically uh, embraced each other at uh, some of their uh, uh, various election campaign events. But there are quite a few big gaps between the Greens and the Liberal Free Democrats. So one thing to keep your eye on now in the coming days is how do they position themselves vis-a-vis -vis each other in that leadership round that we saw earlier where the chair people of the parties were discussing the election result. Mm -hmm. There were some indications of um, how they might be able to agree on basic points, but there were other clear divergences, and, uh, and that would be absolutely crucial going forward. And, you know, Melinda, people watching this from around the world um, hear us talk about the, the big parties, the Social Democrats or the Conservatives, the CDUs, but when you look at the numbers, they really don't have the numbers now that you would expect a big tent party to have. I mean, is the error of these, these parties you know, one fits all, is that era over here in Germany? You know, Brent, this is a watershed election in so many ways, and that is one of the key ones. Because in Germany, when you and I arrived here, these two parties, the Social Democrats, the Christian Democrats, they were regularly getting 30 to 40% of right. the vote. Now, they're hovering a little over 20. Mm -hmm. So, a huge change. We're also seeing for the first time since the 1950s, we're going to see at least a three-party coalition. As I, I, I think the idea that there could be a uh, renewal of the grand coalition of the mm. CDU and the SPD, I think that's pretty out of the question. They, they made that clear in the leadership discussion tonight. So that's one reason it's a watershed. But another reason it's a watershed is that that big tent that Angela Merkel formed essentially blurred the boundaries between left and right. And those boundaries are coming back. Mm -hmm. And we've seen a lot of desertion from the CDU of voters who liked that tent, but don't like the fact that the party is moving rightward. And it definitely is moving rightward. If you look at the fact that Armin Laschet has said he very much wants to bring a Friedrich Merz. This is a, a figure in German conservative politics who's been around a long, long time, who stands for essentially a kind of a neoliberal, market-friendly ideology. It's clear that the conservatives are trying to step back from the 
mid middle drift that mm -hmm. they'd had under Angela Merkel, and I think that definitely has alienated some voters. So I think those big tents are getting smaller. Yeah, getting smaller, and this drift you're talking about, part of the Angela Merkel legacy, for sure. Melinda, thank you. Well, the business-friendly FDP is also in a strong position to be part of any future governing coalition. Here's the FDP leader, Christian Lindner, at his party event earlier tonight. Today there is a clear political signal. The political center is stronger. The political fringe is weaker. The order from German citizens to all the parties responsible for governing is that they want a government formed from the center. That is good news for our democracy. But it also sends a message out to the world that Germany will continue to be a stable partner. All right, our political correspondent Simon Young. Now, he's been following the FDP for us tonight. Good evening to you, Simon. So, the head of the FDP, he sounds like a very satisfied and happy leader of his party tonight. And he has reason to, to sound that way, doesn't he? Certainly he does. They are calling this a good result for the Free Democrats. They've uh, boosted their uh, result from last time uh, back into double figures. They think that's, uh, that's a good sign for them. It's only gone up slightly, but it's enough, I think, to strengthen uh, the position of party leader Christian Lindner going into whatever coalition talks may now come. There's been some speculation that he may uh, try to uh, seize the uh, finance ministry as one of the things that he tries to extract from other potential coalition partners. Um, we'll have to see about that because, of course, we, we, there's a long way to go till we get to coalition talks. But certainly uh, the FDP are riding high. They feel they've had a, a clear mandate. They, they feel they've spoken to a young electorate with their sort of message that uh, Germany needs to get its startup starting, that it needs to release some entre entrepreneurial spirit and roll back red tape. Uh, a, a lot of younger voters seem to have been drawn to that. And, uh, you know, I, for the Christian, de uh, for the Free Democrats, excuse me, tonight, mm. uh, this result puts them in a good position because they're likely to be in uh, a coalition, whether it's led by Conservatives or Social Democrats. And the leader of the FDP um, tonight made it clear, Simon, that um, when he's thinking of possible coalition possibilities, the place where the FDP would feel more at home would be a coalition with the conservative CDU. That's certainly right, Brent. They've always said that, and it's clear that there's a lot more overlap with uh, with the, the right of centre Christian Democrats. Uh, but they've not ruled out doing a deal uh, with the Social Democrats in, uh, and Greens. The problem there, one of the big problems, is going to be the tax question, because those other parties are saying, you know, to pay for what's uh, going to be needed in terms of economic recovery after the pandemic, but also in uh, response to climate change, change, uh, there's going to have to be significant government expenditure and those parties are talk talking about raising taxes, at least for top earners. Well, uh, the Free Democrats have always made it one of their key points. We don't support any tax rises. As I say, what they're all about is, you know, unleashing business uh, potential and they see taxes as uh, poison for that. So that's definitely going to be a talking point uh, on that side of the uh, coalition talk. And Simon, the FDP, they want to play their cards um, carefully this time, don't they? If you think back four years ago, you know, there was, they tried to be in a new government coalition after the last election. Those talks didn't go anywhere. That's right. Well, they, they, were, in, they were ongoing for, for quite some time, but eventually the uh, FDP uh, pulled out. They said they couldn't do a deal uh, with the Greens. The other parties, it has to be said, said, well, you know, it's the FDP who's actually been fairly intransigent and, uh, and Christian Democrats and Greens have gone some way to meet their demands. So uh, whatever the truth about that, what the Free Democrats are saying this time is it's a different situation. Uh, there's uh, more of a mood for change. 
change. There's a, a desperation for, the, for change, is the way they tell it here, after 16 years of Angela Merkel and uh, too many years of the two big parties really dominating government. So uh, it's pretty clear that there's a strong appetite from uh, this smaller party to be part of that change if they can possibly arrange it. All right, DW's Simon Young there covering the FDP tonight for us. Simon, thank you. Back here at the big table with me, Melinda Crane. Melinda, what message is being sent out to the world from this election? I mean, we know Germany is seen as an anchor of stability and predictability at the heart of Europe. Is that changing? Uh, we don't know yet. It depends very much on how long these coalition negotiations go on. During the leaders' round, uh, there was talk of trying to get it done by Christmas. Some estimates have been significantly longer, that it could take a great deal longer. If Germany is preoccupied with itself, particularly going into its G7 presidency that is coming up, that will send a signal to the world that Germany uh, is uh, perhaps a, a bit of a boat afloat without a clear compass. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, you know, we were talking about change. Yes, there is a powerful feeling in Germany that things aren't where they need to be. And the pandemic very much accelerated that. A sense that digitalization is passing this country by, that although this is a powerful, rich country, it has not gotten its act together in terms of providing good, strong internet connections for all citizens, no matter where they True. live, for providing good digitalization in schools, workplaces, and so on. So um, many citizens were not satisfied with the work of the Grand Coalition in its final phase. They felt that Germany was lagging not only on climate, that's a big issue for the voters, but on digitalization, on modernization of the bureaucracy. Now, all the parties do recognize that these are major challenges they have to address but their prescriptions for how to do so range from very vague to extremely concrete, and extremely concrete would, for example, be the Greens, but then their program, mm -hmm. of course, includes a number of rules, regulations, um, bans, for yeah. example, no internal combustion engines sold after 2030, mm -hmm. that turn other people off. So we're seeing a country acknowledging the need for change, but by no means of one mind about how to get there. And I think many democracies find themselves in a similar position at this time, but, um, but we're going to be watching a struggle. We are going to be watching. It, it is a struggle indeed. Melinda Crane, as always, thank you. We'll be talking with you in the day, which is coming up next. Here's a reminder of the top story that we are following for you tonight. First results from Germany's election, giving the Social Democrats a very narrow lead over the center-right CDU-CSU parties. Both parties say that they have a mandate to govern. The Greens also made a strong showing and are likely to play a role in the new government. You're watching DW News live from Berlin. Stay with us. I'll be back for a special edition of the day. We're going to look at what this election means to Europe, the United States, China and the world. Germany's first female chancellor has taken on the alpha males of world politics. Nobody will ever think that 
Angela Merkel is weak or something like that. What changed for women in the world of politics during her term? We asked them. She has demonstrated everything that it takes to be a leader. Angela Merkel, her legacy for women. In 60 Minutes on DW. Germany votes. What's it to mean? Germany goes to the polls today. We will be right here with you tonight, bringing you all the results and analysis. Join us here on DW. People in trucks injured while trying to flee the city center. More and more refugees are being turned away at the border. Families fleeing bomb attacks in Syria. Police crack down in Venezuela against demonstrators. People fleeing extreme drought. A raft carrying 200 people has sunk in the Aegean Sea. Around the world, more than 300 million people are seeking refuge. We ask why? Because no one should have to flee. Make up your own mind. DW. Made for Minds. Today, voters here in Germany went to the polls in the most important election in a generation. The clearest result, fighting climate change, should be a top priority for the next government, which 